Let's do the dang thing. What is up, everybody? We are live here at Myth Vision. It's 12.30 noon on the East Coast, North Kakalaki, down in Vietnam. That's where I live. What's up, Dr. Kip? How you doing? What's up? It's good. How are you? Doing good. Hold on. I got a delay echo it's, here. Let me. You do. You do. Oh, there we go. There we go. So, is that better? That is, but for some reason, I have... Oh, that's it. Okay. No, that was that was surprising. It's because I've got uh, I've got the show on on a different mm -hmm. browser and my and and an ad started, and so there was all this noise in my in my head, and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> it's Yahweh." Well, I, I must start off with just saying there is this interesting story, and we're about to do our intro, but it always perplexed me because I wondered like. Why did God kill this guy? I mean, like, he killed this guy. The guy pulls out. He spills his seed on the ground. Boom. Dead. I guess that's a way to start our intro. Here we go. Let's that's do a, it. That's a good... in Washington, Kip Davis is getting his first look at a final prized fragment in the Museum of the Bible's collection. This is a fragment that contains text from Genesis chapter 32, and it's supposedly from the first century BC or the first century CE. Kill is joining us today here at uh, Myth Vision Podcast. Uh, we are Myth Vision, and welcome back. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm I'm sorry. It's been uh, it, I, I kind of dropped off uh, the face of the earth there for a while. Um, I've just been really, really, really busy. I suddenly got got lots of lots of things on the go, and it all happened you, at once. You mean so. you have a life? You mean I you tell do. me you have a oh my I, yeah I do I do it doesn't do just this? take place here online <laughs> I am I am not just an avatar Well I'm so, glad to know that at least yeah. you can bring us some insights and I want everybody to know we're going to be talking about this character called Onan um and Dr. Kill I'm going to just go by his actual name because I can't tell you how many people uh he has on his uh, how many teardrops he has, you know, that you can't see them, but they're there. That's how many bodies he has, his body count. Um, he's going to take us into this. I'm, I have honestly very little clues as to what you might be doing today. 
So we're going to be learning from you. You are going to give us a presentation, but I must demand I'm, I'm, I have to tell everybody if you Derek, don't. Derek didn't read the video description, I guess. Well, I did, but I'm, I imagine you're going to go into things that, uh, shh, dude, we talked about this before the show. <laughs> um, what's up, everybody? Uh, <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. No, seriously, go subscribe to Dr. Kip's YouTube channel. Hit that bell. He has a lot of great content you really should get your hands on. And of course, he will be picking it up when he doesn't, when he doesn't have as much of a life going on. When the and, life, uh, yeah, when the life fades into the background, I shall return. You also have this website here, I Lying promise. Pen. This is a project that you've been working on? Yeah. Yes, it is. Although even, yeah, there, I, I haven't done a lot with them recently. But the Lying Pen of Scribes project is is a large project out of the uh, University of Wachter in Norway. Um, working on uh, on uh, issues of, of forgery and uh provenance and um um the ethics of uh of discovery and publication of uh ancient artifacts mm. so it's it's a very very interesting exciting and important project well i'm looking forward to seeing more obviously you come and leak that out here on the internet world and also we've got the patreon i just dropped a short Allah tricked Christians uh in the Quran of course uh, you see oh. this in the gnostic well, text was... you know Simon what of Cyrene. I, I know, I know. We have to talk Why about his etiquette. That? You know, I kind of wonder the same thing. So anyway, that will be launched at some point on YouTube. Uh, it'll be, it's on my TikTok. But if you want to go support me here on Myth Vision, you can on the Patreon. You can also harass me in messages. I take harassment pretty lightly. So like, you know, you could do that. So Dr. Kip, what do you have us for uh, today? Right. So... Uh, you might want to pin Endo's question. He already asked one. Um, okay, everybody so just, who's just put a send out your super chats. We will get to them for Q and A. They are greatly appreciated. They keep me doing here what I do at Myth Vision. If it weren't for the support that I do get through super chats, I honestly mean this with my Patreon included. I wouldn't be able to do what I do full time. So I am so appreciative to everybody who does support us here. But we are going to get to your questions, I promise, after the presentation uh, so we can wrap our head around what you have for us, Dr. Kill. And hopefully some of them will, will end up being answered uh, through the presentation itself. Um, but I need, to, uh, I, I need to just start with, uh, with a couple of caveats, um, despite the incredibly sexy introduction that, uh, that you put together. There's not going to be any talk. Uh, there's there's no Dead Sea Scroll stuff today, I'm afraid. It's okay. Uh, none of that. Uh, I'll cry after nonsense. the show. I'll cry okay. after the show. And um, there will also be no singing. So, dang it. it ah well. Um, so uh, this is something, and I think I think um, you you actually you actually sort of poked me about this, Derek, and I think it's because. Um, I probably just kind of kind of hinted at it or or talked uh, a little bit about it in in some of the streams that I've that I've done with you in the past. But you teased uh, me. there's this. What's that? You teased me. Yeah, I teased you. So there's this really strange story in uh, Genesis 38. We're going to read it uh, shortly. So maybe uh, maybe stick your finger in your Bible, folks. And uh, open it up to uh, Genesis 38. Um, so this is a this is a weird story uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, it's just it's it's weird because of because of the stuff that happens in there. Um, it's weird because of its placement within the Book of Genesis. Uh, so what's going on here? And and I, we're going to explore that today. And I actually think it's it's pretty exciting. There's not been a lot of work done on this connection that I'm going to uh, to discuss today. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit. I'm, you know, I'm. These are not my ideas. A couple are, but most of them are not my ideas. This is work from other scholars. But I think this is uh, this is an interesting question that continues to deserve further exploration. So um, I have a. I put together a presentation. So if we can start that, let's do it right let's now. Do it. Let's, let's do, do it. it. 
Hit that like all button, right. everybody, as we get into this. All right. We are sharing the screen. They can see all the porno that you've been searching. What? I'm oh, sure. yeah. Okay. Okay. What the hell, eh? <laughs> so here's, here's my title page. Does everybody see it? Can you read it? The Seed of Onan and the Succession of David. Yeah. So it's pretty good, eh? Yeah. All right. Oh, bummer. I didn't I didn't put the transitions that I wanted in. This was pretty hastily put together, so my apologies <laughs> at the outset. All right. So, um just by way of introduction, one of the things that that we're going to be zeroing in on today are ideological tensions within the Hebrew Bible. One of the things that really really excites me about the biblical literature is the fact that it's vast. There's there's so much there. And the fact that it's diverse. And it was mm. written and collected by all sorts of different people over all, you know, a, a fairly lengthy period of time. And what gets caught up in all of this are surviving bits of competing politics, competing religion, competing theology, competing ideology. And in my opinion, it's one of the most fun things about studying the Bible is looking and and teasing apart uh, these tensions that exist there. And, you know, I think I think that speaks a lot to the story that we're going to get into in Genesis chapter 38. So by way of example, some of the tensions that are that exist within the biblical texts uh, with regards to the priesthood, you have a group of priests, priests known as the Levites, and a group of priests known as the Bnei Acharon, or the sons of Aaron, or the Aaronites. Um, there, if you look closely enough and carefully enough, you'll discover that these are competing uh, groups of priests. Um, the the Bnei Acharon, the Aaronites, are the ones who 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 basically controlled uh, the transmission of the text. So much of the much of the theology and much of the the voice of the Levites is very muted, but it's still kind of there. And uh, you know, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting tension. Um, just by way of background, uh, the Aaronite priesthood seems to have been native to the city of Jebus which became the city of Jerusalem when uh, when David uh, conquered it. And his his reason for, for, for entering the city and taking over and conquering the city of Jerusalem was a, a part of an effort to consolidate his power over these 12 tribes that, you know, loosely call themselves Israel. So Jerusalem was, was fairly central. Um, so he decided this is where I'm going to rule from. And he, he had to, he had to take the city away from the Jebusites. Now, um, as you can imagine, you know, there's still tons of Jebusites living in the city of Jerusalem after David took it over. And one of the concessions I believe that he made to the city was the retention of their high priest, uh, Zadok, alongside the high priest who was serving at the shrine in Shiloh um, up until this point, uh, Abiathar, and, or his son uh, Ahimelech. So um, this was a sign of his concession to the Jebusite residents, and it's part of his own effort to consolidate power between the north and the south. You can read about some of this stuff in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 17. In 1 Kings 2, verse 26 to 27, um, Abiathar, who's the, the Levitical high priest, ends up getting exiled because of his involvement uh, in the politics and being on the wrong side of the politics that follow uh, David's rule. And uh, so he and his, his group of priests is exiled to a place called Anatoth. Um, and this is also the city where uh, where Jeremiah came from. Many many centuries later, Jeremiah was uh, was a Levitical priest from the same line of uh, Abiathar in the city of Anatol. Okay, so we've got Levites and Aaronites. 
another tension takes place between the north and the south. Uh, we know of uh, of two kingdoms uh, that comprise all of Israel. We're, we're told there was once a united kingdom under David, under Saul, David, and Solomon. Uh, but then thereafter, uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, uh, oversaw or was was in power when there was uh, uh, there was a rebellion and uh, the north split away from the south and and things remained that way um, until uh, the exile first of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians and then by the southern of the southern kingdom by the Babylonians and throughout the text you'll also uh, find some hints of this tension between the north and the south. Um, quite often the north is referred to not as, as Israel, but as Ephraim in the south, uh, which comprises the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin is, is referred to collectively as Judah. You can read about the rebellion in 1 Kings chapter 11 and 12. And finally, uh, there's tensions between royalists and amphictionics. Uh, there's a word for you. Do not ask uh, me to pronounce that. <laughs> Amphictionics. <laughs> so, <laughs> everyone, say it together. Amphictionics. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. The, and this is a this is a pretty. I I think this is a really interesting tension uh, within the text. And this is this is the tension that takes place between those people who um, were pro monarchy and those people who were not. And the people who were not pro-monarchy, I mean, we read about, you see some of this in, um, in uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 10 to 18. Uh, Samuel echoes uh, the complaints and the concerns of the, the no-monarchy crowd, the Amphictyonics, um, who are opposed to, to having a king. Um, but uh, they're they're part of this 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 tribal confederacy that wishes to remain decentralized. Is concerned about the cost and and the uh, um, the, the cost of installing a monarchy and 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 the responsibilities that are that are going to result from that. There's also another really interesting uh, critique that appears in the parable of Jotham. In Judges chapter nine, verses seven, seven to fifteen, and I'm I'm just going to read this because I think it's pretty cool, um, and I believe this is this is probably a fairly early text. Uh, for today, I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, just because this is the Bible that that was close by. I have no special <laughs> affinity or connection to this text, but this is this is what I have on hand for today. So here we go. Jo oh, oops, I'm in Joshua. That's no good. Uh, Judges. Judges chapter 9, verse 7. So now, when they told Jotham, he went and stood on the top of Mount Gerazim and lifted his voice and cried out and said to them. So this is Jotham who's, who's opposed to the installation of monarchy. Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and go to sway over the trees? Then the trees said to the fig tree, you come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, should I cease to, uh, my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the vine, you Come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, Should I cease my new vine, which cheers both God and men, and go to sway over trees? Then all the trees said to the bramble, or the thistle, <laughs> You, come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So what's this? What's the message behind this parable, this story? Um, 
it's if you think about it it is pretty clear i think sometimes these things tend to get lost in 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 the translation of between the languages and over long periods of time but if you listen carefully to how the parable unfolds the basic message is that a king is worthless people in this in the parable the trees all have useful functions and they all you know wisely understand that what they're doing is much more important than you know being a ruler and who ends up being the king of the trees the useless thistle and he rules through uh uh through fear so this is just by way of introduction there are ideological tensions in the hebrew bible and i want i want us to keep this kind of in the back of our mind as we begin exploring this story how are we doing derek we're we're doing so we have people who okay. don't want a king we see that clearly in the text of course yep uh there's this idea they don't want a king and there are people who do they're crying out for a king yep. of course eventually they get a king uh, Saul correct first, of course then david so so yep. someone won out that's right that's right so and the people who didn't win out didn't just go away i think that's that's important i mean the text provides the the provides the sense that the opponents of the majority opinion just disappeared this is not the case the unfortunate thing is that we don't have surviving literature from the losers and in order to discover what's really going on uh, amid these tensions it requires some some careful clever reading of the text but we're here to talk about this story in Genesis chapter 38, the story of uh, Judah and Tamar. So maybe we should just read that now. Um, I will read it unless you're dying to. Nope, you can go so, ahead. <laughs> okay. So starting in uh, verse one, Genesis chapter 38. Came to pass... At the time that Judah departed from his brothers, this is important, he departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adolamite, whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. And he married her and went into her. She conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Er. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name Shelah. He was at Chaziv when she bore him. And Judah took the wife for Er. Now, I, before we continue, I think it's important. One of the things that we're going to pay close attention to in this story are the names. The names of the characters as they occur. Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Er... Judah's firstborn was wicked in the sight of the Lord, or sorry, wicked. I'm gonna I'm gonna replace do the proper replacement here. Was wicked in the sight of Yahweh, and Yahweh killed him. And Judah said to Onan, "Go into your brother's wife and marry her, and raise up an heir for your brother." So this is part of the uh, this is this is part of the 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 proper tradition that uh, and it's it's uh, a, a, in order to secure and ensure. Uh, the proper transmission of the inheritance. Um, so when when a, a woman is suddenly widowed, the tradition was in Israel that, that the brother, um, the, the, the oldest brother, would take her on as his wife in order to secure her inheritance and the inheritance of her, her children. So Judah said to Onan, go unto your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. So this is the focus point. The, the importance here is having an heir, having uh, a heritage. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. And it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he emitted on the ground or he spilled his seed on the ground lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased Yahweh. Therefore, he killed him also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah is grown. For he said, lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar 
went and dwelt in her father's house. Now, in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adolamite. Um, the time of the year that this takes place is also uh, significant. This takes place, this, this episode that we're going to get into now, takes place during the sheep shearing season. And it was told Tamar, uh, saying, look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. She took off her widow's gar garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shalah was grown, um, and she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, a prostitute, because she had covered her face. Then he turned to her way and said, please let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, what will you give me that you may come into me? And he said, I will send you a young goat from the flock. So she said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? Then he said, what pledge shall I give you? So she said, your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. And he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. So she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. Then Judah sent a young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adullamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. But he did not find her. Then he asked the men of the place, saying, Where is the harlot who was openly by the roadside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also the men of the place said, There was no harlot in this place. Then Judah said, Let us take uh, let her take them for herself, lest we be ashamed. So I sent this young goat, uh, and you have not found her. And it came to pass after three months that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. So she was brought out. She sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Please determine whose they are, the signet cord and staff. Da, da, da. So Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I, because I did not give her to Shalom, my son. And he never knew her again. Now it came to pass at that time. Okay, so I think we can stop it there at uh, verse 26. So this is a story that's about the importance of uh, of the inheritance of Judah. Um, but then there's all this weird stuff at the beginning that's also, you know, there's there's all these 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 sons involved and and there's Yahweh striking them down and there's Onan, you know, ejaculating on the ground instead of impregnating uh the wife of his brother like he's supposed to so yeah it's it's strange and it's it's uh what, what, what's going on here what is happening in this story so first of all let's take a look remember i said it's important to remember the names of the people involved in this story so we're going to go we're going to begin by looking at the cast of characters first we have judah judah um Judah is the proper heir. He's the he is he is the uh, considered the heir of the heritage for basically the whole nation of Israel, and this is secured through the dynastic succession of David. I'm not going to read the text, but there's there's a text in uh, Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 to 12, which uh, basically um, elevate Judah above his brothers. I believe he's actually the third or the fourth born son of Jacob, and yet he becomes, uh, he takes the place of the heir of the firstborn. Then we have Hira the Adolamite. Uh, this is what his name looks like in Hebrew. Um, and I, I, I show this because when it gets to reading the other stories in the dynastic succession narrative, uh, in Second Samuel, the the look, the the way the names appear in Hebrew will become important. Then we have the daughter of Shua. This is literally uh, uh, Bat Ish Kanani Ushmo Shua. 
The daughter of Shua in Hebrew is literally Bat Shua. Okay? The daughter of Shua is the wife of Judah. We then have the sons of Bat Shua, Er, Onan, and Shelah. And finally, the wife of Er, Tamar. You with me? Yep. Uh oh, oh, you're there. I okay. mute. I mute. I mute. I oh, just... okay. <laughs> Thanks to everybody in the chat, by the way. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, if you if you need to stop me or if you have any questions or, or or need to to say anything, then then just throw it out there. Okay, Derek. Good to go, brother. Okay. So, um, this story, on the face of it, seems disruptive. It occurs in the middle of the story of Joseph. So uh, in, G in Genesis chapter 37, uh, right at the end of the chapter, Joseph has been sold into slavery uh, in Egypt. Then we have this story about suddenly about Judah. And then right after the story about Judah is finished, uh, the story picks up about Joseph and his, his time in Egypt. So it really just sort of plunks itself right there uh, in the middle of this, this otherwise very neat and tidily put together story about Joseph. So that's weird. On the other hand, the patriarch Judah is also the only one of Jacob's sons that also features an independent dedicated story as this one. So it's significant. What's going on here? So for answers, we need to think more carefully about the setting in which this story was told. So this story is part of of the J narrative or the Yahwist uh, text of uh, the, the Yahwist text that that came to form uh, the Pentateuch. This is according to the uh, the documentary hypothesis. Um, the J source was thought to be in existence at least as early as Hezekiah's rule in the eighth century, and possibly stretched back much earlier. So in order to understand more clearly this story, let's take a look at another text commonly called the succession narrative, beginning in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and in particular, the story of the other Tamar. There's two Tamars in the Hebrew Bible. There's actually three, but the, the third one is the daughter of this second one. So right away, there's an obvious connection between this stories. And this is something that we need to pay close attention to. This is where it's going to get juicy, right? This is where it's going to get juicy. So the other Tamar uh, appears in 2 Samuel uh, 13 verses 1 to 33. Now Tamar is a daughter of the king, David, and she's a brother of Abs or, or sorry, she's the sister of Absalom, uh, David's second son the full sister of Absalom. So in this story, and uh, let's just uh, go there, and we'll read this one in its entirety, but then that's that's it. Okay, so, no, that's 1 Samuel. It's in 2 Samuel, chapter 13. Um, there we go. Okay. So after this, so this, uh, this, and this story follows on the heels of the story of um, David's sin with uh, Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah the Hittite, her, her, uh, her husband, and it also takes place uh, during the uh, the war with the Ammonites. After this, Absalom, I'm starting at the beginning of chapter 13. After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick. For she was a virgin. That's why he became sick, apparently. And it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was uh, Yonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. 
Now, when Yonadab, Yonadab was a very crafty man, and he said to him, Why are you, the king's son, becoming thinner day after day? Will you not tell me? Now, uh, Amnon is the firstborn of David. He is the heir uh, to the throne by rights. Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So Yonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. When your father comes to see you, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me food and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. Then Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, please let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes for me in my sight that I may eat them from her hand. And David sent home to Tamar saying, now go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house and he was lying down. She took flour and kneaded it and cakes in his, in his sight and baked the cakes. Then she took the pan and placed them out before him, and but he refused to eat. Then Amnon said, have everyone go out from me. And they all went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into my bedroom that I may eat from your hand. Uh, I've mentioned this, I think, in other lectures before, and I think it bears repeating that um, uh, very often throughout the Hebrew Bible, uh, food and eating uh, can be metaphoric for lust and sexual promiscuity. So it's another euphemism, like... Uh, uh what Francesca Strava Capullo will talk about euphemisms. Euphemisms. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it's not a really, really common one, uh, but it does occur. And I, th I think the, 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 the real focus on food imagery throughout these, these verses here probably plays into that a little bit. Okay. Okay. So let's continue. Um, uh, and Tamar took the cakes that she had, uh, uh, made and brought them to Amnon and uh, uh, brought them to Amnon, her brother, in the bedroom. Now, when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. But she answered him, No, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. And I, where could I take my shame? And as for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. However, he would not heed her voice. And being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. So Amnon raped Tamar. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Arise, be gone. So she said to him, No, indeed, this evil thing sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servant who attended him and said, Here, put this woman out away from me and bolt the door behind her. Now she had on a robe of many colors. For the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel. And his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. Then Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her robe of many colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went away crying bitterly. And Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? But now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this thing to heart. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when David heard all of these things, he was very angry, and Absalom spoke to his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. I'm going to stop there. Um, so uh, we're going to take a look here at the characters that pay a, play a prominent role in this story. Um, certainly as they pertain to the other story in Genesis chapter 38. First, we have Amnon, who's the oldest son of David and the uh, the heir um, by rights, uh, first in line for the throne. 
of David. Then we have Tamar, who is the sister of Absalom and the daughter of David. And importantly, Absalom is uh, he's Amnon's rival. So by right of succession, Amnon should be the next king of Israel. But the way this works in uh, in antiquity is is not entirely straightforward. The king chooses his heir ultimately. And one of the the problems, one of the real tensions that we see through the very lengthy succession narrative, the whole point of the succession narrative, or I should say one of the whole points of the succession narrative, is to establish the legitimacy of Solomon, the very young son of David. But also, uh, all of this takes place through the very, very problematic situation in which David, for whatever reason has not, throughout his entire reign, adopted an heir, provided a legitimate... Uh, he, he's not provided a plan of succession uh, for his kingdom. And this is a problem. So what's taking place throughout uh, the succession narrative? And we're going to get into that uh, shortly here. What, uh, what's taking place is this competition between the sons of David for the throne of Israel. And Absalom is Amnon's competitor. He's the next in line after Amnon. That's important. Okay? Everyone still with us? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I get where this Good. is going. Right. So, okay, then we have Absalom, the second son of David, the rival of Amnon. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's that's the story. And uh, what do I have here? So Amnon is the oldest son of David. He harbors an obsession, the text tells us, with the beautiful sister of his half-brother and rival Absalom. He conspires to have Tamar in his home. Um, he rapes her, but then dishonors her by refusing to take her as his own wife. Absalom is enraged. And then the story goes on to tell us that he kills Amnon during sheep shearing season in Baal Chazor. So all of this takes place within a larger section of the text known as the succession narrative that I've mentioned a few times now. And this is a section between beginning in second Samuel chapter nine, really with, uh, with David's rape of Bathsheba and murder of Uriah, her husband. And it stretches all the way through to uh, first Kings 11 comprising, you know, basically the totality of uh, Solomon's rule. So the succession narrative is royal propaganda uh, for the legitimate succession of Solomon amid these political tensions in Israel. Not only this competition between David's sons, uh, which is prompted by David's failure to, throughout his rule, um, make for a plan of succession. Um, so there's this tension, but then we also have this tension between the North and the South still in place. We have this other tension between the house of Saul and the house of David. Now, David uh, secures the throne from the house of Saul, which really, you know, comprises the bulk of what takes place throughout 1 Samuel and is a feature of 2 Samuel up to this point in chapter 9. But remember what I said, uh while the throne of the while the throne of Israel has been secured by David from Saul from the family of Saul, they didn't just go away. There's still descendants from Saul kicking around. There is still in the minds of them and no doubt many other people living in the land, there's in their minds there is still a legitimate claim of Saul's for the throne of Israel. So David's also, you know, trying to, there's there's this tension taking place within the narrative as well. And then there's, you know, the, the priestly politics between the Levites and the Aaronites. It's in there, and we're probably not going to talk a lot about that, but but this is, there's all this tension. There's all these these competing voices behind these texts. So this is part of the Deuteronomistic history. 
um, which was most likely composed at some point in the reign of Josiah in Jerusalem sometime between 640 to 609 BCE. And one of the purposes of the Deuteronomistic history, the primary purpose of the Deuteronomistic history is to establish the temple in Jerusalem as the single, the only place where you can offer uh, sacrifices to Yahweh. And it's, it's also the establishment of the, of the correct code of conduct for the rulers of Israel and for the people of Israel. But one of the other purposes of the Deuteronomistic history is the legitimation of the line of David through one of his youngest heirs, Solomon. And it seems likely that the succession narrative predates the composition of the Deuteronomistic history, uh, but it was almost certainly heavily redacted by Josiah's administration when, when the, the larger uh, history was put together. So um, much of the work from this point in the uh, succession narrative I'm drawing from uh, a scholar named Don C. Benjamin, uh, and he writes it up in his uh, in his introductory text on the Hebrew Bible uh, in terms of trials, beginning with the trial of David in Second Samuel chapter nine. Uh, oh, I think that's wrong. That should be Second uh, uh, Second Samuel twelve thirty one. Sorry for the typo, everyone. So from Second Samuel chapter nine through chapter twelve is the trial of David, and this is the story of David, his, uh, his, his rape of uh, Bathsheba, who he sees bathing on the, uh, the roof of a house while he is being naughty by staying at home while his troops are off at war, fighting, fighting a war with, uh, with Ammon. Um, he, so he brings her into his house, he rapes her, he gets her pregnant, um, her husband, Yoria, is one of his one of his captains in his army. And um, you know, this is in part to conceal uh the an attempt to conceal the the pregnancy, although I think it, it would have been, you know, almost impossible given that, you know, uh Bats Bathsheba was was raped. I mean there's very little question among among biblical commentators that she has no agency at all in this transaction between the king and her. You know, I think it's fair to suggest that that her husband knew that this had taken place. Um, David uh, attempts to get him to uh, either to to sleep uh, with his wife as a way to basically uh, take on. Uh, take back this shamed woman, um, and he doesn't do so. So ultimately, David ends up ends up murdering him, and then uh, by by placing him in a uh, in a compromising situation in battle, and then he uh, he takes uh, Bathsheba back into his own harem, into his own household. So now the sexual imagery throughout the succession narrative is something that we're going to need to talk a little bit about and it's significantly connected to the affairs of state and at this point i'm going to actually read um from uh, uh benjamin's introductory text uh a little bit about this so uh speaking of uria uh, or no I'll, I'll just i'll just move beyond this so today he says sexual activity carries personal and romantic connotations. In the world of the Bible, sexual activity carried economic and political connotations. Sexual relationships were a measure of the honor and shame of households. And we've already seen some of that occurring in the story of Tamar. She complains bitterly about this right away. Um, women like Bathsheba were important in the distribution of power. The Hebrews rated a father's fulfillment of his responsibility to feed and protect his household on the basis of how well he cared for and protected its women. The women of the household were living symbols of its honor and a measure of the fixed assets of a household. If the father of a household could protect the women of his household, then he could protect all its members. If he left them in harm's way, then he was impeached as someone else who took over the land and children 
of his household. To test the stability or honor of a household, a man from another household attempted to rape one of its women. Rape was not simply an act of sexual violence, but a political challenge to the father of the household to which the women belong. It was a hostile takeover bid. Stories involving rape or adultery like those of Shechem and Dinah, David and Bathsheba, or Amnon and Tamar are not soap operas describing how women, men and women feel for each other or explaining why they hurt each other. Like war, rape was a violent social process for redistributing the limited goods that a society possessed so that it was not destroyed by the weakness of a single household. If a household could not protect its women, rape declared the household to be insolent or shamed and unable to fulfill its responsibilities to the community as a whole. So I hope my hope is that that sort of sets this story um, about Amnon and Tamar, which is ultimately part of the succession narrative, into a, a more clear light uh, with regards to the sexual activity taking place here. So Benjamin tells us that in the trial of David, the king is indicted for failing to protect and provide for the land of Israel and its people by abusing his power in taking over the household of Saul. There's a whole section of text, like I said, that we're not going to go into dealing with the house of Saul um, prior to 2 Samuel chapter 9 uh, and the household of Uriah. In each case, David fails to negotiate an effective covenant for his succession and instead uses force to implement his claim. So David rapes Bathsheba, then murders her husband, who is serving him in war with Ammon. The succession, near, uh, as I said, yeah, as I said, this is the, the sexual imagery is closely connected to affairs of state. So this is the trial of David. You with me? Hello? I am. I am. My wife just called. So I'm listening to you. My oh, wife just called me. Right. Literally, so I'm muted. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, we're going to continue with the trial of Amnon. And this appears in 2 Samuel chapter 13, 1 to 14, verse 33. So we already read this. This is the, the, the rape of Tamar. And Don Benjamin tells us that Amnon's failure is to negotiate uh, a covenant for land and children. And I'm going to read uh, something else that uh, that he he's, he says here uh, in connection uh, to this story um, on page 216. So it's important here, um, looking at this story, uh, 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 let's see where to start here. Okay. David is not... so. In, at the beginning of the story, um, Amnon asked David to come see him because he's sick. He's, he's pretending to be sick. And David is not simply a concerned parent coming to the bedside of a sick child. He is a royal magistrate hearing Amnon's petition in a court of law. Unlike a village assembly, which listens to many witnesses and discusses a case until the elders reach a consensus, royal magistrates simply hear a plaintiff and then render a decision. Tamar belongs to the household of Absalom. Remember, Absalom is Amnon's rival, which may have already made an attempt on Amnon's life. So Amnon asks David to make it directly responsible for his safety, which also makes the household of Amnon directly responsible for her safety. So what's happening here is Amnon is asking for Tamar to come visit him in part as, um, I guess, a protection against future attacks, uh, against the threat that he perceives from Absalom. So uh, this crisis episode portrays Amnon as a fool who cannot negotiate a covenant for land and children. Amnon tries to impose a covenant on the household of Absalom by ordering Tamar to have intercourse with him. 
Amnon exploits Tamar's vulnerability by telling her to bake bread for him and to have sexual intercourse with him. The request invites Tamar to commit Absalom's resources to Amnon's campaign to become monarch in David's place. She tells Amnon that if he wants a covenant between his household and the household of Absalom, he needs to negotiate for it. Remember, she tells him, talk to David. He will not withhold me from you. Amnon is a fool who acts on impulse. Tamar is wise because she is patient. The wise know when to talk and when to listen. Fools are hot-tempered because they let passion run or ruin their lives. Tamar's words shame Amnon, just as the women from Shunam shame Elijah, Michal shames David, Jezebel shames Jehu. Three times Tamar appeals to Amnon, assuring him that he can, if he can be patient and negotiate with David, their marriage could ratify a covenant between the household of Amnon and Absalom. So, I mean, part of the tragedy, when the, when the reader or the listener of this story in, in its original setting hears it, of course they're upset about the fact that Amnon has raped Tamar. But then they're also disgusted by the fact that T Amnon then puts her out, puts her away, tells her to leave his house. And this is a signal to them that Amnon is absolutely not a suitable uh, ruler for the nation of Israel. So he fails at trial. And then he's he's killed by Absalom. And something very interesting happens. Absalom uh, uh, tells, it says that two years transpire after this takes place before Absalom um, comes to the king and asks him to come out um, to Baal Hazor where he's, he's uh, shearing the sheep. Um, and David says, no, uh, we're fine. Thank you very much. Go in peace. Blessings upon you. And then uh, Absalom says, well, no, uh, at least send Amnon and my brothers out. And David again says, no, they're going to stay here. And finally, he says, please, you've got to send Amnon out to, to meet me uh for sharing the sheep and david relents and amnon grow goes and he gets drunk and absalom kills him um and all the the rest of the sons of david flee from uh flee from the scene now i i it's an important question i think to ask here why does david resist absalom's request to have amnon and his brothers meet him at the sheep shearers in baal hazor are you still with me derek Yes, I muted. You, have, you literally okay, caught yeah. me like the one moment my wife called me last time. You literally yeah, were yeah. asking for attention. I was like, "Oh crap, she's in the middle." Uh oh, no, we're good now. I'm, 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 I'm tracking where you're going. Okay, so any thoughts though? Absalom I'm, asked David to send Amnon out, and David says no. Yeah, um, this gets back to that what Tamar was trying to say, in my opinion. When you press him, if you ask enough, there seems to be these triplets that keep happening. Of he'll he'll That's relent eventually, but also I keep thinking of doublets and triplets and things in narrative format. Maybe I'm jumping the gun here and already thinking in this political sense of the seed. It's going back. We see this kind of repetitive narrative happening over and over again, and it's legitimating the Judahites, I think, or the people from the mm. southern kingdom because here you have judah pop in the middle of this story that would have probably been a northern kingdom story to legitimate the whole descendants from that area of jerusalem and, and and there's so much that's going into my head here that's making me think okay but maybe i'm jumping the gun in this in this presentation because i know you're probably going there and i don't want to give away too much but this no, is looking really interesting cool. yeah so i i think i, I i'm gonna say it's good for you to to be paying attention to the to the literary features and this 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 idea of repetition is definitely one of them um but i'm going to suggest here too that uh david's refusal to send amnon out to meet absalom is a signal to what's actually going on here david knows and understands that you know there is a competition taking place between these two figures and I think this is in part his, and it's a weird thing for him to do. And this could also be considered part of a failure on David's part to just let them sort it out, which is what the proper thing to do would have been. 
um, let them prove who the rightful successor should be. Um, but he 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 seems to not want that to happen. It looks like he's almost trying to protect Amnon because he knows what Absalom is going to do. So, and I think on the on on the uh, the reader, the the listener in the original context that this story was told is probably going to key in on that and going, well, that's a dumb thing for David to do. That's a failure on David's part, you know, to try and get in the way of these two guys duking it out. So, but that's that's what's going on here. David knows uh, that Absalom's intentions are to extract vengeance and to restore Tamar's honor. Okay, so that's the trial of Amnon within this within this succession narrative. The next one is the trial of Absalom, and it's huge basically stretching from chapter 15 through uh, chapter 24. Um, so after uh, after Absalom kills Amnon, Absalom flees uh, because he's worried about his own safety and, and his own life. Um, I think not necessarily from his father, but also from brothers because they see the game is afoot. Um, Absalom just just killed uh, the his his closest rival and has now secured the position of the top dog. He's the one who is is in line uh, to be the heir of the throne. So he's probably you know concerned for his own safety from other rivals within the household of David. So. He flees. He's away for three years. Um, he eventually comes back safely, um, and and his uh, his safety is secured by by Joab. Um, after coming back, he starts a campaign to become uh, the heir and and tries to uh, essentially overthrow David. He he orchestrates a coup, and it's interesting how he does so. Um, Absalom plots to usurp David's rule by staging a coronation in Hebron. Do you know anything about Hebron? I mean, I know I've heard of the place, but as far as if you yeah. handed me a Within map, the and biblical said, where story, is it? Do you um, know why it's important? No, help me out. Help me out. Okay. Hebron is the city where David became king. It was his first seat of power. Um, and, and as I mentioned, he ended up he ended up moving into Jerusalem in part to uh, establish and to centralize his rule over the entire kingdom. But originally, Hebron was was the uh, the the place of his coronation. So what what Absalom is doing here is he's signaling uh, his own legitimacy through going to Hebron. And proclaiming himself king there. Because this is where it all began, right? All of this stuff. It's very, very symbolic. It's very important. The other thing that he does. So um, when this happens, and, and because there seems to be a lot of support for Absalom's claim to the throne, uh, David decides to take his household and leave the city of Jerusalem because he he sees that that Absalom is going to to come there next and uh, exert his power there. So David flees to save his own life and and to save the lives of his family members. But then he chooses to leave ten concubines in the city. Absalom comes into the city, um, and upon entering the city, he publicly rapes these 10 wives of David. And this is a demonstration that he is now the king of Israel who will fulfill the, who will fulfill the terms of the covenants that the households, uh, that the household of David has with the households of the 10 other tribes of Israel. So the symbolic, the symbol here is that these, these wives, these 10 wives that David left in the capital are symbolic, they're, they're, they're symbolic for the power 
of the ten tribes of Israel. So when um, when Absalom rapes them, it says he takes, you know, they pitch a tent on top of the house and he rapes them in view of all of Israel for everyone to see. Uh, this is his his proclamation to them. You're my bitch now. I'm in charge. Okay. <laughs> Bro, like who said we need Game of Thrones? Someone just needs Oh, them. no, we do not. I mean, this is enough, yeah. right? What yeah, in the is, world? This is wild stuff, eh? Yeah. So, um, ultimately... Uh, in Sunday there's, there's school, a lot. I, I just can't imagine. Like, <laughs> And then Absalom, little children. Absalom. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I had a I had a picture Bible, which was like my favorite when I was a kid. I mean, I wore the covers off of that thing. But yeah, this this story wasn't in there. <laughs> um, so or at least a very, a very, very, uh, a very sanitized version of this story took its place. Um, so there's after this, there's, you know, there's a fairly lengthy a, a, a good portion of the story is is committed to Absalom's choice of advisors. You know, one is is loyal to the House of David and seems to have been planted in there to to basically give give Absalom poor advice so that that David can get the upper hand. And you know, ultimately, Absalom is killed. His rebellion is quashed, and. Uh, and we move on. We're told there's another rebellion by a by a, a guy, uh, a man by the name of Sheba. He mounts against uh, against David. There's another story in there about um, you know the house of Saul. Uh, so the the picture that we get during this whole succession narrative is is that this is a tumultuous time, and David's power on the throne of Israel is absolutely not secure. I mean, two attempted coups, you've got uh, this infighting and competition amongst your sons to overthrow you, and you've also got the family of Saul, who's still kicking around in the background. I mean, it's a, it's a dangerous time. And this is basically how it plays out for the rest of David's life. And he spends his entire life uh, without ever installing a plan of succession and this is as i mentioned before a huge problem so we finally get to the trial of adonijah which takes place in first kings verses one to ten according to benjamin amnon's failure is to negotiate uh sorry amnon's failure is is to honor his father david he fails to honor uh his father david uh he says the attempts to usurp David's authority as father of the household and appoints himself as heir. So uh, let's take a look at how this story begins. I'm going to ask you to read this, Derek, because I feel like I'm talking too In much. First so, first Kings 1 through 10? First Kings chapter 1, and I'm just going to get you to read this first little bit here. Um, uh, verses I, 1. Uh, let me get it here. Uh Verses 1 through 4. Okay. This is how the story begins. I have the ESV version. Now King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servant said to him, Let a young woman be sought for my lord, the king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms, that my lord, the king, may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag, is that how you say it? Abishag, Abishag, Abishag the Shulamite, the, Shu, the Shunamite, and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful, and she was of service to the king and attended to him. But the king knew her not. Right. So this is a very uh, another fairly sanitized story. What's what's the deal here with uh, with Abishag, the the Shunamite? Why is What's she doing here with the king? Why? Is yeah, she like there? what's keeping her keeping him warm? Like hugging and you cuddling? really think she's keeping? No, do you think that's what's going on? Are they spooning, but they're just not going all the way? What's what's supposed to happen? Do you think? 
I would think, yeah, she's beautiful. Like there's a lot of attention to her, her looks, her, her yeah. body and things like that. So you would think, so but what's it the does... expectation that that will take place here. What he's what supposed is... to lie with her. He's supposed to have sex with her. Yeah. Right. Now he doesn't. And this is a problem because this is a signal to the people that David is impotent. He can oh, no longer have thing. sex with the woman, even the most beautiful woman in Israel. He can no longer get it up. You cannot have a king who can no longer get it up. Wow. And okay. to make matters worse, we still don't have a plan of succession in place. So this is why Adonijah does what Adonijah does. Okay. He's aware of the danger that David's impotence and indecisiveness poses to Israel. He attempts to usurp David's authority as father of the household and points himself heir. Um, so, yeah, the, the story begins by noting David's impotence. As an old man, says Benjamin, he cannot have intercourse, even with the most seductive woman in Israel. He is no longer fit to be king, but still has not adopted an heir. This is a crisis. And ultimately, it, it's a crisis that requires the intervention of Bathsheba, David's wife, before David agrees to finally, finally adopt Solomon, who is finally installed as the rightful king of Jerusalem. But given that Solomon's control over the tribal confederacy is short-lived, I think this is another signal to us to help us see with perfect clarity the tenuousness of david's own grip on power this is not a healthy kingdom the united kingdom of israel it's it's teetering on the point of dissolution from the start and it never gets better to the point where after solomon dies the whole thing falls apart so this is why there are so many threats uh, to Solomon's succession. And I think, so uh, Adonijah's failure in all of this, I would suggest, is that he's he's the only one. Okay, think of think of the three of the 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 three um, the three competitors. You've got Amnon, you've got Absalom, you've got Adonijah. Adonijah is the only one who fails to do one thing that both Absalom and Amnon did. What's that? Uh, fill me in. I, I don't know. He didn't have sex with anyone. So this, okay, so we're getting, and I just want to remind everybody. So now that you're filling in this pieces, this gets back to this Genesis 38 very clearly. We're getting There's, back to this now. Okay, okay, okay. Wow. Okay. So, but this is the messy, messy, messy succession narrative. The problem here is the fact that, that there's no heir in place. There's no plan of succession. This is a huge problem. Um, there are these brutal competitions between, J between uh, uh, David's sons for the throne because he has usurped his own responsibility to, uh, to install an heir. Uh, there's two coup attempts. Or sorry, I guess there's three ultimately coup attempts uh, because David has usurped his responsibility to an install an heir, and then throughout this whole thing, you've got this. Uh, you, you've also got this 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 failure of David, um, who who really behaves like uh, like a despot in in uh, asserting his power inappropriately through the rape. Of Bathsheba, and I would suggest too that the the rape of Tamar by Amnon um, is also, in many respects, uh, a way of being very critical of David's rape of Bathsheba right. without actually, yeah, well, yeah, he couldn't exactly. protect her. He couldn't protect her. Yes. He couldn't. Right. Yes. So there's all this stuff going on. Um, now I would I'm going to suggest to you that the story of Judah and Tamar in Genesis 38 
at the heart of it um, is really commenting and exploring what's taking place here it's in anachronistic the narrative. No, uh, no, that's I mean, not the, they're not kind like of a, it's, putting it's the... like a parable. Okay, okay. It's like a parable or a metaphor. I'm going to suggest it's a social critique of the House of David. In many ways, it could be read one of two ways, and we'll and we'll sort of get into that. Um, but there's there's definitely an element of of social criticism here. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how these two passages compare to one another. All right? You ready for this? I'm ready. We're going to look at Genesis 38, and we're going to focus in on on Second Samuel 13, which is the 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 rape of Tamar, which is really where where the 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 connection between these two passages uh, coalesces. So first of all, you have the protagonists, Judah. Judah is a shepherd who separates. Remember the I I, I repeated this when I read the story. It's important. He separates from his brothers, his kinsmen, at Adullam. Uh, we read that in Genesis chapter thirty-eight, verse one. You have David. He is a shepherd. David also separated from his kinsmen at Adullam. And this hmm. takes place in 1 Samuel 22, verse 1. In 1 Chronicles 11, so, so Adullam is the place, the, the cave where David, it, it says the, he goes and hides out in a cave uh, in Adullam. And this is sort of the first place he goes and where he he gathers his forces, the mighty men of of David. This is where where the his his army of of renegades is first put together, um, and from which he embarks on his campaign against the house of Saul. Okay, mm -hmm. Judah's friend, the the name of Judah's friend is Hira. And I want you to pay attention, even if you can't read the the language. I, I want you to pay attention to to how this how this looks. Okay, uh, okay. the Hebrew Hebrew uh, the Hebrew name. David's closest ally is his closest political ally is uh, Hiram, the king of Tyre. Uh, Hiram is uh, is the one who uh, who builds David's house. Hiram is the one who who uh, provisions. And and basically uh, is contracted to to build the temple in Jerusalem for Solomon. Um, it's exactly uh, the the names are for all intents and purposes the same. The only difference is the final letter, where Hira is spelled with a hey, Hiram is spelled with a mem. Okay, Judah's wife is the daughter of Shua, literally, but Shua. David's wife is Bathsheba. Bathsheba. <laughs> but, but turn your Bible. Okay, flip now, Derek, to First okay. Chronicles three verse five and read it. All right, First Chronicles three, like chapter one, three through five. No, no, First Chronicles three, chapter three, verse uh -huh. five. Remember, there's two. Okay, of them. got it. Two These were born to him in Jerusalem: Shemia, Shobab. Nathan and Solomon, four by Bathshua, the daughter of Amiel. Now I got an ESV. It, yes, and that's okay. right. So what's Bathshua. the name of his wife in Chronicles? Bathshua. Bathshua. Bathsheba. Yeah, it's the name. It's the same name as Judah's wife. It's the same name. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Wow. Are you, I mean, there's a I'm connection tracking. here, right? I'm okay. tracking. The name of Judah's first son is Er, uh, by by Bathshua, and Er is suddenly killed by Yahweh, um, because because of some transgression. Uh, Bathsheba becomes pregnant by David um, when he rapes her. Uh, she gives birth to a son, and the text tells us that Yahweh strikes him. And kills him. So David's first son by Bathsheba is also suddenly killed by Yahweh for David's transgression. Judah's second son name, uh, the the his second son by Bathsheba, uh, his name is Onan. 
David's first son and the heir to his throne is named Amnon. And uh, really, the only difference, again, between these two names is the insertion of a letter Mem. You have and, and Onan and you have Amnon. Just to ask, in this Judah's second son, Onan, wouldn't David's this be David's technical second son if the first one wasn't killed by Yahweh? Uh, well, except the order's uh, mixed up here a little bit because okay. Amnon was born long before um, um, uh, Bathsheba okay. was raped by by David. So, I mean, it's not a perfect it's not a perfect correspondence, but uh, I think for the purposes of what's going on in Genesis chapter thirty eight, it doesn't have to be. Okay. Judah's third son, uh, his name is Shelah. And uh, we see in this story, um, Judah, the Judah's failure in this story of, um, of Tamar uh, is really to provide for her an heir. Um, he, he says, you know, first, here's the problem. She is the, the wife of heir, um, but he dies before she, she becomes pregnant and, and uh, has children. He gives it to Onan, and we're told Onan spills his seed, and that makes Yahweh angry, so he kills him. Uh, then she's given to uh, Shelah, and Judah says, Shelah's too young. I'm going to put you away in my house. You're go you'll remain in my household, uh, and then when he becomes of age, uh, you, you can marry him, and he you will have your inheritance secured through him. But then Shelah becomes of age. And Judah does nothing. So Judah reneges on his word. And I've been hammering away on this throughout the succession narrative. One of the big problems throughout the succession narrative is the fact that David does nothing with regards to the plan of succession. This is the same thing going on here. Right. So because, because uh, Judah has reneged on his responsibility, Tamar is forced to take matters into her own hands and, you know, goes into this elaborate plot to pose as a prostitute in order to become impregnated by Judah in order to secure her own inheritance, essentially. So David's second son by Bathsheba is Solomon. And in Hebrew, it's Shalomo. Uh, and it looks like this. And as with some of the other characters, the only difference between the name Shalomo and Shela is the insertion of this mem uh, just between the Lamed and the Hay. And of course, at the conclusion of the story, David, still reneging on his responsibility, does you know fails to provide a plan for succession. And what has to happen? Bathsheba. <laughs> is the one who goes and takes matters into her own hands and provides uh, for, for the inheritance of her own son. So that's it. Um, I would say, you know, um, in terms of, in terms of the, the relationship between the two texts, I think, uh, I think Genesis 38 uh, was a story that was what was pulled in uh, by the Yahwist, um, but was out there for a long time. Maybe uh, this this is a story that might have emerged, you know, right around uh, the time that uh, that Solomon became the king in Israel, or or right after David passed away. Um, and I think there's there's possibly one or two things it could be read one of two ways so i'm going to suggest that this is either an oppositional critique uh something that was invented by by the rivals of david perhaps by the house of saul delivered as a censure for the house of david for the illegitimate succession that occurred as a result of david's rape of bathsheba or alternatively it could have been an internal apologetic offered as an explanation for the legitimate for the legitimacy of succession 
despite David's guilt. You'll remember and you'll note that another thing in common between both stories is at the end of the story in Genesis 38, Judah is publicly shamed and he's publicly penitent. He's like, yeah, I, my bad. Sorry. Mm. I'm, I'm making it up to you. And similarly, uh, David is publicly shamed by the prophet Natan uh, in his, uh, in his, uh, uh, for, for what he did, uh, to Bathsheba and to the house of Yodia. Uh, and, and, uh, part of, part of, uh, um, Nathan's response to David, he literally says what you did in secret, I'm going to do publicly in front of the whole world to see. So David was also publicly shamed, but then was, you know, publicly penitent. So I think it, it, I'm I don't know which way this goes, but I think right. I think it could go both ways. But in the end, what we're left with here, sharing my screen, um, in the end, what we're left with here is just a wild, really neat uh, story. Um, I think this helps to to show um, that when when we're dealing with the book of Genesis, when we're dealing with the Torah, um, we shouldn't be reading it as literature about the Bronze Age. We should be reading this in connection to what's going on in Israel during the monarchy. And like, here's a clear example of, uh, of, of a text that obviously has, you know, the succession within the household of David in view as it, you know, and, and turns it into this, this parable really. Or uh, even, or even an explanation for why the monarchy didn't last or whatever, you know, like there's, there, Something. this could be utilized yeah. even if this is written after, you know, a few things. And then I want to get to some super chats and have anyone who has questions. Absolutely. Ask. But the first thing Absolutely. I wanted to mention that I think is interesting, you, you kind of, you know, when you find a certain key, when you're looking into scripture, you kind of wonder, okay, does this possibly work itself in other areas? And I thought about when Abraham and his sons were traveling and they bump into another tribe. I cannot remember the name of the tribe. It's in Genesis where they are, you know, getting along with them just fine. And then the son rapes the sister of the sons of Abraham or the daughter of Abraham. And here is this unification where Abraham, once again, there's a threat to his power. Okay. And here he is in a way. Think, is this, uh, is this the rape of Dinah? I, that sounds like that her you're name. Thinking of by Shechem. I don't remember the names, but yeah, I think it may be where the brothers are so angry and Abraham says, yes. listen, so it's this cool. is, yeah, this is the rape of Dinah by, by, by Shechem. Um, and, and so these are the sons of, these are the sons of Jacob. Um, right. And of oh, course, sons of Jacob. Note, okay, I'm thinking Abraham. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So it's important yes. to note here the names, you know, the sons of Jacob, these are the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. um, Shechem. <laughs> Shechem is the name of the uh, capital city of the Northern Kingdom. See, you this, know, is, this is, I mean, come you know, on. Uh, yeah, you know. none of this is, none of this is accidental. No. So, and, and quite often, like I mentioned, you know, throughout the Bible, um, and throughout uh, throughout the Bible, uh, the Northern Kingdom is referred to either as Israel or as Ephraim. Uh, within uh, contemporary literature, like outside the Bible, third party literature, I believe that the Northern Kingdom is is very very frequently, if not always, referred to as the Kingdom of Shechem. Wow. So so this but yeah, this I mean, obviously another... plays into this exact theme of control power they're they're obviously going to circumcise and when they're having their fever on the third or fourth day i can't remember the sons of jacob going and literally murder all the people and it makes me think of the same power struggle theme that's happening in what you just described i it just i don't know why but i guess when you see this sexual issue taking place that a red flag is this a narrative playing a doublet or triplet or is this somehow trying to reflect on this idea that you were describing and yeah. I, I guess it might be I, yeah i i'm going to and i'm going to suggest here that, that when it comes to sex in the bible um you know the our primary reading of it should not be within this within this
Kip. Damn I think it. we lost. Oh, oh. oh you're, you're back now. You're back now. Okay. All right. What was I saying? You said uh, your primary reading shouldn't be. And then you stopped. But in this very post enlightenment romantic um, view of coupling that we have now, I mean, certainly that was there within the ancient world. And you're, there are definitely examples of that, right? I mean, the Song of Solomon is, is, is all about romantic coupling or, you know, mostly about romantic coupling. But I would say that primarily when it comes to sex in the Bible, um, this is all about power, economics, uh, political strength, um, virility. Like these are the features uh, that we should be focusing on within the text. I'll say one more thing that I think is interesting. Just throwing it out there. Recent interview was done with Bart Ehrman and um, Johanna Janes, who also was like an affiliate to promoting what Bart's doing. And the topic of Romans chapter one with Paul and homosexuality being mentioned. Um, Bart said the reason this was a sin and he's, taking in the whole picture of the milieu or the zeitgeist of the situation is that a man shouldn't be dominated that, that, that uh, it's this idea that you're talking about when you go way back in time, that they're the submissive one, they're taking it, that kind of thing, according to the, the way the culture was working, that was the sin. It wasn't necessarily uh, what hole are you using or whatever. Okay. We're getting deep into this conversation. My point is, is that this gets into this idea of being able to dominate and who's in control. A power issue is what made this a sin, according to what Bart was saying. Don't know how true it is. No expert in this area. Just throwing it out there. It, it makes me think, wow, we're really thinking anachronistically. Like that deed is what's bad, but rather yeah. it's a power issue, I think, that he's saying. So anyway. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, you know, And I, I don't think that's all of it, but I definitely think it's it's it plays a part. Right. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, one of the reasons why, why that power dynamic is so important is because, and, and why it's expressed through sex is because this is the way that you, you know, you, you, you protect your family and you, you secure the longevity, um, of your family through, through, uh, progenity, uh, through right. inheritance, through offspring. Um, and you, you know, you have to have sex to have children. That's, right. you know, all this stuff kind of works together like that. Right. Now I know most people think birds bring babies, but listen, I'm telling you, it happens a different way. No, you bring up the God and anatomy book that I, that I love talking about so much because yeah, all yeah. these euphemisms and problems, my friend Steven talked about in the Greek world, a man lost his virginity when he got in battle. He oh, could right. take a woman's pierced in battle, pierced in battle, or at least injured yeah. in some sense in battle. So it's really interesting how power and strength and combat and warfare and all this stuff plays. It's uh, it ties in sex. All right. Super chats. Here we go. Awesome. Jason Sobeck, Lord of the four corners. Thank you for the super sticker, my friend. Uh, I don't think you're here now and we're giving you a shout out. So oh, he no. said he had to leave earlier. It's okay. He oh, had to leave. I'm sorry. I really appreciate you, my friend. Indo, thank you for the super chat, the support. Anyone who wants to ask questions, feel free to super chat. He says, God killed Onan because he didn't want to have kids like God commanded. He disobeyed. But also, what about Ur? Uh, other, yeah. was, uh, there, was there was no, no other reason, reason given. given. Right. Could yeah. this be a metaphoric or be metaphoric? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I, I yeah, I think we just spent like over an hour <laughs> Kind of explaining kind of why God filling in the yeah explaining all this, um, but I will say like one thing I, I you know air is what I, maybe one of the reasons why uh, air is such a footnote uh, in the text is because um, you know the uh, the the son the first the first son of uh, of David and Bathsheba um, you know was an infant and died and basically uh, served no other purpose within the text uh, other than as a symbol, right? Of God's anger and his displeasure and his vengeance. Hmm. 
Indo, I hope you got that answer during that sh- during the show. No, it's a lot of information. S Duck, thank so, you oh, for this. Sh- I get yeah. one, one other thing I think it's important to point out here, which I think is possibly relevant as well. So the name air, um, you know, it's uh, it, the a derivative from from the word air. It, it's most suggest it comes from the verb at a, um, the uh, the word city or fortress is derived from air. Uh, it's suggested that it, it means protector. So I mean, think about that too within yeah. uh, within this whole larger theme of of you know a man's duty is to provide and protect his family so air was just like you know wiped out and maybe maybe that has something to do with it. maybe maybe that's part of the explanation here that that the the protection uh offered by david was so vapid and so you know it was so fleeting mm. thank you so much for the super sticker s duck i do not Oh, he says, no singing. No. <laughs> thank you so much. Cause you remember you said you weren't going to be singing in this episode. Doc Pleroma, not thank you for the 10. I really appreciate it. Wasted seed seems to be limited to the redactoral strata of the Babylonian Talmud as assuming special powers. Is this due to differing assumptions? Are he, uh, semen versus their Palestinian semen. counterparts? <sighs> I wish I <laughs> knew more about what was going on here i uh, my applaud apologies to doc uh pleroma not for for not knowing um anything about uh about the wasted seed motif in the babylonian talmud differing assumptions semen versus their palestinian and wouldn't it be much later too though wouldn't that be a bit later oh Sure, but and I I think there's probably something. I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, I I'm sure there's a there's a very very interesting question in there somewhere. I just I'm 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 not smart enough. I'm sorry uh, to know what <laughs> it is. Okay. It's better to not give a answer than to give something that's BS. So, Melody Joy, thank you for the support. Good to see you back, Doctor Kill. Happy to be here. This thank is you so much. Yeah, Constellation Pegasus. Really appreciate the support. I always enjoy it. Is it just me that worshiping God in the Old Testament is like making a deal with a mafia? Doesn't take much to piss someone off and get killed off real quickly, like a New York minute. I think I think that's yeah. Yeah, it's uh mafia justice is uh is is very very ancient. And um uh, and was was much more legitimate uh you know a long time ago <laughs> than it turned out to be so hmm. but yeah thank you and so I, much I think too i mean i i hope one of the things i i hope this does is to sort of is is to sort of show how you know there is a there is a strong apologetic at work for for the uh the rule of david um when in reality you know, he was probably a, a a big dickhead. That's what Joel uh, Joel Baden says in his yeah, book on David. Like he he the, he's been, oh go ahead. No, no, I was going to say the the lengths um, that the writers uh, in uh, in the uh, the Deuteronomistic history, and then even more so uh, by the chronicler yeah. to sanitize uh the rule of david and to rehabilitate this guy are extreme so you if you're wanting to find a contradiction or a problem in the narrative that seems by the chronicler to be an embarrassment you may want to go and read samuel first kings first and then get over to chronicles and find out this does not look at all like that. And that's, I think, what Joel Baden was saying when he was asked the question, yeah. do you think there was probably a historical David? He thinks so. And the reason he thinks so is the embarrassment. He thinks it's so embarrassing that he's like, <laughs> why would you make this guy who oh, literally yeah. over and over and over fails? I mean, he has some successes, but it's like, 
like anyone has some successes. He's just a, a guy who made a lot of problems and mistakes and things like that. But then they whitewash him. Well, why would they do that unless there was probably totally, a guy on the basis? Totally agree. Yeah. I, you know, it's sort of the way I, I, yeah, I treat David mythicism very much the same way I treat Jesus mythicism. Um, you know, the lengths, the lengths to which the writers go to, to explain or to, to rehabilitate so many of the features of both of these figures is a, is a strong testament to their, uh, to their existence. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. It, our good friend Francesca thinks probably not, but she doesn't say probably yeah, David, not, David. David? Probably, oh, probably wow. not. Wow. I'd like to know her reasoning behind that. I, yeah, but, me too. You know, see what and she you know. What? I mean, I, I'm a I'm a sucker too, right? Like, I I desperately hope there was an historical David, just because these stories are so amazing. Um, and I have no doubt that that has that is just just you know obliterated my my uh, your my scholarly objectivity <laughs> right yeah i'm like i don't either way for me i just i'm really just trying to go oh. wherever it seems to make the most sense to me and him being whitewashed so much just makes come me on, man. Way, so. come yeah. on come uh, on neo fight uh, one thank you for the support my friend good to see you here <laughs> dr davis I've been reading a lot of on Jewish binatarianism. Would you agree the Dead Sea Scrolls reflect this type of theology more so than absolute monotheism? Absolute monotheism. <sighs> yeah, you know, I think I I think that's I think that's that's yeah, uh you can make a case for that. Um something that we definitely see throughout the scrolls is is this strong focus on uh on on a i i guess um cosmic figures right which i think lends lends to this or or leads into it um and i i will confess i'm i'm also not uh, uh i'm not as as up to date as I should be, I, I'm not as well versed as I should be in uh, um, Jewish binatarianism. But I think I think he's probably onto something there. You could certainly you can certainly see it in the scrolls. Thank you, Neophyte. Thank you for the support. Okay, so my wife just called me. I want you to answer this. I'll read it real quick. She said we got a hornet in the house. That's what she was trying to call uh -oh. me about earlier. And oh, I'm like, God. I'm not alive. She's like, I'm afraid to leave the room. So I, oh before I get all my duties stripped of me and I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I need to go in there and defend the woman. No, um, Scott Duke, thank you for the support. Could you please share your thoughts about the discovery of the Mount Ebla? Uh, so Ebla you want me to talk about this while you go kill? Just real quick. I go kill, kill the, the enemy. All right. Bring back its yeah. foreskin. Show you that I've doubled the amount of foreskin. All that good stuff. I'll be right back. All right. I'm I Derek. Derek better come back with 10,000 foreskins. Um, it was 10,000, wasn't it? So um, can you please share your thoughts about the discovery of the Mount Ebla curse inscription recently announced? Is it being overhyped? This is, I'm, I'm pretty happy that uh, you asked this question today, Scott. Um, I haven't followed uh i haven't followed it really really closely but i have stayed stayed abreast of what's going on a little bit um so and of course one of the problems here is the fact that nobody's seen it yet um scholars have not had a chance to to take a look at uh at, at the photographs of the inscription itself so all we have to go on right now are um are the claims made uh, by the archaeologists who uh, who made the discovery. So, um, what I I will say I think there. Are, so I, I'll put this discovery into a, a, a couple of different contexts. I think it's hugely important. Um, it's hugely important uh, from the perspective of uh, of Hebrew language because this is yet another um, this is yet another text. A very very early text from I believe it's the 12th century BCE, uh, um, a clear example of Hebrew writing from uh, the 12th century BCE. Now, bear in mind when I say Hebrew writing, I'm talking about a a Canaanite pictographic uh, script here. So, 
is it Hebrew? Is it, is it, um, Ugaritic? Is it, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not like, bam, this is, this is the biblical language here. There is some, there is some, some discussion and some debate as to the relationship between, you know, this, these very early, uh, this very, very early primitive form of the language and, you know, what takes place afterwards. Um, it's neat. I call it a pictographic text because as I understand it, um, it preserves uh, a, a form of the language, uh, which is still um, the, the, I mean, letters, ancient letters were formed originally from pictographs. So for example, um, I believe the letter Aleph was originally uh, a picture of a bull. Um, and the letter bet was originally like a picture of a house, uh, I think. Um, so apparently that's what, what, what's on the inscription. And that's the kind of text that it is, that it, it's sort of, it, it, it uh it's this kind of uh language and i think that's 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 cool as hell i think that's that's amazing um i also think it's amazing that that it's a curse inscription now a caveat on that and i'm going to recommend that if uh, you know for what i think is a pretty balanced appraisal from someone who knows what he's doing uh please go check out christopher rolston's blog he wrote about it recently um he's he's an expert epigrapher um, and you know, he's, he's an acquaintance of mine, uh, who I really like. Um, he and I have, uh, have done some work together before on the, uh, on the Dead Sea Scrolls forgeries. So, um, go and check out what he has to say about it. And I think he's on point by noting that, uh, there is definitely some dispute about what's going on here in terms of mm -hmm. what's, what the text is itself. Right. I mean, we don't even know if, if this is a curse inscription, um, so, but having said all that, uh, if it is, if it is a curse inscription, if it was found on Mount Ebla, um, I have a couple of other thoughts here. Uh, I think what this shows us is that there is a cursing tradition of some sort already connected to this mountain. And I think there's this uh, helps to show that the um, in, in the book of Deuteronomy uh, and in the book of Joshua, they're drawing on this pre-existing curse tradition and you know turning it into something uh something uh more more theologically appropriate more nationalistically appropriate within uh within the worship of yahweh um i also think that this is potentially problematic for those who hold to ideas about um about inerrancy and about the perfect preserved text of scripture because in the book of Deuteronomy, or no, no, it's in the book of Joshua when Joshua um, rehearses the curses again at uh, Mount Ebla, uh, we're told that he said all of the curses and that there were none, and he didn't add anything to the curses originally of Moses. And what we have in the curse inscription is something that does not match. The biblical text at all all we have is this curses curse 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 yahweh curse i you know so um i think it you know i think that hurts this idea that you know the torah is just this perfect preservation of all the all the text these very ancient textual traditions and i think it's also kind of exciting because it shows us too the ways in which uh these theological developments took place much much later so it's, i'll just repeat like... go and check out christopher rolston's blog on this he he does a very good job uh, assessing it, the it's uh, like when ronald hendel talks about how they discovered abandoned massive cities that were built with enormous stones and what did they do they said that giants built them why because they themselves these nomadic people couldn't imagine men making a city that large uh, it had to be enormous men, giants. And so the imagination kind of kicks in there. Well, I mean, that's a that's probably a bad analogy. The, the different analogy is here's an existing tradition. There's something there. And boom, now you have text that later kind of say, hey, th this goes way back. This is back there where Joshua is rather than what he's trying to do, Dr. Shipling. And I plan on having academics who oppose this once we have the peer reviewed literature come out saying everything they can about what was discovered. 
um, he's trying to equate this as evidence that Joshua had the whole text of Moses and that there was this language was already outside of being hieroglyphic. So it's in this transition stage where you could actually write text instead of writing massive books and hieroglyphics to try and get the point across. So there's a lot there that he's stretching, I think, to try and make this fit the time. And it's better to say this is anachronistic, that there was already an existing tradition of curse, blah, blah, blah. And then they write it down. Yeah. But anyway. And I'll repeat here, and it's really important. No one's seen it yet. And until yeah. until this is published and until scholars get a, get an opportunity to actually look at what's there. I mean, you know, it's just it's there. Yeah, we can't really. You can't really make the kinds of claims that he's or or draw the connections he is until he's he's had a chance to uh, to have this critically reviewed. I don't think. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate that, Kip. Klaus, you have been forgiven, my friend. Uh, they were asking about uh, spilling seed on the ground if God was going to kill them, and I said, "Here, you can pay for." Yeah, no, man. And he says, no. "Now he's feeling relieved, you're so you're good to go." Spill your seed all over the place. <laughs> So and I think I, I would say, so I know, like, I mean, when I was, you know, this was the, this was the go-to text, right? About, uh, about not masturbating. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In, in church, you can't do it because look, look what God did to Onan for masturbating. And I really don't think that's, I really don't think it was like, oh, masturbating. I don't think it was like that at all. Um, as I said, this is all connected to, to, you know, air. <laughs> the 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 inheritance the securing of an heir you know the provision of property and 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 security for your family so i i, I have no doubt that that the 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 hebrews you know a jack uh they they masturbated all the time happily and and guilt-free so thank you so much for that Sovereign soul, thank you for the super chat, my friend. How does all this violation politics work in conjunction with the fine imposed for such acts in Exodus? I always thought the Bible was saying Absalom was excessive in murdering Amnon. Now, so, um, I mean, certainly there's a lot of the, the problem with, with looking at a text like this and with looking at texts in general within the Hebrew Bible is that you've got all these, there's, there's multiple voices working here. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, there's definitely, um, a, an internal, uh, critique of exactly what's taking place in, uh, in David's household. And yeah, um, Exodus does legislate against this kind of stuff, but, when and under what circumstances and i would suggest to you that you know if there is if there was an historical david if there was an historical you know house of david if these stories in any way reflect uh what was occurring at the time they sure as hell didn't have the torah um and they sure as hell did not have uh the 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 legal code um which which condemned a lot of this stuff so yeah i mean all this to say yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of mixed messages uh throughout the bible and the reason for that is because there's there's all sorts of different different viewpoints that you know didn't all quite make it through the uh the sanitization process thank you for that large uh, super chat and the support sovereign soul good question constellation pegasus you're back thank you for the super chat why was god not killing people as the story unfolded hard for me to keep up with all of this it's an interesting point because uh, if it was a complete fiction right let's play that again if this yeah. was a complete fiction you would imagine he just struck people dead at every moment every turn you know right so it with if we're if we're talking about the succession narrative here right you know yeah like um and maybe maybe that's another maybe that's another um um point in favor of of an historical kernel uh behind this i like that Derek. i mean maybe i'm wrong maybe i don't know you know maybe there's something because when you when you started describing this this is what was interesting constellation pegasus was writing in the chat i try to keep eyes on everything and still keep yeah up. it's hard uh, to do 
It is. I've been learning to multitask. Uh, my wife's way better at it than you. me. But women um, are apparently <laughs> it's seriously a, it's like, a, like a biological thing. It's I it's think. interesting. But Constellation brought up an interesting point of like, like how different it is to think in these terms than what we do today. We're so far removed in many ways to what's going on then. And that's what made me like kind of think about this. Like, this is hard to keep up with. Finally, you started putting pieces together eventually, and it all started mm -hmm. adding up and it was more clear. But at first I was like, yeah, Geez, it's, it's hard. Oh, I know. Eh? Yeah. It's, it's very, very complex. And it really takes some time just, just, just sifting through the texts and, and pouring over them and, and, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's tough. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> Eminem just spilled his seat a half hour ago. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm just looking at the chat. Eminem says, "I just spilled my seat a half hour ago." Oh my gosh! You go, man. Way to go! There you go, Dan Bigfoot. Thank you for the super chat. Does Kip believe Aesop's fables are more moral than more? I assume more moral than the Hebrew Bible. Right. You no, know, it yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, the Hebrew Bible is vast, and it's and it's not it's not so um, um, it's not so theme oriented, uh, and singular in its in its message, right? So I would say, I mean, yeah, I think I think Aesop's fables are are probably or definitely uh, much more practical than than almost all of uh, the Hebrew Bible texts. I mean, there's some, you know, there's um, within the instruction and the wisdom literature itself, and this is what, what the, you know, these are texts with the intention of uh, of teaching of moral teaching. There's a lot of good stuff in there, um, but yeah, so much of it is 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 culturally irrelevant and and outdated, and mm -hmm. and and I will say too, I think, um, you know. Uh, when I teach the Hebrew prophets, it's always in this context of uh, of, of social criticism as well. Um, one of the things that, or that maybe the primary thing that the prophets were doing, were uh, were were censuring the uh, the monarchy and censuring the people in power for their abuses of it. And I think that's all very laudable especially in the time and place, et cetera. So Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're way past uh, the morals of the biblical uh, narrative. We should be at least. Um, Ken Scaletta, thank you for the super chat. Good to see you. I always recognize, I think that's a, is that a rabbit's eye? It, I always think of it as a rabbit's eye. I don't know why. Oh, anyway, I'm looking yeah. close. It's hard it to tell. It kind of is. Hello, Dr. Kip. I have a Qumran question. Is the Danielic son of man discussed in the Qumran literature? And if so, how is it interpreted? Um, so the um it's uh so not at length. And there's a couple of uh, uh there's a couple of texts that uh that are possibly um uh interpretations or developments of the uh the son of man tradition. I think the most um, probably the most the most obvious one is the uh, is the eleven Q thirteen, otherwise known as Melchizedek. Um, and as is typical within the Qumran text, there definitely seems to be a focus on uh, a cosmic figure um, who's going to uh, come in, break through, and 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 really um, suss things out in the uh, in the last days. So, uh, and that, that tends to be offhand. I have to go back and look, but, uh, but just drawing off the top of my head, I, I believe this is sort of the direction, uh, the Qumran texts go when, when they are dealing, uh, with, with Daniel, I think it's 11 and 12, isn't it? I think so. I'd have to go back and look and make sure, but it's definitely in the latter chapters. I just noticed too that that somebody has has pointed out that that masturbation is definitely dealt with in Leviticus. No, yeah, that's true. And again, what we're dealing with here is is a matter of uh, of when. So, like this is and who too. Like uh, people also have to understand that when it comes to to the biblical literature and the laws and the stories and stuff, 
the people who are like like the real people who are you know living in the countryside and and looking after their farms and 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 providing for their own families and stuff they're not reading they're not reading anything um they're probably not even uh worshiping yahweh and if they are worshiping yahweh they're worshiping yahweh in conjunction with all these other gods um they have no interest really in what's going on in the temple or in the palace insofar as uh, you know up to the point where it, it starts to concern them which is almost never so really nobody knows about this I, you know these these texts in in leviticus are, are written by priests for priests and you know kings and princes and and people who are are you know living in the the you know the the upper echelon of uh jerusalem society Thank you for that. Scholar vid is the tell then stilly the only evidence for David outside the Bible. How confident are, are you about the historicity of David and why? So, um, yes, it is the only evidence for David outside the Bible. And it's important to point out here that it is not direct evidence for the existence of a person, David. It is the existence of a Davidic dynasty. So a house of David, a lineage of David. So, um, how confident am I in the historicity of David? Um, I, uh, yeah, I hate doing that. And I don't want I to, but I would say, um, you know, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly confident. I, I don't like that either. <laughs> so if you were to put a um, number that I can will, change, so like 80%, I, I, you know, 70, 70, okay. 65, 70, you know, is, is, feels like a nice safe number here. And, um, <laughs> And it's, and it's, it feels nice. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, so it's, it's, um, I, I've talked a little bit about this already. Um, the reasons why, uh, my confidence in, in the historicity of David, the reasons why I hold to the historicity of David are, um, because again, the apologetic lengths to which, uh, the Bible authors are going to 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 sanitize uh, the life and rule of David. Um, it's this this messy stuff uh, that appears in the succession narrative. It's these it's these uh, critiques that you can you can pick up uh, elsewhere uh, throughout, like like in uh, Genesis thirty eight that we just looked at, um, and maybe most importantly because you know if there was an historical David, like my God, what an interesting uh, person <laughs> this this must have been. And I'm just I'm I'm absolutely fascinated by the possibilities of what real life looked like under a King David. That it makes, makes me also wonder. It, you know what makes me really curious if there was a guy at the at the bottom of the barrel here, and that. This guy had some ugly stuff documented about him. How much more ugly stuff do we not know that actually happened? Oh, yeah. Like, like no question. Th this gets into kind of speculative land, but it makes you wonder, okay, if David was king and Saul somehow gets taken down and we say it's because God saw him as not fit, is there really something else that's going on? Did David do something to steal the throne? And what in what way did he do this? And like, not that oh God honored him and knew that he was a righteous man well, who was going to give him the throne or like I mean I will just I will just say this um, in you know and 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 building on the the theme one of the very very important things that David does to secure his own claim to Saul's throne is to marry Michal, the daughter of Saul. So I mean. You know, all this, I, I would say, I mean, forget about, forget about the Bible stuff. I mean, if there's, if there was a, if there was a, a historical David and if there was an historical Saul, the transition of power had everything to do with, uh, with the politics of the day and, and with the, the economics and with the, uh, with the public perception of each of these figures. So mm -hmm. it's there's nothing there's nothing miraculous or divine about this. It's 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 bloodthirsty Game of Thrones kind of shit. 
<laughs> Thank you for that. Constellation Pegasus, where was God at with all of drama he going was, on? God is got his uh got his uh his bucket of popcorn <laughs> and he was just sitting there very much like in fact i think i think um you know probably very if if you can picture if there was an actual yahweh and and he was an actual you know, actual guy and 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 uh you know was involved he probably he probably you know looked and sounded and ate popcorn very much like uh dr david a falk oh my gosh your trip <laughs> bradford baldwin thank you for the the 15 appreciate the super chat are there any precursors to old testament scriptures that describe spilling seed as bad or sinful ugaritic text other near eastern cultures somebody needs to get dr josh on the phone uh, I'm gonna do this, this on camera. I, uh, are you? Ask, I am about to call. I am going. And to call can we him. And, and just say, "Hey, Josh, it's Derek, Kip here. We got a question for you. Just, just, okay. just do it like that, right? He won't be able to hear you though. Fun. He won't be able to hear you. That's the only problem. No, no, but that's why. Just tell him I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Let's see what happens. This is he's, this is the phone a friend portion of uh, do, 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 You know who might know though? Um uh, Megan might huh. know. She might Megan, Megan might know. You, you could call her. I'm calling her now. Hey, you're Make live. Sure you you're live, and I'm on with Kip. And I oh, just have a question. You may not have the answer to. Love your hair, Megan. Okay. Uh, okay. Kip said he loves your hair. By the way. Oh, thank you, Kip. Absolutely. So, okay, the question goes like this: We were talking about this story in Genesis 38 about spilling seed, and Onan, you know, gets killed, and Judah is the one who sneaks in with his daughter, his daughter-in-law, which turns into, I guess, does he end up she marrying knows the her? Story. You don't have to. You know the story, anyway. Yeah. Um, someone asked: Are there any precursors to Old Testament scriptures that describe spilling seed as bad or sinful? Ugaritic text or other Near Eastern cultures? Is there anything like that that you're aware uh... of? I tried to call Josh, but I know he's probably at work. No, he's at work. Um, not that I know of, so I, I, I'm not the best person to ask for Ugaritic, but as far as I'm aware, no, and there's nothing Mesopotamian spring to mind. You have, like, the gods ejaculating and creating rivers and... They're going uh, all over the place, aren't they? gods and stuff, but nothing is, like, a negative. <laughs> so everything's a positive. Mm-hmm. Oh wow! It's I, all good. Interesting. Well, I guess uh, everybody keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you, Thanks, Megan. Megan. Oh, you're welcome. Kip said thank you. <laughs> All right, welcome. bye. Bye, guys. Bye. She's awesome. awesome. Well, uh, right. if, there if, you go, Bradford. If Marduk doesn't say it's a sin, then it's not a sin. <laughs> All right, thank you so much yeah. for that, Bradford. The, the, the gods got progressively more anal retentive as uh, and prudish as as time transpired. We yeah. to the point where we live in this sad, sad world today. Constellation Pegasus, thank you again, my friend, for the support. Last thought. This story seems equal as the Flat Earth and Dome cosmology. <laughs> this is simply outrageous to me. My head is racing at all of this. <laughs> I hope that's a good thing. I don't know. I mean, did I did I break did I break Constellation Pegasus? I don't know. I don't I think I so. Break you, man. No, I think this is this is Constellation's way of saying like yes bring more of this kind of stuff because we hear oh, good. you know you hear you would you ever hear this told like this ever at church i mean would any christian if you heard this told at church you probably you know maybe maybe churches should start doing this like you know get the i mean who who wouldn't want to go to church to hear about this i mean <laughs> I'd, be, but... I'd go <laughs> But wouldn't doesn't this bring an embarrassment on the seed of David idea? I mean, it, it, to me, it just seems it, like it could. You know right? what I mean? Like I said, yeah. there's there's a couple different ways you can go, um, and yeah, it certainly could. Um, but yeah, it's uh, 
especially Jesus, yeah. this tying this. Oh, we got to have our father be David. Hallelujah. Yeah. Like, ooh, you sure you want that? I don't know. But thank you, Constellation. I am. I'm with you. you. Uh, halfway through this, I was broken. I got super glue and <laughs> tape. I was putting myself back together again. <laughs> Just enough to keep up with uh, Kip here. Doc Pleromonat is back. What are your thoughts on the Neo documentary uh, hypothesis, particularly stylistic and terminological markers now replacing plot oh. and narrative continuity? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm a big fan of a lot of that stuff. Um, and that's when I'm it's it's had an impact on on the way I read text generally. Um, you know, when I'm when I'm looking uh, at, at ancient texts and and finding parallels, so many of them you uh you discover through uh through formulas uh formulaic language and uh, rhetorical devices and 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 these sorts of things and it's pretty it it's it's pretty cool it's pretty interesting um yeah i th i think it's great thank you doc really appreciate that uh let me see aram guard our last super chat here is Aram Guard, and he says, thoughts on the idea that the book of Samuel preserves historical truth about David because it contains so much negativity acts as an apologetic. Like I would say, I mean, we've talked, we've been talking quite a bit about this. Um, I would say that the so-called negative portrayal of David throughout the, uh, the book of Samuel, which is part of the, the Deuteronomistic history is, is not um it's not like the uh it, it's not like a, a a criterion of embarrassment sort of situation where oh it has to be true because look how terrible he looks in this i would actually say this is the result of of you know the rehabilitation like it was so bad that this was the best they could do um and i would say that again um, I think I think the the argument for historicity sort of plays into um, this idea that that it was just that hard uh, to make this guy uh, look any good. Yeah, this. So, I mean, um, so sorry. I want to, if I can, um, yeah, maybe finish if you have something to, to say about this, but there's something else I wanted to, that I've seen a few times in the chat here that I wanted to uh, uh, chime in on. Well, I, I just was going to simply say, uh, obviously Constellation Pegasus said uh, more verification of why I'm an atheist now. And then Merlin X, just the comment. Thank you for noticing this, this Derek. If David is not a great guy, why is his seed so blessed? You know, it, it, it kind of gets you thinking about this. Like, what the heck oh, yeah. why are we why are we tying it yeah. into this guy and if he was just invented um i could see why they would want to do the apologetics to have him be a descendant of david oh, if he yeah. really was the king of a people that goes far enough back they're kind of screwed and stuck with the person that they're stuck with so and now it's, they're it's a really it's a really annoying um the sanitized david is really kind of an annoying figure like you know, he's just he's just trying so hard to do what Yahweh wants. He's just he's trying so hard because he loves Yahweh so much. He's you know, he's he's just all about Yahweh. And and sometimes when he tries, it's oops, I I I made us I made a mistake. And uh but I love Yahweh so much. He'll forgive me. He'll take it back. <laughs> cause because Yahweh loves him so much. I, I mean I mean that's just that's just lame. I'm sorry, but that's that's lame. Like, you know, nobody deserves forgiveness for for the kinds of things that this guy does. And this does play into. So one thing I wanted to mention, I saw a couple of chats. I'm not sure if it was from yeah. the same guy, but some at least one person was really pushing back hard on uh, on my description of uh, David's encounter with um, with Bathsheba as rape. Um. And what I will say is that in the story, in reality, um, she has absolutely no agency. So what else are you going to call that? Um, she is a woman who is put into a position 
where she has to have sex with a man and cannot refuse because of who he is and be, because of because of who he is that's rape like i don't i i mean i don't i don't care um what other kind of conditions go into this whether she, if she feel pressured to do it that's still rape like how, how else are you going to describe this am i wrong about this it's like um you want to eat next week you want to eat okay then willingly sleep with me and i'll make sure you're fed oh you won't let me keep convincing you until you do okay you'll eat next week now thank you i mean like you're kind of no matter what there is a pressure here and i suspect if and you look at the story she's not like oh david i've been waiting i saw you in the corner of my eye you watched me from the balcony oh thank you for coming down here here slip it in no like it, and, uh, it's obviously I mean, something not... something else to say here too like so um a, a couple things uh no in the first place um people misconstrue what's happening because david sees her uh bathing on a rooftop people misconstrue this as her being being promiscuous or or somehow um you know uh doing something that she shouldn't be doing and that can't be further from the truth uh, within the culture, the expectation is that David should not be at home. Um, you know, the king's house is the only house from which you can look down and and see what's going on on the rooftops of other people's homes. The rooftop uh, in in an Israeli house is a place of privacy. It's a place of 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 modesty. This is not a place you expect people to be to be seeing you or looking at you. So. David is not supposed to be at home. Remember, there's a war going, going on. on. He's yeah. fighting a war with Ammon. He needs to be out fighting the war with Ammon, and he's not. So she has no expectation that he's going that anybody is going to see her there. Um, so uh there's that. Uh was there something else I was going to say there? Um, and the other thing too, there, when when you read the story and she comes to see him, like when it says he stands for her and she comes um, into his house, and the text makes a point of noting that she is she is modestly dressed uh, and and pr in her presentation before him. So this is like this is not the way that that you uh, will describe. A willing um, an affair like a, yeah a woman who and finally him. yeah and finally let's also remember that the text obviously doesn't say david raped bathsheba in those words and the reason it doesn't is because it is doing everything it can to rehabilitate this figure I'm taking I'm I'm treating this story and I'm treating these texts for this for this stream as if there's an historical kernel here. So and that historical kernel um, from everything I see within the text and, you know, also it, it's the 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 story of the rape of Tamar is is also part of this uh, criticism of David and his behavior with Bathsheba. And so in my treatment of of this story the historical kernel to me or a part of it is the fact that david raped bathsheba hmm. yeah there's i mean it keeps echoing this idea for sure i think it's funny how judah is just trucking along and it's totally okay hey, hold on you're a sex worker oh cool come on uh, uh you, like totally nonchalant of course in the ancient world i suspect that was well, typical and normal but... i mean this was this was, uh, here's another one um you know the uh the israelite the, remember the the story of the the israelite spies who um joshua dispatched to spy mm -hmm. on the city of jericho they went to go see the harbor the harlot, the harlot. rahab <laughs> Yeah. Do you think they were there to, um, you know, visit or to uh, maybe maybe to play games or <laughs> or maybe to learn some of the local Canaanite customs? Come on. They yeah. were going to visit a prostitute. 
Right. And you know, even though there's there's the the text, you know, in a roundabout way kind of kind of censures this sort of behavior, there's also this I think there's this expectation that this is going to happen. And it's you know, oh, this is what this is what men do, right? Wow. We got one more here and then I got to let you go. Jake 4D, thank right. you for the super chat. Is it possible it's the other way around instead of trying to make David a, a, a bad David look good, could it be trying to make a really good David look bad? Hmm. Like, you know, I find that, I, I find that, well, I would say no, because if the text was trying to make a really good David look bad, then um, his line would not have survived through Solomon. Uh, up to uh, Josiah, who's really the great hero of the um, of the documentary, or sorry, of the uh, Deuteronomistic history. So I would say, um, yeah, I just I just don't think so. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for all your support. Thanks, Here, guys. Yeah, just so everybody knows, go check us out on the Patreon. Help support us if you would. I would greatly appreciate the support. I work very hard to bring you early content, hundreds of videos. He also has a project he's working on. It is in the description and he has the YouTube channel. Go hit that bell and hit all after you subscribe. So you're notified every time Dr. Kill is bringing the blade. Any final words from you? Uh, no, uh, but maybe I should sort of, sort of, um, say something about uh so i've been i've been kind of absent from youtube for a while um and lots of that I, i've just gotten really really busy um so and i'm gonna be really busy unfortunately for i think at least until the fall um a couple of my commitments uh will carry me through uh till then and occupy almost all of my time um, I was happy to do this today and it was super fun, but I, I just, people, um, I'm sorry for, I mean, there's not going to be much content on my, or there's not going to be any content on new content on my, um, on my channel for some time. And I apologize for that, but, uh, yeah, things are, things are kind of out of my control right now. And I got some stuff that I got to, uh, I got to take care of, but I really, really hope that by the fall, I'll be uh, I'll be able to uh, start making videos again on a more a more um, uh, consistent basis. Well, we do have the debate coming up. You will be appearing. Oh for that. yeah, right. So that'll be we, good. Yes, there is a debate, and on I'm very Isaiah. I'm very excited for everyone to uh, get to meet uh, my debate partner and my very good friend uh, Matthew P. Monger. Uh, who has been a partner in crime of mine uh, for for a lot of years, um, uh, in particular when I was uh, working in Norway. So I'm super, super excited uh, to get him on and uh, to have people uh, get to meet him. I got to show everybody that. That uh, should be up in my lives. Oh, that's the past thing. live streams. Yeah, I want to show every oh upcoming ones. All right, so here we go. Let me share my screen so everybody could see. Okay, so on my page, when you go to my channel, um, you see these are lives tonight. There's going to be a live on on uh, a Mormon apologist. What what ended up happening for them to realize that it's not true? Um, but who wrote Isaiah? So Dr. Kip will be on with his friend, and Jonathan Sheffield will be on with. Some girl. I don't remember her name right now because I've been so busy doing everything on planet Earth. Um, but one is saying that Isaiah is written by a single author and Dr. Kill is saying no. No. Yes. Correct. <laughs> so, yeah, if you go there, this is the thumbnail. You can go ahead and like the video. You can comment down below. You can argue and debate with people for the next two weeks or 11 days. And should I, should I sell this? Like the, like the Ermin Lacona debate. This is going to yeah. be the Isaiah authorship debate to end all Isaiah authorship debates. <laughs> 
this is actually fun fact your first actual formal debate um but with friendly people so it'll be a fun one to see happen yeah it's good of it's good of everyone to make it make to to be nice to me so yeah i'm 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 really kind of terrified and and expected to go very poorly, but please show up. Yeah, please come watch. Uh, we'll whitewash it later and make sure that it oh, was yeah, better than it was. Sure. <laughs> everybody will be yeah. totally happy. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, right. thank you, everybody. Thank you, seriously, Kip. Your time. Hopefully, I can sp- harass you pleasure. enough for you to come on periodically just to show us you're alive, so and that Doctor Kill wasn't killed. That's that's my hope still killing stay tuned for the special uh, intro outro that i made for dr kip go support him go support us if you like what you heard today you want to learn more and see more keep myth vision alive those super chats the support on patreon you can one time at through different apps that are available out there if you want to help me out but other than that never forget we are our myth vision Wrong one. This is the right one. Back in Washington, Kip Davis is getting his first look at a final prized fragment in the Museum of the Bible's collection. This is a fragment that contains text from Genesis chapter 32, and it's supposedly from the first century BC or the first century CE. Dr. Kip Davis, I really appreciate you. I'm looking forward to the course coming out for our audience. Yeah, that's some exciting news. Um, I was a Christian, uh, really started to fall into the line of being able to defend my Christian faith and, of course, became a somewhat apologist online. And I was following many apologists, William Lane Craig, Ravi Zacharias, um, you know, the list goes on. What are some of the problems you find in general with apologetics? Maybe you feel like getting into specifics. It's up to you. But as a scholar who went through a rigorous course to get where you are, you mentioned in your own story this was a big problem. So tell us what you know or what you think. So uh, maybe I'll start by saying that. uh, So I was still a Christian when I entered uh, my Ph.D. program at the University of Manchester. And uh, the day that I got to Manchester. I'd registered. I went into uh, uh, Professor uh, George J. Brooks' office for my first uh, consultation. Uh, one of the things he asked me, right, at, or, or he, he said to me right at the outset, he said, so just to be clear here, he says to me, in this department, uh, we are not looking for Noah's Ark. We're not looking for the Ten Commandments. We're not looking to prove the resurrection of Jesus or 
the miracles of Elijah and Elisha, he said, this is a serious academic department. That's, that's exactly what he told me. Um, and I think it underscores um, part of the problems that, uh, or a big, a big problem that uh, uh, I'm sure most academics working within biblical studies, working within uh, the classics and in history have with apologetics. And the problem is that apologetics is always starting from the conclusion. Give a defense for the reason and the hope that you have within you. So you're already starting uh, with an answer. And then you're backing the truck up and loading it with whatever you can find to satisfy that answer. You know, the right questions and the right ideas which conform to the answer. And I hope everybody can appreciate how flawed this is because as soon as you take that approach to history or to an ancient text or literature or in, you know, anywhere in science or, or in, um, um, I, I guess in, well, I don't know. I don't know anything about law, but yeah, certainly in science, as soon as you start from that approach, you have already prejudiced yourself. And even unintentionally, you're going to overlook things that don't conform to the answer that you've already adopted. See, when I started my PhD program, for example, um, I started with a research question in my head. I wrote on it for a year, at which point I had to revise my research question and some of the direction of my study because I hadn't already formed an answer about it. I, I was on the search for, um, I, I hate to say the truth, I was on the search for a resolution to this question. Um, and it was in the course of, of writing my dissertation, it was a process of trial and error. And I, I actually, I think if memory serves me correctly, it took me over three years before I finally had that, that gestalt moment. Like I was looking at um, a, a set of manuscripts um, you know, trying to figure out what, what this text is, what it's saying, how are these manuscripts related to each other? And after three years of working on this stuff, like intensely, and then after reading an article, which had completely unraveled every, all the work that I had done up to that point, like I had this breakthrough moment where all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, Here's the solution. You know what? This is not something that I started out with in the beginning. I arrived there. And I don't think it's possible to do that within apologetics because the you can't defend you can't defend a question. Do you know what I mean? Like I just figure like adding to this, it's rem it reminds me of that Habermas discussion with Pine Creek when he said, can you give me a PhD who came into this studying this as a non-Christian ever, wasn't raised Christian, had no background as a Christian, who then by the evidence studied it and came to the conclusion, oh my gosh, the overwhelming evidence has led me as your language to the conclusion that Jesus is Lord and he actually rose from the dead, et cetera, et cetera. That you, it's usually, I was raised this way. I got with a woman who is a Christian yeah. or whatever it might be. There's always some other influence and it's not the rigorous work you're yeah, talking about. Exactly. I, I think, I, I think there's probably a qualification there. I think it happens in the sciences um, for, I'm, you know, for example, I don't know much about his back road. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure that like Francis Collins, um, came to believe 
in Jesus um, as like a like like a, a PhD scientist after his his you know scientific exploration. But that's sort of besides the point. I think it's more powerful that when it comes to actually studying the history of the religion, the text the 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 texts that inform almost entirely uh, the Christian faith or Judaism, you'll not find anyone who started out, you know, as an unbeliever, went through this rigorous process of answering questions about the text and the history and coming out the other side going, oh, yeah, well, maybe, maybe the New Testament has this right. You know, that that is something that doesn't happen. And I'll say, so, and you know, this was uh, some of these problems, you know, starting with the question and, and having an inability to um, follow the evidence as a result of that. So starting with the conclusion and having having the inability to follow the evidence as a result of that, because you're you're even subconsciously um, uh, selecting data from your uh, from your sample set. Um, this showed up, you know, in in a very real way when I was teaching in a uh, in an evangelical uh, Christian university. I, you know, one of my jobs when I was still a PhD student and, you know, working at this school was uh, as an assistant to an apologist who who taught courses there. And he caused all sorts of problems for our department, like the department that I was in, um, the biblical studies department, because students would go into his classes and learn the right answers to uh, to address their pre-existing faith commitments, but which were completely fallacious and besides the point of what was being taught in their biblical studies classes. And, you know, professors in the biblical studies department started to complain that, look, I'm giving, you know, I'm giving these assignments or I'm, I'm giving this exam and students are supposed to be listening to, you know, what's taking place in my course on Isaiah or, you know, the formation of the Pentateuch or, or whatever it is. And they're regurgitating these answers that have nothing to do with what I've been teaching them. Where is this stuff coming from? And here, you know, it, it comes from having their um, um, ha having their convictions confirmed um, through a clever set of principles. And it's it's not it's not a responsible way to do any any sort of serious academic work. Brief comment, Josh McDowell, you did a video on him, Lee Strobel, some Christian's going to come across this, who's probably not even going to wait till we get to this point in the video. And this happens so often on Myth Vision. We just, for some reason, the cognitive dissonance can't allow them to even watch the video. But let's just say they get this far and they're like, all right, well, Lee Strobel was a skeptic and went and challenged and found the truth. Or Josh McDowell was a skeptic and went and found the truth. Tell us what you know about them. Uh, first of all, I think um, any budding apologist listening, uh, listen carefully to me. Uh, I think the 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 greatest skill that anybody needs to be an apologist in the first place is not, you know, a, a first rate education and lots of knowledge about the Bible or even philosophy. The best um, qualification for any apologist is unbridled confidence. And that's what guys like McDowell, like Strobel have in spades. So yes, they present themselves as people who, um, came out of this, this, um, this, this upbringing is hardened, uh, atheists who, who, uh, you know, were highly skeptical of, of every Christian claim. So I did, I did a whole 
documentary about uh, Josh McDowell in which I went into exploring how he has told his own story, his own story over time. And I discovered in the course of doing that, that a big part of his whole presentation is uh, his own story. And as a result, it's really actually evolved over time. When you look into it, um, his actual upbringing and his actual conversion experience is something that, that looks not completely different, but certainly different from the way he talks about it now. And he's embellished it uh, pretty significantly in a number of places because he knows it sells. It sounds much more dramatic. It's, it's much more convincing if he can gin it up a little bit. And because he's got so much confidence, he's able to, to, to tell this story with a straight face. So, um, you know, he was, he was a teenager barely an adult when he became uh, a believer. And if you read carefully in uh, how he writes about it, or even in how he, uh, he presents it when, when he gives it in, uh, in talks and things, it's a very emotional story for him. But so I think for, for most people, um, I think that's where um, becoming a Christian uh, is, uh, is the most, uh, meaningful and that's the 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 strongest rationale that anybody has for for converting it's out of that uh that 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 emotional state in the first place so as for lee strobel he uh he presents himself as as a former hardened skeptical investigative reporter for the uh, chicago sun tribune um you know he 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 he, he, he won an award once for for an expose he did on the uh, the building of, I believe it was the Ford Pinto uh, safety. Um, um, the company was cutting corners, and 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 he he was part of exposing that, right? So he he really depends on this to paint this picture of himself as this, you know, just reporter doggedly searching for answers and also highly skeptical you know he 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 started out this way and it would take just uh just just a a miracle to convince him otherwise um and the way he tells his story is such that his his wife became a, a believer and he became resentful of the fact that she became a believer so she i think she challenged him or he got challenged by some other people he knew to investigate from uh, a critical perspective and historical perspective the claims of Jesus. While this all became a best-selling book, The Case for Christ, the, the book itself is, is incredibly disappointing and, and, and laughably weak in terms of, of an historical investigation. And the reason for that is because virtually every expert that is interviewed in the book is a believing, confessing Christian, most of them Christian apologists already. If he was really interested in, in discovering the truth of the of of the the Christian claims, then surely as a as a responsible reporter, he would have consulted both sides. I don't know. Um, so, but if you dig into his his actual history a little bit more, you do notice a couple of things, um, which I think are are uh, convenient. Uh, so he he started um, he he published his first book already uh, after he had been working as a pastor at Willow Creek Church, the giant. Willow Creek Church in the uh, Chicago suburbs. Um, he had already been there pastoring for, I think, five or six years. And he didn't even, he didn't get around to publishing Case for Christ until he had been in the church for like at least a decade working in the church. He's a pastor. So I think that um, given the timeline from the point of his conversion to the point that he actually got it down on paper, given the content in the book itself, we have every reason to be suspicious 
and skeptical about the legitimacy of his own conversion story. Holy moly, you do not. I'm telling you guys, you don't want to miss this one. We talk about the documentary hypothesis. We get lost into the Dead Sea Scrolls. We talk about failed prophecies and how the Old Testament is reusing stuff from older places. And here we have the New Testament just redoing the same thing. Christian apologists are known for a lot of these defenses that aren't necessary, so to speak. And so Dr. Kip Davies destroys the notion that is being regurgitated over and over by the Christian apologist. It's time to take scholarship seriously. <laughs> we are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. Today, we have Kip Davis. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, so uh, I wanted to say, yeah. yeah, I wanted to say, and you can edit this out afterwards if you want, but your your <laughs> cool little little animation there with, um, with Leviton from the Old Testament, uh, I th think he would kick your ass. Look, man, I'm sorry, but I've I've beat him. Okay, you see it. It's how can you deny you witness it on screen? You know, dude. Anyway, I guess that's uh, better evidence than for Yahweh, eh? <laughs> right. Um, you dealt with a situation where I want everybody to go right now. Uh, please go down in the description. I ask you guys to join this guy's uh, YouTube channel. Go subscribe to Kip's channel. He has dealt with the documentary hypothesis. He's a PhD student. Uh, can you tell us where your PhD uh, PhD student at? I'm not a student. I'm I'm uh, I graduated in 2009. Oh, so, you did. and you're I and you're in. Oh yeah, yeah. I oh, uh, so you're I Dr. Davis. Sorry. I'm Dr. Davis. Yes. No, that's fine. Um. So I did my I did my uh, my PhD studies at the University of Manchester. So, well, thank which you is so not much. as impressive as as Yale or or Harvard, but okay, <laughs> it's okay. You could still beat Leviathan. I'm not worried about it. Um, <laughs> so let's let's talk about Christian apologist. Uh, I was a minor version of Christian uh, of a Christian apologist. I was working under a guy named Thomas McCuddy at a small little you know school here in North Carolina, and Thomas McCuddy was kind of a disciple of people in the vein of Ravi Zacharias and guys like that. Oh, I'm not yeah. saying that they owned any massage parlors. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, they, they worked in the same vein. I know that was a bad, that was, that was definitely I a shouldn't laugh. I really shouldn't. You shouldn't. I know no. it's, no. it's silly. Um, but no, but seriously, uh, these apologists seem to be performing confirmation bias on everything that they have to, of course, defend what's sacred to them. And that is the Bible. And so the documentary hypothesis, especially the renewed versions, seem to better make sense of the sources that are in the Old Testament, development of the Pentateuch and whatnot. And so I found your channel. I was recommended to it by Camille Greger. And then, of course, uh, my friend Stephen Nelson. And they both like love paying attention to the McPologist, the McGrew, uh, McClatchy, these are Christian apologists. And then, of course, we see Michael Jones from uh, Inspiring Philosophy. They're always putting out something to try to get the skeptics to look like they're just fabricating evidence. They don't know what they're talking about. And you dealt with the documentary hypothesis. So I said, please, Dr. Davies, come on. Let's, let's, let's deal with this. I didn't say Dr. Davies because I didn't know you were a doctor, but notice how I anachronistically <laughs> did that. That was an anachronism. Anyway, um, what do we have? What's the problem that That's we cool. have going on? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, what is the problem uh, that, that is happening right now with Christian apologists and the Pentateuch, the well, documentary hypothesis? Okay, so, I mean, there's, there's, lots, to, there's lots to unpack here. <clears throat> so I'm just going to go. Um, and I think, like, for me, 
personally, it's it's in the uh, the construction of the Pentateuch in the documentary hypothesis that I really um, started that really started to push my own personal beliefs as a Christian in another direction entirely. And I think um, for for apologists and for evangelicals, it's it's a very strong direct challenge to the doctrine of inerrancy. And I that's that's why um, it, it's something that, that they feel they the need to defend against, to attempt to counter explain. Um, problematically for them though, the evidence that I hoped I I showed that uh, in particular in my last video, the evidence is just so strong. And um, I mean, e even in that video, I was I was like frantically trying to cut it down and still ended up with like an hour of material. And I was just like feeling like I'm just <laughs> barely scraping the surface here of everything that I could say um, about why scholars find it so compelling. And I think something something that um, that tends to get lost too, you can totally, you can totally see even just reading like your English translation of the Bible, you can see um, the sources at work there. I mean, I, I assume you've gone through this and you've seen it, right? Um, but what I find is that it's not as easy to see it as it is when you're looking at the, the Hebrew text too. Um, because English translators will make choices with regards to how they, they render certain words or certain phrases, um, and they're not always consistent in doing so. And so one of the things I wanted to do in particular in that last video was try and show that like from a, from a perspective of the Hebrew text in particular, how there's things that you don't see in the English that show me or show another, uh, another uh, Hebrew reader that, yeah, I mean, there's, there's really a dramatic difference between what's happening in this source uh, P, the priestly source, and in this source, J, the, the Yahweh source. Um, when I teach Old Testament and when I, when, when any class in, uh, in the Old Testament, something that I, I, I'm very deliberate in doing uh, is in ensuring that um, the names for God, Yahweh, Elohim, El Shaddai, uh, are not translated into into their English counterparts. It's very important to retain those when teaching the text, when reading the text, because as you know, um, because of the, uh, uh, the rabbinic sensitivities to the name of God, it, 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 it sort of uh, was inherited by the, by the, the first English translators and, and the reformers who made the choice when translating the Tetragrammaton Yahweh, decided to render that into English as the Lord in all caps. So all of our English Bibles, wherever it says Yahweh in the text, it says the Lord. And growing up in the church, growing up in evangelical, I mean, this is this is the sort of thing that I just never I just never paid any attention to, and I never noticed. And you know, it, it just looked like a different way of referring to the same God when it's just not. These are, these are, I, well, I guess, I mean, yes, it's, it's a different way of referring to the same God in Hebrew in a sense, but the whole rationale behind that is just completely lost in, uh, in our English translations of, of the text. Huh. So, and there is actually like, there's, there's, there's passages in the Hebrew Bible where, um, people will refer to God as Lord Adonai. So it's 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 one of those things 
Um, I decided this early on, you know, when I'm teaching classes, I'm just, I'm, I am going to insist on this when my students write papers, I'm going to insist on this. Identify uh, God properly as the text identifies him. So either as Yahweh or as El or as Elohim. And I find that that's one of those things where it's, it's sort of like a first step in helping you to see uh, the differences in the sources. But it's one of those things that's just also really easily glossed over. So real quick in the vein of this, um, yeah. uh, the documentary hypothesis is one. I got one question on that. And then, of course, the names of God seem to be the older way of explaining the different sources. And it's not the only way, even though that may play a role to some degree on are we looking at Priestley? Are we looking at a Deuteronomic? Are we looking at what are we looking at? Um, that seems to be the vein in which the older versions, I think, of the documentary hypothesis were going. But my first question, and then, of course, we can lead to this second idea, is, is the documentary hypothesis the main um, hypothesis of explaining the source material across the board consensus from all experts on the Old Testament? Like, if you were to say, this is the theory, or if you will, hypothesis, that everyone, without a shadow of a doubt, agrees with, they just argue over the minutia detail of what is what, is the documentary hypothesis it? Absolutely. And it's something that everybody, like when you're going through your, um, when you're going through your studies to, and training in, uh, in religious studies or biblical, it's something that everybody has to deal with. Everybody learns it. Everybody uh, learns the evidence for it. And in my experience, and I should say, like, this isn't my, this isn't my area of specialization. I just, I really like Pentateuchal narrative and right. uh, lots of apologetic stuff gets, gets, uh, yeah. uh, is, is centered around the documentary hypothesis. So this is something that, that, that interests me. But in my experience and going to conferences and in speaking with academics and reading books and articles, it's, it, it's, it's absolutely entrenched. Like it is, it is a part of, uh, current scholarship and it has been for a very long time and like you said um there's lots of dispute about the minutia right um in in the european schools which is where i was um there's lots of uh th there's there's been a movement for for a while to resurrect something similar to uh what we called the the supplementary or sorry the the fragmentary hypothesis or the supplementary hypotheses but all of this stuff still and this is what i think is the important point um all of these theories and all of the 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 theories that sort of circulate the formation of the pentateuch there's not one that says the pen like like all the books of the pentateuch were written by the same author or even each individual book, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, right. was written by. So um, I think the important point is that the overwhelming scholarly consensus is that there are sources in the Pentateuch mm -hmm. and that many of the sources are readily identifiable. And it absolutely destroys any notion that this is something that could have been written by Moses. Um, and I think moreover, it, it rather destroys the notion that, uh, that there was some sort of established text uh, prior to the Babylonian exile. Interesting. You know, I like this. This destroys in that inerrant infallibility as well. I mean, obviously this is going to show how can you rectify yeah. contradictory sources and make them try to be one coherent, cohesive narrative? Um, and, you know, Dr. Price, I interview him all the time. He said, no, I'm glad it's not inerrant, infallible. And we have this because this picture, you know, people want to answer or ask the question, why? You know, why would they put two of these things together that are contradictory? And one speculative explanation is, well, look, they 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 saw multiple traditions as sacred, so they kept multiple traditions. It's it wasn't an issue for the redactor 
to put this stuff together like we think today. Oh, no, it must make absolute logical sense. The Ishmaelites and the Midianites could both sell Joseph. And, like, you know, like they didn't think yeah. that way. And so maybe that that thinking – uh, we aren't thinking like they thought, and it's important to try and understand why the redactors would do this, what's going on. Oh, totally. Uh, what, what are these apologists doing? I've heard Dr. Michael Heiser, I've interviewed him on my channel before on his book, Demons, and as a skeptic, of course, I don't think he even knew that I was a skeptic when I interviewed him. I just had a really cool, amazing dialogue and talked to him about like the biblical Nephilim and the giants and how... Yes, these are not humans. They are portrayed as these big uh, angelic, if you will, or gods, mini Elohim, these little little gods. And we had this great dialogue, but I found a YouTube video where he rejects the documentary hypothesis. And I thought, how can a Hebrew scholar like him and someone who is entrenched in the scholarship or supposed to be literally go on air on YouTube and say, I, I, I totally disagree with this without trying to hold on to inerrancy it's weird so can yeah you address i the you know, i i saw that in uh, and that was news to me too that was a surprise um, when i saw that in your in your video about uh heiser um and i i think what it what it comes down to like um when you read when you read some i've got a this is a yeah this is a this is a fairly popular um uh textbook used by used in very very conservative schools right. for teaching the old testament right and what they tend to do is they spend they spend a lot of time developing counter arguments to the documentary hypothesis which center on the uh the the literary construction or the the literary artistry or the uh, uh, lit, uh, literary features of the text, which would suggest that uh, that it's a, a, a unified document. And in my experience, most of this comes from the fact that somebody did uh, at some point in time put these things together and had to make a bunch of decisions about uh about what to include and what to i mean because they couldn't they couldn't include everything you brought up the uh the the joseph story as a great example where you can see the the, the two different sources at work and, and not in just the selling of um uh, whether, whether it was the ishmaelites who sold to to whom uh joseph was sold or the midianites you'll notice in one story uh the j um Joseph's father is consistently called Jacob. In the other story, he's consistently called Israel. You know, one story is about Joseph who has these fantastic dreams of grandeur. The other story is about Joseph who has this, this uh, uh, technicolored uh, garment that his, uh, his father gifted to him. So uh, both stories are about the jealousy of his brothers, but when you smash them together, it just it becomes like, like super jealous. <laughs> it's it's so like there's all these all these extra things. There's all this this other stuff within just this one story, um, which shows that yeah, there's there's two different sources that will work here, but like whoever put them together had to make some decisions about how to weave them together otherwise it would have just been like a like a completely uh credulous uh impossible story to tell right, right. um it's it's like i like um i like looking at when i'm looking at uh and trying to to divide the sources a good way to 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 do this or or, or a profitable area of the text to see this is in genealogies um, because they tend to be highly formulaic and as a result, you can, you can really see very clearly like the different formulas that, the different authors are using, uh, to construct their genealogies. But, um, when, when there's a combined genealogy, like in Genesis chapter 10 and which is, you know, a, a, a genealogy, it's like two versions of the same genealogy. The editor couldn't 
just repeat everything. He had to kind of pick and choose. So he's like, okay, I'm going to pick uh, bits from this one and then bits from this one and kind of structure them together so that it still makes some coherent sense. But, you know, a careful reader uh, is going to be able to see, well, there's one voice here and there's another voice here and they take turns speaking. But, and there's, and there's kind of like these linchpin passages that you'll find in there too, where you can see the editor is um, maybe struggling a little bit with how to, how to sort of stitch those seams together. Right. Um, Oh, but it's it's in these it's in the, the places I find where the redactor does some of his work. These tend to be the places where evangelicals and apologists will point to and go, oh look, you know the text is is beautiful. It's it's there's this uh, this literary coherence, and you can't achieve that if you if you you know pull the pull the text apart. This is something in the video that I responded to of Michael Jones. Um, I'm going to be in the next one. I'm going to be just going through his argument for internal consistency and and showing uh, all the problems with it. But what he does fairly consistent. One of the things he does fairly consistently is points to these places in the text where there's like this narrative continuity and this and this artist. Um, he does, he pulls up and he does all this stuff very quickly. I mean, you've, you've seen a bunch of his, his stuff and something that he does is he'll just, he'll like, it's like, bah, 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 bah. he'll throw up all these, these arguments. Right. But they're so fast and he'll just kind of, kind of throw them out there. Like he spends, I think it's like 10 or 15 seconds in his video where he shows an image of a, of a, 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 a chiastic uh, structure that, that um, a, a, a scholar um, thinks he sees in the entire flood story from Genesis 6 all the way through to Genesis 9. And he just kind of throws this up on the screen. He's like, here's a great big chiasm that, you know, you can't, you, you know, this is impossible if, if you, you pull the text apart. Um, so he depends on these sorts of, these sorts of arguments, but when you get right down to it and you actually sit and, and go through the, uh, the, the chiasm that he's, he's put up there. For those of you who don't know, um, a chiasm is a poetic device where a, um, a writer will, um, build in, in, uh, in opposite pairs and of, of statements or themes, lots of times based on the usage of individual words. Um, and they'll, they'll go in a, a pattern where they start, um, you know, statement A, then B, then C, and then C a. again, then okay, B, yeah, yeah, yeah. then A. So it's like a reversal, right? Um, and these are real. Kind of chiastic. I mean, you've got day one matches day five in some respects, day two and day or day one, day four, day two, day five, day three, day six. And if you look, one is yeah. uh, you know, the land, uh, and then you got land animals. So you got one is the sky, and then exactly. you got birds, and then one is the sea. And you, yeah, so a true chiasm would have been reversed, though, right? Where day one, uh, it would have been like, uh, like, like, um, Day one would have been sky, but then day six would have been sky, right? Where right. it goes. So, so these are real, um, and you see them like there's there's some some neat ones in the Psalms. Usually, the ones that that I find convincing are pretty small, like restricted to uh, a few verses. Um, I've seen scholarly arguments attempting to do this for like huge chunks of text, like the uh the flood story right so the one that jones puts up on the screen it's like it's like 22 opposite pairs of of thematic statements and some of them when you actually sit down and you look at the text it's like one of them is just arc right is you what? know is, okay. is like 
arc. It's like the oh. it's it's the arc. But how many times is is the arc actually mentioned throughout the entire text? Right. You can pick and choose these things. There's ones like, like there's whole verses or s- collections of verses that just don't appear in the chiasm. They've been omitted entirely. Um, many of them are just just really really strained. And these are the sorts of things that that readers will oftentimes impose on a text. We see things that that we think are there that the author never even intended to be there. I was reading an article about this recently and and someone uh, suggested that that uh, these are maybe even just a natural way of writing where it, it's, it's a way that our brain functions when when we're writing that we're not even conscious of or reading that we're not even conscious of. So it's one of those arguments where um, it looks powerful and it looks convincing when you throw it up on the screen like that for 15 seconds. But when you unpack it, when you go through it, uh, it, it falls apart very quickly. So the other thing that he tended to do in his, his video of showing um, internal coherence, you'll notice that I, I think it was like if he had, if he had like 15 uh, individual points, I think like 10 of them were restricted Genesis three and four. Now Genesis three and four were part of the uh, ongoing narrative that was being constructed by the Yahwist. It's the same author. Of course there's coherence and unity there, but I think it, it demonstrates that either and and i know that this was a surprise to me too when i was watching your channel you 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 said that you saw somewhere that the that jones made a statement about not even knowing what the documentary hypothesis was i think it one was, um there was a guy and i don't want to say jones but it doesn't sound like he really knows what it is either because if he did i don't know if he would be so then again i mean it's like no one is something that you don't want to believe in. So really you're not actually investigating with, is there validity to this for real, not confirmation bias approach, but uh, capturing Christianity, the Cameron. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bertuzzi. He interviewed yeah. an Egyptologist, David Falk, who takes in more of a oh, maximalist okay, yeah. view on Egypt, right. the, the Exodus. And he said, what is the documentary hypothesis? And David Falk, <laughs> who's not even a, Really, he's not even like a biblical Hebrew scholar. He's an Egyptologist. Yeah. I had to explain to him why he rejects it, but he says, look, I'm not a, I don't have to accept it because I'm not a Hebrew scholar is what he said. I'm an Egyptologist. Right. But really, he's also a Christian. So he's right. like, eh, let me avoid that documentary hypothesis thing. It sounds like this is the death blow to Christian harmonization that no one, or not just Christian, I mean, I'm sure Orthodox Jews uh, that practice this kind of harmonious, uh, you know, look at the um, rabbis, how they have been affected. Joel Baden wrote this in his book, and Professor Joel Baden was saying, look, the rabbis have been trying to figure out this problem for a while and still keep the text to, you know, it's so. In very, very creative ways. Yeah, so the Ishmaelites the, the um, are in, in Kings. They look like these. The, they they look like the Midianites. So technically, they're the Midianites too, or like weird stuff. That's like really. Oh, totally. So, but what you know, it's it's um. What I was going to say was that those sorts of like, if you don't know anything about the documentary hypothesis, and somebody show somebody shows you that, oh, look at this total continuity that it, that exists there in Genesis 3 and 4, that might sound convincing to someone who doesn't know anything about it. And typically what happens is uh, when evangelicals, and, and when I was first presented the document or hypothesis, I remember this is how it was presented to me and this was kind of my reaction to it. It's presented as uh, such uh, an incredulous thing. It's 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 you know it, it's presented as absurd in the first place. When Jones briefly talks about it in his video, he does so in the most hackneyed uh, way possible to sort of construct this this 
ridiculous straw man like well you've got these wherever it says Yahweh that's a Yahweh passage and wherever it says Elohim that's a that's an Elohim passage and then you have priestly stuff and then you have Deuteronomy and bang that's the documentary hypothesis oh that's not it that is the most simplistic ridiculous description of the documentary hypothesis that you could possibly make so when people come to the text with this like this is what the theory is and they see something that says, wow, look at the literary artistry between Genesis 3 and 4. Well, surely that must that must totally uh, debunk it. So, it, it, yeah. And, it, and it's yeah, something. The same author or whoever this source is is the same thing. So that doesn't – yeah, that, that's ridiculous. No. I, I get what you're saying. And there, are, there are large sections too throughout the Pentateuch where um, the same author like I think I think Jay uh, is uninterrupted from uh, Jay runs uninterrupted from Genesis 2 through Genesis 4 then there's there's a genealogy interruption there in Genesis 5 and then the flood stuff where it's mixed but then all the way through to like Genesis 12 so there's lots of fertile ground there to yeah. show continuity and and unity and artistry right i think it's interesting um, too with genesis 12 and and you can tell me genesis 12 and i believe it's genesis 16 you have the same narrative being rehashed about you're going to be a father of many nations and the blessing yeah. it's like why are you saying this again like didn't we hear this in the last before the commercial break in the last you know like the, it repeats itself is that two different sources I think so. Um, right. And I know Joel, like when, when Joel Batum put his book together, like he did a really good job of what, what I really liked was he said, the only thing I'm going to count as doublets in my discussion of doublets are things that are totally irreconcilable. Um, of course, that's not, you know, that doesn't cover all the doublets, but what he was doing was showing, look, there's just no possible, Possible way that you can you can reconcile these. There's there's a there's there's a, a, a disruption in the narrative where uh, opposite things happen that can't possibly happen. Like the right. the the naming of uh, Beersheba is one of these, right? right. But the uh, so yeah, like the Genesis Genesis twelve covenant with Abraham and the Genesis seventeen covenant with Abraham. Um are i think pretty clearly the same event uh told by these different sources j and e um but then the redactor uh whoever put them together uh had to and was trying to 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 build a consistent narrative had to introduce this idea that well this is more of a covenant renewal so it includes the name change right you're no longer called abram you're called abraham for <laughs> this reason so you know we can we can write that off and we can and and then the other thing that that the the redactor did was was cleverly very carefully put the stories together in such an order that all those places where abraham was called abraham are you know pushed to the back after this important point in the in the story where the name change happens so lots of the lots of the doublets you'll find you know either before genesis you'll you'll find before genesis 17 and after genesis 17 um within genesis at least for this for this reason mm -hmm. um and lots of these are ones that that Baden didn't include in his in his his book for this reason, because somebody came along and was able to reconcile uh, them to say, yeah, this is just you know it just it happened twice and yeah, it different enough. Happen. Sorry. Yeah. No, I said you know they're different enough that you go, oh wow sure. Uh, and the one that I like you can catch that and well not just you but like other scholars that they're, they're careful they're going to consider that and go hmm 
I, I find that interesting that yes, the redactor is trying to mend some stuff. He's not like just trying to throw hodgepodge. Oh, I'll just slap it again. He is trying oh. to, and I say he, because we know no female was redacting these things. Um, no. the, yeah. They're combining this stuff to some degree to try and rec reconcile the different sources. At the same time, it's like, there's some stuff that you can't quite fix. I mean, look at uh, Genesis 38. I think it's so funny. This story about Judah comes out of nowhere and he sleeps oh, with I his know. daughter in law. It's like, what is this do this now to a commercial break? Now, here's why you want to wear a condom. I mean, like, it's like, what the <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, that's an interesting story. That one. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here. What I've taught this, uh, what I've, what I've taught intro to the old Testament, I've actually, I've actually pointed to that story, um, as part of a discussion about Royal propaganda. I don't know if you're familiar with this. I'm not, Are you? I, no. Okay. So, um, take a look at the story of the, of, uh, of Tamar, uh, and Judah in, uh, in Genesis 38. And then take a look at um, at the the Davidic cycle, what's called the uh, what what are commonly called uh, um, like the ascension narratives. In I think it's Second Samuel, um, and it's the story essentially of of David's sons. You know, first there's uh, uh, there's Absalom. Who, uh, who 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 tries to uh, tries to, to take the throne and then there's um, um, oh is it Adam Adonijah who rapes his sister the yeah. sister's name who's Tamar hmm. um, it uh, but I, I don't I don't have it before me but I I've, I've done this before where and I've, I read a paper about this a number of years ago where somebody made a pretty compelling case that this story from Genesis 38 it was like a, was like a it, it was like a critique of the royal family because of all this nonsense that was taking place with uh, with David's sons, you know. And there's a there's a there's a clear correlation between the names. You've got the same victim, you know. Tamar appears in each one. Um, Judah goes up with his friend, um, who's called. I, I believe he's called Hiram, um, and uh, the the uh, the strongest alliance that David and then Solomon had was with uh, the Tyrians, whose king was Hiram, and um, the uh, the the name of the uh, the first of Judah's sons, who. Um, who failed to um, take up his, his duties and, and impregnate um, uh, Tamar. His name is Shalah. And in Hebrew, that looks a lot like uh, Solomon, Shalom. Mm. So, you know, there's, there's a name correspondence that runs throughout the story. And it's a neat way of saying, you know, Maybe this is a story that was told kind of tongue in cheek about what was going on in the palace and, you know, it was passed down over generations. And then whoever was putting this stuff together needed, well, what do I do with this? I don't you know, just throw it in here because <laughs> it seems to, it seems to fit temporally. I don't know. So yeah, maybe they didn't want to get rid of it. Maybe they wanted to keep it and they, they don't want to get up, rid of anything. Right. And this is an interesting note. I want to make a jab at some people that I know real quick. These aren't the fundamentalist uh, Christians that are trying to harmonize the Bible uh, continuously without, with the rejection of the documentary hypothesis. But there is a group of people I will leave unnamed. Um, ultimately they think that Genesis prior to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai is really a secret code the whole thing is a secret code for later Israel's history after the exile. Now, it's clever because, sure, there's anachronisms. Sure, like even in this narrative, let's suppose what you just said is actually the case. 
then there maybe is an, an anachronism uh, narrative that's taking place in the Genesis story. We know that, for example, with the Tower of Babel. If this is a ziggurat, yeah. which it may be, we have Babylon on the scene. Okay, so we're probably in the Babylonian exile when this Genesis narrative is at least taking place, if, at least then or after that. And I say that to say they propose the whole thing is just like really a secret code for later Israel's history. Whereas I said, isn't it more plausible that it is narrative? It's playing a narrative of origins, you know, the creation, pre antediluvian stuff. Like it's really telling you a story, not suggesting it's historical, but that it's telling you a story, probably borrowing from other literary motifs, the Mesopotamian flood myths, who knows, uh, to create and concoct a narrative, a pre diluvian narrative all the way down to how God chose them among all the nations of the earth. And these guys won't allow Genesis to be cosmological. They don't because they have these other presuppositions. They think that um, sure. no non-Israelite could ever play a role in the narrative. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. They literally go so far as to suggest that the Gentiles in the new Testament are Israelites. They cannot allow an outsider right. or a non-Israelite to be part of the narrative. They're part of what's called two house theology. So anyway, uh, that's a new one. I was, yeah, I didn't, I was unaware of these guys. Yeah. So, they're, they're, they avoid the academia, it seems. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, but that's, yeah, that's, and that, yeah, it's, uh, for a lot, I mean, the Bible, the Bible kind of invites this sort of stuff too, right? Like this is, and we're conditioned to read it in, in, in a way, sorry, you can probably hear my dog barking like it's crazy okay. in the background. Yeah, no, you're so good. My wife's a, cheer for the dog. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my wife's a dog trainer, so we usually have like four or five here in the house. <laughs> but That's fine. No, yeah. no problem. So it's, it's, fine. I don't know that, but I do have a skill you might like. And, and now my Alexa is also joining the conversation. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Let me let me mute Alexa. There we go. For in order to in order to deal with it, and this is I mean this is something that I'm just I'm tired of bad apologetics. Right. It's really it's been something that for for a long time I have been just really really frustrated by. Um, I taught at a I taught at a Christian university for a number of years. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I had, um, uh, I, I had like a, like a, a position as a, as a teaching assistant working with an apologist, um, teaching, a, teaching course, teaching courses in worldview. And he had like a special seminar set up for like the best and the brightest of his students. And this is something that I found myself dealing with on a regular basis. This is a, this is a PhD theologian um, working at a university who is teaching uh, undergraduate students all the way up to, uh, to, to their fourth year, really bad apologetics that don't look much different than what you see on YouTube. Right. Um, you know, and, and there were a few points where, I mean, it just, it, it drove me so crazy. I felt like I've got to say something. I've got to, uh, I've got to challenge him in on, on, on this point. I remember, uh, in one session, he suggested that, <clears throat> um, that, uh, Hellenistic philosophy is something that developed, after uh or 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 you know developed completely outside of the biblical world and it's something we should totally reject and it's been imposed after the fact on the biblical text and i'm going that's just that is just patently false i mean you could see hellenistic influences in the bible and he says well there's some of it in the new testament i'm like no <laughs> like you could see it in the book of Daniel, you can see it in in aspects of the book of Proverbs. You can see it in in Ecclesiastes. I'm like, it's all over the place in there. And uh, in, in another class, I, for for a paper in a in in a, a senior seminar, he wanted 
he wanted his students to read uh, a, a paper by Stephen Meyer from the Discovery Institute about intelligent design. And I'm like, why are you, why are you propagating this nonsense when in the building next to us, the biology department is teaching evolution? Like, it just, so that's my little rant about how frustrated I have been for a very long time with bad apologetics. And my message to apologists is this, your arguments don't work. And if you want to continue in this vein, you need to come up with some better, more convincing arguments that deal with real questions that people have about Christianity and from from my perspective, about the biblical text. Because something that bad apologetics doesn't just um, ignore the issues with the biblical text. One of the things that it does, I think, is really robs it of what's awesome about so much of the biblical text. There's so much stuff in there that is so cool. And you're going to miss it if you're so focused on trying to keep this house of cards together um, in, a, in an effort to, to propagate this, this, this false idea of the unity of the text. So just stop, just stop it. Well said. I think that when we approach this as some magical book, you're right. We're going to miss the human side. I think there's a lot more wonder and beauty in the human side of the Bible than the magical side, trying to act like it's this oh. purely, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things, like, one of the big differences between um, the J author, the Yahwist, and uh, in particular, the author of P, the priestly author, is their perspective of who God is and how he interacts with people. And you can see this. I did this in my uh, in my evidence video. I took a look at the uh, the story of um, Abraham and Hagar, the the doublets, the one written by J, the other one written by by P, um, that appear in Genesis six. I think it's Genesis. 16 and Genesis 26. I might be wrong there about the, the chapters. But one of the things that's really interesting in that story is like Hagar, uh, Sarah becomes jealous, becomes jealous of Hagar. Um, and uh, in the one story, she tells Abraham to get rid of her and her son Ishmael. In the other story, Hagar's still pregnant and Abraham is super callous and he's like, I don't care. Do whatever you want with her because you're mad about her. And so she treats her really poorly so much so that Hagar runs away. Right. Um, and she's, she ends up in the, in the wilderness and in the one, and in both stories, she has an encounter with God. But what's really interesting is in the J account, when you read it, it sounds like, God was, or the, it says the angel of Yahweh encountered her at this well in such a way that if you're kind of picturing it, you can see him just kind of strolling along. You know, he's walking there and, oh, here's Hagar. Let's have a conversation, a face-to-face -face conversation with Hagar about what's going on. This is very <laughs> typical of Jay. God just kind of walks around among people. Um, he has, he has face-to-face -face interactions with people as an ordinary human being would. When we get to the peace story, she doesn't encounter anybody at the well. Um, she's, she's in the desert, um, and, and the well is actually, the, the spring is revealed to her, uh, by God. But the angel of God doesn't come up and have a conversation with her. He speaks to her out of the sky. Like, this is a fundamentally different perspective who God is and how he interacts with people. You know, you see it in the creation story, the P creation story. God just speaks everything into existence. In the J creation story, he gets down in the dirt 
and he plants a <laughs> garden, right? He he it literally says he molds the people and the animals out of clay. He does, you know, invasive psychosurgery on the man by pulling the rib out and shapes it. It says it builds the the Hebrew word is he builds a woman out of this rib. And then in, later in the story, he's walking around in yeah, the garden. That. Yeah. And, you know, and he has to, he has to go, I, you know, where are you? I don't know where you are. He's, he's got, no, he's the God, the, the, the whole perspective of who God is, is totally different. And if you don't, if you don't, catch this you're gonna you're gonna miss a lot of really important stuff that's there within the text this is so so awesome because this cuts through the heart of these positions that have come up these denominations calvinism and arminianism and open theism and trying to rectify like does god know the future uh does god is that an anthropomorphism like this you know when you know these sources it cuts all that. It undermines every single one of these ridiculous, like I have the answer of understanding how God works and the big picture of the, the whole canon. No, you don't. You don't know what you're talking about. I used to be a Calvinist. Before that, I was an Arminian type Christian. And uh, I was wrong on both ends, it, like just trying to get my picture yeah. fit, you know? But Derek, the other thing this does is this provides an argument to all of these people because – there's a if if there's a there's a text in scripture from which you can build a position about just about anything. Yep. And the you know the the in, in co, uh, yeah the what what I I like to call the dispute or the ongoing dialogue between the various voices within the text. Um, this is what this is what what prompts people to. T- Take strong positions on these things because you can make just as compelling a case for Arminianism from the text as you can for Calvinism from the text. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you've ever watched any of these these Arminian versus Calvinism debates yes. on live or on YouTube, but they're absolutely idiotic for this reason because the Calvinist stands up and goes, you know, here's all the scripture about why Calvinism is true the armenian gets up and says, here's all the scripture that says why well, armenianism is true I, <laughs> what do you do with that like yeah, like it, you just end up talking past each other i i really like um something that that i greatly appreciate about the rabbis is that they had they had a strong sense of this in their own text they saw that yeah there's there's different voices at work and we're not going to, we're not going to, to mute any of them because they're all in there. But uh, we're also not going to ever answer some of these questions. So when you read rabbinic dialogues in, in uh, uh, the Talmud, (laughs) they're just, they're so open-ended. They just kind of, you know, go in three different directions and never resolve anything. I think I so, saw the debate kind of debate discussion with Dr. Christine Hayes uh, with an actual uh, rabbinic Jew on the Talmud and what we should do. And the Jews response was, look, we're, we're, this is for about practical living, pragmatic approach to yeah. the world around us. And we're not going to answer the when, why, where, because then you're actually taking away from the pragmatic. And she said, I'm sorry, but I feel like I have a religious experience just from discovering the when, the where, the why did they say this? Like for her, it's like you uh-huh. and me, like the new religious experience that we have. And I use that term, not meaning it in the literal sense. It's like Christians go, I had a warm and fuzzy. Well, when I find out God was a man walking around and then I find out he's a voice up here, then that's like, oh, I just got that like, whoa, you know what I'm talking about? It's like a fuzzy oh, totally, feeling. Totally, head. yeah. Yeah, I like I like those fuzzy feelings too. Those are great. So, but yeah, I mean, the Bible is super complex and it's loaded with all sorts of different voices and different perspectives. And the absolute wrong thing to do is, is to attempt to harmonize these 
as opposed to trying to understand where these people were coming from and why they they thought the way they did, why they they took the positions they did, who they were who they were speaking against. You know, one of the things I did my my uh, PhD uh, working with uh, the book of Jeremiah and with some of the Dead Sea Scrolls that the very provide a very very interesting um, interpretation on Jeremiah the man um, and so the texts attributed to him. Something that I think is really neat, like in Jeremiah chapter four, he actually quotes. Um, from it's pretty obvious that he's he's drawing from the Genesis one creation account. So we know he knew this text, and that's this is one of the ways where I think we're, we're I'm you know we could be pretty confident that P was not post exilic, or at least this this text of P was not post exilic. Maybe maybe parts of it were. But there was certainly a kernel in there um, was, that was, Jeremiah. You're dating, you're dating now, and that's complicated. A lot of people don't really like to date, but y- your suggestion is prior to the exile, peace, uh, something of peace floating around. I'll just say something of the creation story is floating around because um, Jeremiah Jeremiah knows it. He he and he he. He alludes to it. It's not a direct quotation, but it's neat what he does. Actually, let me see if I can uh, just pull it up here. It's in Jeremiah yeah. chapter 4. And this is something – so this is one of the things that, that Michael Jones in his video actually draws from to say Genesis is super ancient because Jeremiah knows Genesis. What Jeremiah is doing here in, in Jeremiah chapter 4, he's actually witnessing the uh, – the encroaching Babylonians on the city of Jerusalem um, and people are freaking out because, you know, the army of the most powerful empire in the world has surrounded your city and they're going to destroy it. Um, and in his anguish, he's Jeremiah's basically telling people this is awful and this is your fault, according to God. Um, and this is what's going to happen to you. And at one point, starting in, um, well, let's start in verse 21, chapter 421. And this is the, uh, uh, Jewish publication society translation I'm reading from her. How long must I see standards and hear the blame, the blare of horns for my people are stupid. They give me no heed. They are foolish children. They are not intelligent. They are clever at doing wrong but unable to do right. Then he says, starting in verse 23, I look at the earth. It is unformed and void at the skies and their light is gone. I look at the mountains. They are quaking and the hills are rocking. I look, no man is left and all the birds of the sky have fled. I look at the farm. The farmland is a desert and all the towns are in ruin because of Yahweh, because of his blazing anger so you can hear in there that jeremiah is actually he's pointing to like the order of creation as it's presented in genesis 1 the earth is formless and void then there's light there's earth there's birds in the heavens and he's turning this on its head in such a way that it's like an uncreation this event with the Babylonians, you know, coming in on Jerusalem for him and for the people, this was like the end of the world. It was like a total undoing of creation. But an interesting question is raised here about his usage of this text. Um, because what we know about Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, was probably a Levite, right? Uh, which means that he comes from uh, a different priestly group than those who who are associated with the P creation account, with the priestly material in the Pentateuch. Um, and perhaps hostile to the there, there's there's some there's some tension between these two priestly groups. Po- priestly polemics in the Bible 
And then in the second temple period is phenomenally interesting. I'm just going to say that. But okay. there's possibly is one one of the interesting questions to pose of this of his his allusion to this creation story is is this a polemic at work here? Is he turning the creation story on its head in part also to sort of ridicule or point to um, the problems with the Aaronic priests, the, the Bnei Acheron, the sons of Aaron, uh, who are part of this other priestly group. It, for me, it's a very interesting question. And we see Jeremiah do something like this elsewhere in the text where he will, um, he'll take a section, he'll take a selection of scripture and kind of um, turn it on its head ironically as a way I think to the new, the new Testament does that with the old test or lots of sources that it's drawing from it. It kind of flips things to mean its own, give its own context, but something interesting. I was oh yeah. Say, if, if he's quoting Genesis one from what I was told, and maybe you can dispel this for me. This is just an interesting thought experiment. Genesis one seems to tie in with Genesis six in that, it sounds very flood narrative like. And so here you have yeah. a potential destruction uh, of, you know, God's about to do some uh, judgment here. I wonder if Jeremiah is trying to draw from oh, yeah. that kind of source, you know? Totally, totally. And I mean, in his mind, in the mind of the, of uh, in, in my estimation, in the mind of the people who are living in the city of Jerusalem at the time this was happening, this is what it was in, in their minds. This was the, the total annihilation of, of the, of their world. It was coming to an end. Wow. And with how, how seriously, with how, with how much, uh, value, um, large segments of the Jewish population set on the Jerusalem temple and on its importance and its entire significance, once the Babylonians started to to take this building apart and take all the all the valuables out of it, what do they start to think at this point? The end of the world. Like it is it is the end. The prophecies have failed. The kingdom, the kingdom that the 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 dynasty, the the Yahweh's dynasty that he set up for eternity has come to an end. Have you what does that, that do to a person? That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that book, When Prophecy Failed? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I haven't read it yet. Oh, bro, I got it in my room. I'm I I'll be honest, it's a little dry, but it's super educational and it's all about the Old Testament prophetic uh, situations, and you're nailing the coffin shut right here because it's like the Millerite movement. The end is about to happen in 1844, and sure enough, when it didn't happen, two things happened. One group said, we got the date wrong. We're, we're mistaken somehow. The other side said, it did happen in some spiritual sense. So um, part of me wonders if this failure constantly prophets come back new texts are approaching redactors probably add in there and an angel of the lord said it will be 70 years in fact when you will be brought back and and, da, 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 da. and then it was like well not 70 years daniel says 70 times seven or 70 weeks of it's like bro really oh so, yeah i love this man i love oh, yeah. this and it, you know and that's exactly so what happened as a result of that the torah essentially happened mm. as a result of that. I mean, it's, it's, and then early Judaism happened as a result of that, where, um, like you said, so many ongoing questions about, about, um, about dating or about, uh, things that were supposed to take place. It's interesting, actually, the, the seven years prophecy from Jeremiah is something that I think, um, was misunderstood from the beginning. Jeremiah is not, his prophecy there is not one of um, 
where he set his focus on the expectation of return. As I read it, what he's he's writing, so it takes place within a letter that he has sent to the exiles who are already in Babylon, right? And what is he on that letter? He says, relax, plant your fields, live your lives, because you're going to be there for a while. Mm. You're going to be there for like 70 years. So I don't think this is Jeremiah saying, don't worry, it's coming to an end. This is Jeremiah saying, no, man, you're stuck there for a while. Um, but because of the way that uh, interpreters, because of the because of the way biblical language works, because of the way um, people inherited these texts and the value that they imbued to them and how they figured you needed to read them, this becomes uh, something else entirely, right? Even this for Daniel, becomes, right? So exactly. Would you agree that, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Totally. Totally. And, and what Daniel is doing is, is, or, you know, what, what, uh, what the Hasmoneans <laughs> in, uh, once in the one sixties are doing with Daniel is saying, well, we've got this, we've got this prophecy, which wasn't really even a prophecy. It was, you know, we've got this, this return prophecy. And yes, that happened. The, the Jews came back, even though it wasn't actually 70 years, but, Who's counting? Uh, you know, and yes, they rebuilt the temple, but why are why is there so much why is there so much crap still going on? And why are you know why why Antiochus the fourth who came in and, and desecrated the temple? There's all these other questions that demand answers. And as a result, you've got to impose a whole new way of understanding the 70 years you develop a whole new calendar as a result it becomes a point of uh of of divine uh revelation the angel gabriel comes and basically tells daniel how to interpret the text and what's really cool is in the dead sea scrolls this 490 years uh is something that they they go steps further with the, it, it shows up in in several texts, and there's different ways of organizing the 490 years. There's different ways of counting them from from start to finish. Um, it it just it 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 explodes into this this whole new interpretive movement on on what to do with a lot of this stuff. One of the things that I'm I've already decided I'm going to do. Uh, in the future, when I'm finished with the documentary hypothesis videos, is I'm I'm going to do a whole bunch of Dead Sea Scrolls videos. But um, one of the things that I'm going to do is is focus on Daniel, because what I've discovered is w the Dead Sea Scrolls are fertile ground. Like apologists love the Dead Sea Scrolls because they're <laughs> super old, right? And because they 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 preserve our oldest copies of scripture. So, you know, they show, they, they, they make some sort of statements about the, the reliability of, of scripture. And they love the fact that there's copies of the book of Daniel in the Dead Sea Scrolls, because it shows that people were taking this stuff seriously, the book of Daniel really early. Like um, I think our oldest copy of the book of Daniel leads to like, the beginning of the first century BC, which would have been within decades after um, parts of Daniel were written. So this mm -hmm. apologists love this stuff. Uh, but what gets ignored is the nature of how the, uh, the texts of Daniel appear in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, some of them are complete. The complete ones are a little bit later, uh, but some of them not necessarily. I mean, maybe they were only just chunks. Um, it, it, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the the scholarly ideas about how Daniel developed, but there's there's a whole bunch of individual chunks of literature that was put together over a, a longer period of time, right? Um, right. And what's really interesting is is in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we don't just have Daniel; we have all this other 
um, really intriguing Aramaic literature featuring Daniel or people who look a lot like Daniel doing things that Daniel did. Right. But, and, and it's all like, it's, it's a treasure trove all about the, the historical development of the book of Daniel, which emphatically shows that no, there's no way a completed book of Daniel was written before the Persian period. So 100% and that dating annihilates the value of this being prophetic. And then the new Testament, just what it does for me, once you see this, is it like, like a tidal wave on the whole, whoever used this after it, it, it falls into the ignorant, um, into the ignorant uh, category. And I don't mean that derogatorily. I mean that like, like when the book of revelation is using this, we know felled and not really written when it says it's supposedly written text, what's that do with your understanding of things in the new Testament? It should cause you to go, Oh my goodness. Uh, there's this problem. I was going to show you something here real quick that you, you yeah, sure. on for 90 years. I actually made this a while back after reading John J. Collins, the uh, apocalyptic imagination and here he quotes. That's a great uh, book, by the way. For real, man. That was over my head in many ways. But 1QP Habakkuk, Habakkuk uh, 7, 6 through 13. For there is yet a, a vision coming. Anyway, in this particular, it's used in the 490 years. It says this passage implies that the end is delayed and had not come when initially expected about 40 years hmm. after the death of the teacher. And I asked him when he thought who the, who the teacher was. He said, I'm not going to even guess because no one knows who the teacher no. of righteousness was in this. There might have been many teachers of righteousness for all we know. And, you know, that's just kind of a mystery. They didn't use names, but they keep rehashing this. And Daniel expected it to happen in his day, just like Jeremiah expected it to happen in his day, just like the New Testament is expected. And it just keeps going. I often thought that there is a there is a subconscious if you're if you're part of a prophetic movement so maybe it's less so now but I think certainly in antiquity um, and this is just just the way that I'm reading things I've often wondered about who these people were and and how they thought and and, and went about doing their the 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 stuff that they do and I've often wondered if one of the reasons for using the symbolism and couching all your stuff in this in this vague um, vague language and um, using big round numbers or or target uh, target dates that can be um, I guess uh, reorganized is this is this subconsciously um, part of the recognition that the way in which this is going to work is if it could be attached loosely to whatever in the future. Right. I've often wondered if part like of prophecy, part of the reason, way? totally. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, and you know, something I mentioned this in, in my, uh, in my third video, but there's something, something that, that is, is really, um, I guess that was the fourth video. It was the introduction to the documentary hypothesis video. Right. Something that I, I, I key on, which I think is really important when it comes to reading uh, the Bible and reading how, how biblical authors used the Bible and read the Bible uh, is to focus on what, what James Kugel uh, called the four assumptions of uh, biblical interpretation. And it helps to explain why so much of the weird shit happens in the New Testament that we see. Like, Matthew, what the hell is he doing in the, in, in, uh, uh, the infancy <laughs> narratives in Matthew? He's like pulling all these texts of, of Scripture out and saying, you know, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. This was fulfilled in Jesus. This is what it said in in the uh, in the scriptures. 
And when you sit down and you, you look at the texts themselves, as a modern reader, you go, I mean, it doesn't really say that, or at least those are the words, but it has nothing to do with, with who Jesus was. Like the, you know, the Isaiah chapter nine prophecy. That's it. When, when that was written, um, it had to do with, uh, with knowing, um, knowing the time frame of when Assyria was going to, uh, was going to invade, right? Like it has absolutely nothing at all to do with the Messiah, but this is how, and this is something that, that, uh, wasn't invented by the New Testament authors. Right. This is an inherited thing. Like this is this is a this is the matrix in which the the Jews operated in. And we see this throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, where every single text, if it's scripture, whatever that is, and there's lively debates um in my circles about what scripture was how ancient authors understood it, how they defined it, what they included within it, what they did with it. But one of the things that they came to understand scripture to be, like almost universally, was that it was a collection of all this cryptic, um, cryptic coded messages for the future. And not just the obvious stuff, but every single text so when you go through something like the Pesher Habakkuk which is what uh Collins was quoting from there right I don't know if you've read it but from start to end it's it's not complete it's only it's it's fragmentary right so um it's it's just a it's just going through the text of Habakkuk it cites it cites a passage from Habakkuk, and then it says, the interpretation of this passage is when the teacher of righteousness entered the temple and confronted the wicked priest. So it's doing and the same thing the New Testament's doing in a exactly way. Exactly the same thing. And it's the most benign, most mundane stuff that, like, to our eye, but because it's scripture, um, it means something to me today and that's wow. like one of the fundamental one of the fundamental keys for understanding scripture from from the perspective of those who wrote the gospels from those first christians from from the the people in and around palestine from that period was that all of this stuff means something to me now so they're they're just they're, they're they're primed for it. They're looking for it. Paul does this. You know, at one point in in the book of Romans, he quotes from from Deuteronomy, um, and just just does this. Well, he he quotes from all sorts of scripture in 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 Romans. Uh, I think it's it's like nine through eleven is just a cavalcade of 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 scripture quotations from Paul. But he's doing this all the time, where he's just pulling stuff out. Uh, we, completely as we would say completely out of context but they certainly did not see it like that you pull right. this stuff out completely out of context and say this is what it means and you know and that was the pro that was the proper way to do it they were just doing what everybody else was doing this is the way ancient people ancient jews read their texts so it's no wonder that we are here today where we're at with, with, uh, with evangelical Apologies. churches and totally because um, we've, we've inherited this very ancient sense of biblical interpretation that treats the Bible uh, like a, like a coded message book. And that's yep. why there's, you know, that's why there's, what is it? There's a hundred and, is it 116 fulfilled prophecies of Jesus? 
uh, it depends on who you ask. Some say there's 300. Some say there's, you know, there's just so. But that's many. why there's so many. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Doctor Davis, you. That's why there's so many. The, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say there's a lot of fertile ground in in uh, uh, Psalm 22, um, right? Oh, Which yes. is is loaded, and obviously the gospel writers were had this in mind right and we're writing uh the passion narrative on the basis of of psalm 22 the gospel writers did this all the time the 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 writer of the gospel of luke patterned his story after the uh narratives of elijah and elisha in uh in first kings if you read them side by side jesus is doing kind of doing the same sort of things in the same order so anyways, Psalm 22 is, it's, this is what the gospel writers are doing, but, uh, um, what, there was a lot of excitement and this was actually one of my teachers was, um, was professor Peter Flint who passed away tragically. Uh, I think it was, I think it's been about six or seven years ago now, but he was, he was a, a, he was a favorite on like the uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network or here in Canada, we have a show called 100 Huntley Street, which is uh, which is like a, like, like a gospel TV show. He was a favorite among them. I used to go with him uh, as, as a, as one of his students to, to churches where he would give presentations, right. About, about the Dead Sea Scrolls and about uh, all the great things that they teach us about the Bible and stuff. So he was the editor of uh, of all, I think it was not quite all, but he was the editor for most of the Dead Sea Scrolls that contain uh, portions of Psalms. And there's a lot of them. Um, there was a great deal of excitement uh, within uh, the evangelical community. And maybe you've heard about this. Um, when it came to one of the manuscripts that had pervert that had preserved part of Psalm 22, um, the reading, as he under the what what he wrote in his edition, was that the reading, uh, where he he uh, he he pierced my hands and my feet, right, which is drawn actually from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew. Bible and not the Hebrew text to tell itself because that passage in the Hebrew text says like a lion are my hands and feet and it's a weird it's a weird passage and there's lots of there's there's some discussion about what it even means um, anyways Peter Flint uh, wrote up in his edition that now we have a Hebrew man manuscript that preserves the reading that uh, that we see in the Septuagint translation, the Greek translation. Here is a Hebrew manuscript from, um, it was either the, the first century BC, first century, yeah, from like the first century BC, which shows this reading of piercing of the hands and feet. The problem, and even even among scholars, I think scholars can be guilty of this. And most of the time, it's because scholars are busy; they're doing their own things, they've got their own projects, so they don't they don't take the time always to go back and actually check everything. Um, but when you look at most of us, see pictures when we see pictures of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see pictures of like uh, the Great Isaiah Scroll, which is mm -hmm. phenomenally well preserved. And it's pretty easy to read. It's clear that the, the text is clear and legible. It's it's most of them don't look anything like that. Uh, lots of them are really scrappy. Um, the inks flaked off. It's it's faded badly. Um, there's actually manuscripts where uh, which were written with a type of ink that contains like a copper in it, which actually ate through the the leather so um you know lots of them are very poorly preserved and the fragment from which uh peter flint drew this reading um when you when i sit down and i look at the fragment i'm going well 
already this is problematic because it's badly preserved. It's hard to read, but to my eye, he's he's misread it. It doesn't say, uh, my hands and feet are pierced. It agrees with the Hebrew version that we know. So, huh. but this is one of these sorts of things, right? Like, like very, very few people are actually going to take the time and certainly not, not Christian apologists. When they see that, they glom onto it and hold on yep. forever. And that's right. It. Let's hang on. That's yeah. it. It's, it's ours. It's settled because this respected academic who did the actual work, who wrote the actual edition, uh, this is the reading that he provided. And he's an expert. And he, you know, he was, he was a phenomenal scholar, but scholars make mistakes. Right. And scholars have their own biases. And, you know, they, they are going to read according to their biases. We all do it. But, uh, but it's not, it's not a settled issue. So, yeah. Well, let me just say this. You have, I didn't expect us to do what we just did, you know, and this was, this was <laughs> know, so right? good that I, I swear this was amazing. I really want to do this again and delve deep into various fields. I'm so thankful that you went into the Dead Sea Scrolls. Let's do this again. Everyone, please, I'm asking you to go and subscribe to his YouTube channel. You're also working on a project here. Can you tell us what this is before we let you go? So most of the work that I've been doing for the last, um, well, almost the last decade is, um, is on uh, forgeries of Dead Sea Scrolls fragments that have shown up in mostly in uh, private evangelical institutions like the Museum of the Bible, I'm actually uh, to my to my shame. I was actually one of the editors of the uh, Museum of the Bible collection of Dead Sea Scrolls fragments, which all turned out to be forgeries. Um, but I've also been involved in this international project dealing with uh, forged manuscripts um and the focus of the project now the lying pen of scribes project tends to be on um provenance and digital imaging lots of it's pretty technical um but some of it's some of it's uh fairly cool even at, at a, a lay perspective just because of how um how much provenance narratives and and so uh, for for those who don't know, uh, provenance is is a term that's applied to an artifact uh, that's discovered in like an archaeological excavation, um, which informs us that it's it's legitimate and it came from where we claim it came from. Um, the problem with the Dead Sea Scrolls as a whole is that most of them were discovered. There's the project there. Uh, most of them were discovered by, um, by Bedouin in not in controlled excavations. And um, scholars basically had to take the word of uh, these people who were selling them the fragments that they came from where they, they claimed they were found. Um, this whole provenance narrative has essentially been uh, marshaled into a way to sell all sorts of forgeries, forged Dead Sea Scrolls fragments. They sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And um, we're in the process of, uh, of working through that and also attempting to provide um, better tools and uh, a better perspective of the importance of, of provenance in, uh, in our study of ancient manuscripts. This is also, you know, it, it's also important because it's a way of um, insisting on proper provenance is a way of uh, limiting looting and uh, uh, lots of uh, illegal activity and racketeering, the destruction of, of archaeological sites and cultural heritage 
it's uh provenance is a big issue mm. so this is the this is the project that i'm working on now thank you so much go subscribe to his channel hit that all guys there's no reason we shouldn't have him way up there and so i really really appreciate you and this was a very educational show let's do this again and let's this cover man this was this was something else <laughs> i didn't expect it to be this fun and it was that much fun so thank you so much man let's do this again awesome let me know when you bet totally and ladies and gentlemen go find his youtube go check his videos out drop a comment show him some love subscribe to the channel and never forget we are myth vision Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Myth Vision Podcast. No fancy fancy intro as I usually try to do. We're going straight for the jugular today. Honestly, we're all here to openly and publicly admit our wrongs and how we should repent right now. We're all we're all sorry and wrong about what recently came up on the documentary with Kip Davis. Kip Davis is just totally wrong about all of this, right? Wouldn't you say? Totally he, wrong. He, he's made up the whole story about how he's made this uh he says he's made this documentary but there's conflicting accounts that... no but serious no i'm teasing those who saw the documentary you're going to be tracking with what we're saying here i got some background noise gentlemen it's got to be josh i think because me and kip were on mute oh sounds good now okay now. all right so for those of you who are watching who did not uh see the documentary i ask you all right now before we get started to go over make sure you subscribe dr josh's channel of course you guys know digital hammurabi digital gnosis nathan's channel make sure you guys go check him out there's we all have similar themes and we touch on similar stuff coming from similar backgrounds worldviews if you will also dr kip davis he just am i saying that right i know i feel like i'm butchering your name is it Davies, don't start, man. You finally, you finally got it right, dude. Davis, just go with Davies is the correct pronunciation. You're it's French. So loud, Doctor Josh. You're so loud. I don't know what's going on. Did you bump it up? I don't think so. Okay. Is it okay? Nope, you're good now. It this was like is... maximum gain when you. It was like Davis. <laughs> yeah, he he wanted everyone to hear it. It's okay. Look, if you didn't see this right here, you must watch the documentary. It's already got Josh McDowell and Sean McDowell disliked it. So you really should check it out. Um, it, it Wonderful documentary on the mythologizing of someone's testimony. And I know from firsthand experience how I would do that subconsciously as a Christian. It's not like I intentionally try to be a manipulating liar. But when you weigh in all the evidence, you're kind of stuck with all sorts of questions you need to ask. Also, we don't know if Doug is going to pop in, but if he doesn't, either way, go subscribe to Pine Creek. He's in the same vein as me, and in many ways, I ask you guys to do that. We have Patreon. If you want to help support, you want stuff, early access, all that. This right here, I have a question that's going to come up with this whole video that I did with Dr. Josh. We ask kind of in the vein of this question, are evangelical scholars trustworthy on their conclusions. And I'm not saying that they're all not. I'm saying it's like when you listen to someone like Josh McDowell, who's like bumping in with some of these conservative evangelical Christian scholars, you really have to ask yourself, can I trust these guys or are they accurately presenting the data? Those are questions you should ask yourself. All right. Yeah, I definitely, I, I definitely thought you were saying when you bump into Josh McDowell, can you trust him? Like, I don't know that I would categorize him as a scholar. Well, he bumps into on the documentary, as you see some of the guys I'm talking with. But yeah, yeah, you you answer the question, though, and you say, I know some Christians who can't. It goes against their their <clears throat> precepts. You know, they can't go go that route. And I also want to promote Dr. Josh's book. I have to ask everybody, if you haven't got this book, um, you're probably going to hell. OK, and <laughs> Josh loves you. But 
he has to send you there. It's just the way it is. Um, teasing. Anyways, you guys. And the audio book by, read by Seth, right? Seth Andrews. Oh, that's right. The Angel of Satan. Yeah, the, the, the voice of an angel, depending on what worldview you come from. He's probably Satan for Christians. But tell us about this, Kip. I have to ask you. You're the one who presented this documentary, and this is really a focus on your work. What made you even want to get into this? And then I'd like to have a roundtable. I don't want to lead this. This isn't my show. This is us, all four. And if Pine Creek pops in, we'll have five. Like jumping around, just free-flowing on the idea of what we saw in that documentary. So it, uh, and I, I talked just briefly a little bit about this when, in the documentary itself and how I got involved. And it really was this video that, uh, that popped up on Vimeo from a, from a talk he did in a church back in 2012. Dal gave this talk and uh, somebody asked a question about um about the manuscript evidence for the new testament and so he started to go into this whole thing about uh deconstructing dismounting this uh ancient egyptian funerary mask which is made of uh discarded papyri and showing slides of uh you know supposedly manuscript fragment after manuscript fragment from the new testament all of which are the oldest of their kind and date back to the uh you know, to the early second century, and then sort of threw in there offhand. This took place after the um, the the famous Daniel Wallace Bart Ehrman video or uh, um, debate at uh, uh, Chapel Hill, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, where where uh, Daniel Wallace uh, announced uh, the discovery of a first century copy of the Gospel of Mark, and McDowell in his video claims to have been there or been the discoverer of this first century uh fragment of, of mark and i i was in norway at the time i i work in uh dead sea scrolls i was at the time working on the scoyan collection uh and his his scroll fragments um you know this is i, I run in circles with uh with antiquities experts with papyrologists with people who who read the original manuscripts and when this video uh hit uh hit uh, the internet uh our field kind of exploded uh it uh there were numerous uh critical uh, responses on various blogs and and in print that appeared it uh so this this really got me going but i think it was when I when I first watched that video. I think this this it just it was it was bugging me, the way that he he started his talk, and you know, talked about uh, his his past and his 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 upbringing and his his anger as a as a freshman in college and how this right. you know set him out to 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 prove disprove Christianity. And then he throws out this bit about going to Europe and about studying ancient manuscripts. And, uh, you know, when I first heard it, it just, it struck me as, well, that's, that's a very strange response for a 19 year old to, to go and, and do something like this. And because I know a few things about manuscripts, I'm like, well, I, I mean, trying to put myself, I, I was trying to imagine my own 19 year old self who probably wasn't, well, I was a Christian at that time, but trying to imagine my own 19 year old self traveling around in Europe and visiting libraries and looking at manuscripts and thinking what I, you know, what, what I could possibly have learned, uh, just, you know, being there. And I just thought this is this is ridiculous. And that I mean, that's really where it started. And I, you know, I started reading. I I found uh, old copies of of the uh, the publication that he wrote, "Evidence That Demands a Verdict." It's gone through numerous uh, revisions and and updates over the last uh, I guess it's 40, 50 years now almost. So. I started reading and taking notes. I actually have uh, I have a thirty-five page chart that has 
every single version of his his printed published story and it's color coded uh as i track basically every single word change the synoptic um, problem of dr of josh sorry <laughs> and this is Josh. actually where, where this where this project began was i thought oh this would be so cool to turn this into like a research paper uh which base which, which would basically be employing the the principles of textual criticism to McDowell's own story, which is, it's pretty remarkable, I think. Um, and I think one of the, the enormous takeaways, there's many, there's many takeaways from the documentary itself, but I think one of the really, really the biggest ones um, is just how much uh, one man's personal account, his own autobiography, um, has changed and developed over the course of 50 years. Um, you know, the apologists are telling us about how it's too, it's not enough time for legends to develop. Um, somebody would have noticed, you know, somebody would have noticed the lies, would have noticed the fabrications. They could never get away with it. And here McDowell has been publishing like millions of copies of this testimony, repeating it hundreds, thousands of times in his public talks, uh, and nobody bats an eye. So that's 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 the genesis. Interesting. Uh, would you guys like to comment on that? As I was listening, I I kind of sat back and put my hands above my head and <laughs> I thought it's true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Satan just entered the room. <laughs> What's up, Doug? I can feel Don't the blaspheme <sighs> the ruler of the world. Forgive me. Uh, yeah, sorry I'm late. Um, been very busy. Are, you're talking about Josh McDowell, right? Yes. Yeah. Did you Did see you the see documentary anything? or not yet? No, I haven't seen it yet. But oh. have you? Did you play the clip of the first century mark thing yet? You did. Okay, it's all Cause, in. Uh, yeah, because three or four years ago I did a video on that, you, and uh, there's I a actually. No, I was I was just gonna say I uh, I watched it when you did it. It was your your video takedown is is excellent, and you do a very good job of of uh, telling the first century mark story. Um, I rewatched it again uh, about a month ago, um, as I was working on this it's it's yeah it's it's really fantastic and i also love how you draw attention to the uh to the very feminine features of josh mcdowell's hands <laughs> as he's as he's uh uh pulling manuscripts out of uh out of an egyptian funerary mask well there's nothing wrong so, with feminine hands i'm just yeah just making observations they're not his though <laughs> <laughs> they're not yeah they're not his but yeah they're the clip that i th i played uh where he basically with a tremendous amount of high confidence says we can go back within 50 years of jesus now with a fragment of mark and this was in 2014 and he's exuding this confidence as a leader as an apologist to christians and i'm not, i wouldn't call him a liar for doing that but he is so gullible that he was so quick to be desirous that this is true way before the evidence even hit or even was looked at. He was just like, someone told him that this is a first century Mark fragment. And so therefore it is. And so I need to tell all my followers about this and give them encouragement and hope that what they believe is not is in fact true and they don't need to feel stupid for what they believe. Can I get an amen? Like this is terrible, terrible stuff. And and I don't know. Amen. I don't know if he's apologized for this. I know uh, Wallace did. Um, was it Wallace? I know yes, one or Wallace, two of them apologized. He should. He should. I mean, Wallace but, issued an apology. But yeah, Josh McDowell. If you ever hear this, or some of your followers, you ought to apologize for duping thousands, if not tens of thousands, of your followers believing in something that was blatantly untrue. Doug, it gets worse than that. Go ahead, Dr. Josh. Sorry. I was just going to say, like, 
This is sort of a, I'm, I'm noticing that this is sort of a common theme uh, for Christian apologists, <clears throat> at least the ones that I interact with or see. This idea that something new comes out, a new paper, somebody publishes a new book, uh, you know, it's, it's almost always an evangelical scholar. And there's this sort of fringe position, one that either hasn't, like at best, hasn't been thoroughly peer reviewed yet, and at worst has been, and is still out there as a publication. Um, and suddenly that, that position is the correct position. And it, I see this a lot, for example, in, in, um, you know, when it comes to ancient Near Eastern law, you know, if you talk to somebody like Jay Caballero, who is finishing up his PhD in, uh, in ancient Near Eastern law, he'll tell you, oh, we don't know. Like we don't, we don't know specifically how we should think about these law collections. We think it's probably not, um, you know, prescriptive, but, but. Is that my buddy? On my apple. Oh, ants on your apple. Okay. That's scary. Um, I'll be out in a minute, <laughs> but, um, but you know, that, then somebody comes along and, and, and publishes a book that says, oh, actually, this is, this is what ancient Near Eastern law collections are like, and this is what it's like in the Hebrew Bible. And boom, that's it. Now, there's like four different choices right now, four or five different theories about what it is that law collections are doing, and nobody knows. Like, we don't, we, there are good points and bad points to each. But that apologist or that evangelical scholar said, I think it's this. All of a sudden, that's it. And now we, we're making videos, we're, we're pushing forward, uh, and everybody is, oh, no, these are descriptive, and these are wisdom, and these are didactic. And it's like, well, maybe, first of all, I don't think you understand what that means and the implications of it, but, but even if it, like you do, it's like we don't know that that's the case. So I, I see this, I feel like we all see this quite a bit, and it's a little frustrating. Nathan, did you want to say something real quick? I think I'd love to talk more about that absolute massive situation with the mummy masks. Like, I can't remember exactly where the article was, um, but someone wrote up, like, the whole story and, you know, like, all the weird stuff that was going on behind the scenes with um, the the investment people, the Hobby Lobby people, um, the guy himself who was doing the method. I, f I forgot... Um, he was like offered a job and his wife was on the faculty at a different university. So he like agreed to take the position and was getting a salary, but not like teaching there or something. It, there's just so many layers of like mm. immoral behavior and screwed upness in that, like in that story that it's written. But the thing I wanted to mention that I found really interesting about um, McDowell's like his kind of um, conversion story is I really like the way that, um, Kip phrased what was it what was her name? Was it Eva something? Eva, Eva, Eva Morocek. Morocek. Um her thing of like how the the what the stories we tell ourselves about like historical findings like actually play a role in like how our culture interacts with those texts and stuff. So I, I mean like for, for me, for example, the classic is like the discovery of Tutankhamun's like um sarcophagus and all that stuff, where there's like, you know, this story of, oh, it's been, you know, no one's been in there for so long. And uh then all of a sudden they peek through the hole, you know, and they go in. And it I agree that it like frames then how our culture interacts with all of that evidence. Uh, but McDowell's trying to do the same thing, but clearly from like this evangelical perspective with a whole narrative about the historicity of Christ, like it, it's what saved me individually. It's God's grace at acting in that way. But also it's like the best bit of evidence that you ever found and stuff like that. Um, and I think it's really interesting all the motifs that there are in that narrative. So for example, he says, I, I mean, it, I think I think it is false and he is lying right when he says this stuff because we know he was for example like te going around teaching Christian doctrine at the time so it's kind of weird when he calls himself an obnoxious agnostic right he goes for two I was a years. abhorrent yeah for 2 and years then, but months like it yeah we have a corroborating fact from someone writing about him saying well months after he went on this research project as some you know student he's he accepts Jesus into his life and he's given sermons in Europe. So here he is preaching at these. That's what blows me away the most. This is like this guy elaborated this complete myth of his testimony 
<coughs> Ravi Zacharias. And I'm just saying it's really interesting how I'm a seeker of truth. Uh, I already got a criticism for one of my comments of like, you know, give, being nitpicky about my comment on your video kit. But it's like my point is this guy is standing there saying, I am searching for truth and I am on the path of truth. And what I stand for is the truth. And if you're wrong, this isn't like a, I'm wrong. Oh, God, I'm wrong. Damn it. Well, I, I should have been taking that path the whole time. No, your soul, your your whole life and everything. It's 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 much deeper than that. And this guy's fabricating his own myth while pretending that he has the truth. And I wonder he how much so, of that. Yeah, go ahead. No, he was so bothered about being intellectually dishonest. He couldn't sleep at night. <laughs> was that, it's that toxic frame because the narrative that the fake narrative, you know, like it's, it's obvious, it's patently false. Right. But the narrative that he's putting forward also is like it, it moral, morally denigrates those who disagree with him. So it's like, and if you're going to be, if you're an agnostic or an atheist, according to the true worldview I found through this fake, like made up evidence, right? Yep. Um, if you disagree with me, then you're like an evil person. You're an abhorrent agnostic. You're, and, and that's really toxic. And then the other thing I noticed is this general like motif, right? Uh, which is called the avowal of prior skepticism. And I put a, there's actually a, a psychological study in like, um, like, why people believe in crazy things like um, su supernatural claims and stuff like that. And it's a really common motif um, in communities that have sort of kooky beliefs is this avowal of prior skepticism, like narrative, like, oh, I was so uh, skeptical, but then I came to the evidence. And, and for some reason, there's like this bias that we have in communities when people tell stories like that, where like, oh, well, if they're, you know, if they were that skeptical and they're honest and stuff, I'm going to be on board with that. Uh, with what they've got to say. And it's quite, it's quite well-documented phenomena in psychology. I think it's what's yeah. going on in the case of, you know, like this story, Lee Strobel's Least, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real quick, Doug, I just want to say for Doug, just so that you're aware of this, because the documentary goes into it. Dr. Kip, the whole reason this came up as like a red flag for him is when these mummy type manuscripts that date to the first century and all this stuff starts to pop up on the scene, in the scholarly world, it comes up on the radar of Kip and all of his, the people that work with him that are focused on this. And so he said, something's fishy, right? Obviously, we don't agree with this. We, we the, How they came about, how they're dealing with this or buying these manuscripts on the black market. You know, this isn't, I think, I think on the black market, either way, they're not like actually knowing for certain where they're coming from and how these things are working, but they're dating into the first century and it caught his attention. And now Kip's like, hold on. What else is BS about this? So he started to dive in and realized that, to give it in a nutshell, McDowell's testimonies over the years, like mythologize with the current data that is competing out there to try and like make Christianity win. And now that we know it's not first century, uh, Dr. Kip, correct me if I'm wrong, he's not out there going, okay, we were wrong about the first century. It didn't even phase his narrative. He's still running around saying the same things. And most Christians aren't critical. They accept what's already on their team. This Does anybody know, has there been one statement by Josh McDowell even referencing the first century mark fragment after we know that it's not first century mark? Has he said anything about it? As far as I know, not. And I actually, uh, um, there is a, I found uh, a talk that he gave as late as June, this last June, 2021, at a church where he spent an hour uh, doing doing the same thing with the, with the manuscripts and showing the same slides with the mummy masks. First century Mark is, is uh, conspicuously absent from his talk, but he's still, and he's, he's also, because, I mean, he is, like I said, he's endured a lot of criticism, especially from scholars about, uh, uh, about his whole involvement in this. Um, so he has, he's kind of backtracked that a little bit. He's talked now, he, he talks now um, uh, about, uh, he, he tries to uh, uh, provide a, a, a defense for um, the use of the the palm olive soap and and uh, how you know it's not really it's it's not at all destructive and this is something that uh, you know is it's fine. I want and, it one free. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and he and he talks, but you, you know he talks about how they have they have the one mummy mask still that they have decided. Um, apparently, they you know independent of whatever scholars were saying, 
the McDowells have decided that they're just going to keep it intact. They're not going to, they're not going to pull any, any manuscripts out of it because he wants, you know, he wants people to see what, uh, what this thing looks like. But much of the story is still the same. He's showing pictures of the same manuscripts and on the, all this stuff, the, um, the uh the the pictures that he pulled up um and showed in in this talk he gave in uh 2012 this is you know one of the videos that you showed doug in in your when when you covered this um this was all from uh from an event at baylor um and yes uh thanks for uh sharing that this is an important article for everyone to read uh this is an article by um ariel sabar for the Atlantic, all about the uh, first century Mark stuff. It's thorough. It's pretty much exhaustive. There's also another one uh, over at Christianity Today that was written by Jerry Pattingale, who was an officer of the Museum of the Bible, who basically goes through uh, the story um, from a guy who was actually there and lived through the whole thing, was there in the uh, in the office with Dirk Obink, when Dirk Obank threw the the Manila folders filled with uh, papyrus fragments and pointed out that there's a there's a first century Mark fragment, it's very he's it's been ch very charged, right? Is he in jail? Obank, is, yeah, I don't I don't know if he's in jail, but he's he's definitely yeah he's he's facing charges. Right? Okay, I got to run soon uh, to pick up my okay. son from school, but I, I got to say this: when I did research as a chemist decades ago, when Pine Creek was Pine Stream, I I would do hours and hours of titrations uh, trying to find stability constants of certain molecular complexes. And guess what? I did not care at all the results I obtained. Did not care. I just ran the experiment and and um, kept track of the results. And I, my, I plead with Christians, Jews, Muslims who do this type of research I think you need to have the exact same attitude. Don't care at all about Jesus when you do this work. Mm. Don't care about your love for Jesus and eternal life and hell and heaven. Don't care. Be dead inside and just find the, run the experiments, find the data and be like a robot and get your results. And then we can talk and look at it. But if you're coming at it, oh, I just really want this to be true. Man, I lose respect for you so fast. Anyhow, that, gotta run. I mean, but you're asking. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. You're asking them to do something that they can't do. That yeah, you're at. It's like yeah, jump this high, and you know they're missing legs. It's like not at <laughs> all, but uh, you know what I'm saying. I'm asking them to stop loving Jesus when they do their research. So this is a Kip and Josh question. I think is it see true? You guys. All right, hey, thanks, Doug. Man, I hope to see you again soon, bro. Take care. All right. Um, is it true? Indo says the the Bible has been preserved so well. Only one percent of the Bible verses are questionable, with zero theological changes. No, but but I'll let an expert talk about that. <laughs> Do you want to? This is this. No, I think this is I'll a two part up. question. Okay, so there's a there's a two part question, and maybe maybe I can answer the uh, the because because the question is twofold. Um. Mm -hmm. Are there are are there changes that took place in the textual transmission of the uh, of the Bible? And then there's a second question: um, Is what is uh, what is reported in the Bible faithful to um, the the history behind it or to the oral traditions behind it? So, I mean. Uh, Josh, I think you 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 take that second one. Um, talking just about the uh, the manuscript tradition, and I think this is it is an important difference to make. I tend to agree uh, with well, so there's a few things, and 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 it's different too when we're when you're dealing with Old Testament manuscripts versus New Testament manuscripts. Um, there's it's it's probably safe to say that what is preserved in the New Testament um, is pro is pretty close to the so-called original documents. Okay, 
Um, now, we have to we have to uh, uh, preface that a little bit by noting that there are only two manuscripts, or maybe three, I think, that date as early as the second century. So, a hundred years after, more than a hundred years after Jesus uh, was crucified, um, on about a hundred years after uh, Paul wrote his letters, our earliest manuscripts come from this period, and they're tiny. They're, they're just itty bitty little bits from John's gospel. Uh, the you know the vast majority of the manuscripts we have from the New Testament date to the after the third century. So there is a big period of time here. There's a gap where we have a, a smattering of manuscript evidence, which helps textual critics to determine what they would consider to be um, the so-called best text or the earliest text. Um, but then, you know, anything beyond what we have the manuscripts for, you know, we're kind of throwing up our hands and we're guessing here. And, and the situation is a little different when it comes to the Old Testament, where the vast majority of our manuscripts are removed by, by hundreds of years um, after the fact of when, when these things were written. Um, and there are different streams of textual tradition that seem to have um, coexisted with one another. Uh, one preserved in the Greek translation of the Septuagint, one in the so-called Masoretic text, which is the authoritative Hebrew text for, uh, that the rabbis have been using for thousands of years. Another one in the so-called Samaritan Pentateuch, which is used by the uh, Samaritans. There's still a community of Samaritans, by the way, Samaritan uh, Jews uh, living in Palestine. So, yeah, it's a it's a complicated, it's a difficult question, but the manuscripts. I would say probably preserve a, a an accurate text, but then there's more behind that. And Dr. Josh can talk about that. I mean, from a theological standpoint, I mean, I think this is, this is sort of the issue with textual criticism, right? So the example that I always that I always think of right off the bat is Romans 5.1. Right, having been justified by, I mean, um, let let us have peace with God in the subjunctive, or we have peace with God, right, in the indicative. And the difference is an omicron or an omega. It's just a lengthened O sound. So which one is it, right? And there's pretty good manuscript evidence on both sides of that one. I mean, that's a pretty big theological distinction between those two. We have peace with God, you know, having been justified, or let us have peace with God. Um, so I, I don't know that it's always so, I mean, there's, there's certainly examples of scribal, you know, changes or reworkings, obviously, that, that do things theologically. That's the whole point of their reworking. <clears throat> but, uh, I think there are lots of times that we just, we just don't know. And we have, you know, manuscript evidence that seems to go both ways. So, I mean, this is why I, this is why I find these discussions like Psalm twenty two seventeen says this, and it's like, well, but but does it though? I mean, do we know that though? Uh, because no, we don't. Like, there's a there's there's a reason that uh, people have been you know spilling ink on this for you know how many <laughs> how many decades. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, I think that it's a, that's a very complicated question, and certainly one that um, nobody should nobody should uh, if they're academically minded or if they're uh, you know thinking about pursuing this, nobody should say, well, there's nothing left to do because we like we know what's going on here. We can sort of rely on it because uh, I don't think that's the case at all. I think there's always lots and lots of work to be done for anybody uh, that's interested in the field, not just for Christians or, you know, whatever. So. Well said. Thank you. And thanks for that super chat, Eric. I appreciate it, man. He just said he, he loves your work, uh, Kip. But uh, as far as, as what we're seeing is, and the problem I'm finding within a lot of Christian apologetics is the certainty. They, they don't really carry around that academic uh, ambiguity of saying, well, we're not really sure it's okay to be not okay. Like, 
Dell C. Allison actually at least does that. You know, he'll go, well, we don't, I don't really know. And he's still within the Christian camp, but he's like, he probably rubs a lot of Christians wrong because don't you know? Don't yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, he's certainly, know? he's certainly not an apologist, though, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't right. say. And that's, yeah. yeah, and I think that's the defining feature. There's a, I, um, actually, I'm thinking, yeah. There's, there's a, I, this brings to mind just a, just a very, very fresh example. Um, you know, we talked, uh, we talked a little bit about this before the show started, but SJ made this, um, uh, this new video over the weekend, uh, while I was out of town. Um, how do you feel by the way? I mean, like, have you what's it like, ha yeah, I'm, having I'm, all of your PhD research just debunked like that by, <laughs> I know he's gotta be it's, hurt. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I it's it was I, it's why I left town. Honestly, I just couldn't <laughs> get away I from couldn't handle it. We get it. We yeah. Get so, but she had this. She had another apologist on. It's interesting because I had she made this whole video because I criticized her for treating history like an apologist. And so, in response to that, she decided to have an <laughs> apologist on her show. Um, but he made, uh, you know, this. P52, the, the oldest manuscript of the New Testament, is um, it's it's an important it's an important manuscript. Um, it's it's one that uh, that, that continues uh, to 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 generate a lot of discussion uh, and research in scholarly circles. Of course, it's very important for uh, Christians and for Christian apologists in their in their efforts to um, you know to to provide veracity to the uh, New Testament and script tradition. This apologist that she had on her show, I believe his name is Daniel Ray, made the claim on the show because it, it tends to, so it has been dated in the past between uh, about 125 and 170 CE. Every scholar, every papyrologist that I know, every professional in the field is pretty uncomfortable with the earlier side of that date. Hey, there it is. Who's <laughs> that stud in that picture, though? That look at the stud. <laughs> I, have a, I have a jigsaw puzzle, a P fifty two jigsaw puzzle that I got from uh, the Rylands Library. So, so it's definitely dated to like sixty A D, right? <laughs> so it, yeah, it, it's it, it, dated in the BCs, I think. I know. Uh, set it closer to the the uh later end of that spectrum after 150 but mm -hmm. you you continue what's common among apologists is to either settle on that that early date 125 i was very surprised to discover from daniel ray and sj's video <laughs> that it might even date as early as the late first century you know but this is this is fairly typical we take you know to take the 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 extreme of a scholarly spectrum and to settle on that whichever side of it best suits your argument or just to even try and push that or extend that beyond what any scholar would responsibly do so this is i mean this is how they work got a super chat here kip if i could ask he says uh scott dude thanks for the super chat he says did you approach anyone from McDowell's ministry for archive footage or comments, clarifications? What excuses do you anticipate from Josh McDowell? If he even engages, by the way, if, if there's any response from him about your, and if you haven't watched the documentary, Kit Davis, search it on YouTube, get his YouTube channel, go check it out. It's just really fantastic. But yeah. Um, so first of all, I don't, I don't think it will get enough attention to, to actually get any kind of response from the McDowell's um, or from, from his ministry or Campus Crusade for Christ, which I believe still oversees the Josh McDowell ministry in, in some fashion. Um, in terms of the sources, no, I, I did not, uh, I did not ever approach uh, Josh McDowell. I didn't, I didn't speak to anybody in the ministry, all the research, was drawn directly from uh, talks that he's given uh, on YouTube, from things that he has published in his own books, and what's been published about him. 
Hmm. So it's all it's all public domain research. It would have been it would have been nice, I think maybe. <laughs> to, I think it would still be. I, I'd welcome a conversation with uh, with him at some point with with more likely his uh, his son Sean because he is he is eighty years old, and when you watch a lot of his more recent stuff, you can see that uh, that age is taking its toll. So, um, in terms of in terms of excuses that I anticipate, I think it's probably within their best interest to ignore it, um, which is which is what I expect to happen. If they ever do come back to engage or respond, probably the I would think the next approach would be to do their best to downplay all oh, it's just you know, it's it's he, he forgot or he, he misremembered some things. Um, you know, he has it, that story down to a, a pat. I don't know how you misremember. I mean, he's like, even in the documentary, he'll go like, and there were a, uh, uh, and he does this little uh, even he does the whole everything the same kind of way he says it, even like, and uh, there were at least uh, three people. Like, he acts like he doesn't even know, but he does but he, act. He's just recalling. Time. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but he didn't remember which museum it was. Yeah. Well, how many countries he went to? I mean, maybe yeah. God just revealed that to him after the fact. God was like, you know, this is a pretty powerful story. It's converting a lot of people, so I'm just going to grant him his memory of the the Middle East that he actually went to that he couldn't remember the previous time he told the story. The but I mean, wasn't that like? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was going to say, and then you go the the museum that he is actually referring to, where he had his epiphany. Um, is uh, a rather famous evangelical reading room in London, um, and they have. Is it at Oak there. Hill? Oak Hill Theological Seminary? Is it around there? Or I don't think that's Should... it. I know reading room is definitely in the name. So um, I, I I had looked at it. It's in my notes somewhere, but they don't have any. They don't have any manuscripts of any kind. Um, they do have uh, a. A nice collection of some out of print nineteenth century books, but um, yeah. So that's that's the that's the museum library. Go ahead, Stuart C. Thank you for the super chat, and Henry M. Thank you so much for the super chat. It says thanks uh, for all the amazing work you guys are destroying the biggest myths ever. You know, I don't know if we're destroying. I would say I, I like I like I get what you're saying here in the super chat, but I just want to say I think what we're doing is getting people to see. I love what you're doing here, Kip, because you're pointing out this man, this big, this popular, this well-known, this myth that he has built of his own life and narrative. It's like escaped everyone's notice. I mean, you're the first one that I know of, not that's taking jabs at his idea of the first century um, ideas, but that is doing a documentary specifically. But I could be wrong. Is there a documentary exposing this uh, previous to you? There is a somebody wrote about this at one point, um, and published uh, a book about um, um, conversion stories uh, of apologists. McDowell was featured in there. It was uh, I encountered it probably almost ten years ago when I started working on this research project. I can no longer find it and. At the time, because it was sort of, it was sort of a, a, a I, I hadn't gotten serious about this. I wasn't really taking uh, detailed enough notes, so I don't even know what the book was called. And I've been looking and looking, and I can't, I can't find it again. Mm. So, if anybody knows uh, what I'm talking about, please let me know because it's something that I, 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 you know, I wanted to read. Um, I, I think it's important. There, you know, it's, uh, yeah, please let me know. Um, if I could use an example of my past drug history, when I got clean, I tried to attribute this to like the divine, right? Like you, like I was at the brink of death. And when I first got clean, like I'm having this talk to myself the whole time, I'm dying of heroin, right? So I'm like, uh, I need help. I can't do it. So I said this prayer. And I start to build up my own confidence and I've got family who's supporting me and stuff like that. Well, over the next course, I'd say of a month, 
I went to the gas station to get my specific pack of smokes at the time. I still smoked marble menthol black 100s. I'll never forget. Um, and um, I pick up the pack of smokes and on the front page of the newspaper, it said like heroin epidemic sweeping North Carolina. People are dying of heroin. And I remember like, I didn't bump into this magazine, this, this newspaper on accident. Like this newspaper is reflecting my life. Like I had read into it right now. Heroin is a freaking horrible thing that really is an epidemic everywhere right now. It's crazy. Everyone's hooked on heroin. It's been that way for like five, 10 years. As far as I know, it could have been longer than that. But anyway, my story mattered and what I saw, what met, what counted to me. So I remember that. And then I go to work at this car wash and I go to a, clean some trucks at a certain company and then got hired at that company, solar panel company, renewable energy, went to the same gas station, marble menthol black 100s, boom, on the front page of the newspaper, there's solar panels. And I said, oh my gosh, God is trying to. It was 6.30 on a Friday night and you remember <laughs> just sort of leaning back and rubbing your eyes and saying, it's true. Yeah, It's true, it's true. <laughs> Right. Exactly the point. And you know what's amazing? I, I had it all like I would tell the story when I go to AA because I went to Alcoholics Anonymous and NA, but I'd go to AA mostly. And I'd tell the story. I even went and did a speaker meeting. And this narrative I painted of myself and how I got clean was like biblical. I mean, like you were like, uh, Derek, you accidentally walked on water and you didn't notice that you were, you know, like that's how narrative was I made my own getting clean when I fact checked myself and actually went and saw the dates and stuff. No, no, I was way off. I conflated memory and made it into this narrative. And so I wonder if Josh McDowell's, I'm trying to grant him some type of uh, honesty here. When I say if he's conflate conflating his internal uh, conflict here with what we're finding out here in criticism on Christianity, because he has a bias here and he's finding a way to build this narrative within himself. If that makes sense. I, th I think that there's some of that stuff going on. And I think that that it's even more interesting because you can attribute then a common cause, right? To when you see, well, why do people get on board with what Joseph Smith has to say? Ooh. Why do people get on board with what this Muhammad guy has to say? Why do people get on board with what this Paul guy has to say? Why do people get, you know, like you, you can do all of this, all of this stuff. And I think one of the, um, a, a really good attempt at sort of um, doing this, which cites all the relevant kind of psychological stuff that's to do with um, like um, how our perceptions will like alter the way that we come to experience an event in the first place, um, how like memory biases and distortions will affect like retelling and stuff after the fact is actually in James Fodor's book that he wrote addressing uh, William Lane Craig's miracle claims thing, Unreasonable Faith. So he, he goes through basically and offers, because what Craig does is he offers like the minimal facts argument and goes, well, here's an explanation for the, for, you, you know, that it's the resurrection. That's the most probable explanation. So James just goes, well, I'm going to accept all of those, but then also grant what our best sciences tell us about, uh, and he lists like um, like each of these bullet points that he, he puts in here is like a different study about um, either the ways that like perceptions of it have people coming to something with a perception has caused them to, you know, like believe that their son is alive after they've been dead for 30 years and things like that. Um, people all, like retelling stories over time where they just completely change the narrative and distort them. And it's, it's really, really well evidenced that people do do this stuff. Yeah. And I think um, I... I, I mean, like, the reason that I say this book's interesting is because at the end, there's, like, this list of all these references that you can dig into if you're interested in, like, you know, so sourcing what the science actually has to say about it. And the reason that that's interesting is because it happens all the time. Like, you don't have to attribute that these people are going to their deaths over beliefs or, you know, building careers out of it because they really don't believe it and they're just evil people or whatever. We're just crap at forming true beliefs and we buy our own like bullshit basically and we yeah. you know we get all caught up in crazy things that are happening and then it, yeah <laughs> if i could uh, i got a significant super chat that i really want to read thanking someone like uh mr ian firth thank you so much once again gave me a significant super chat it says uh i decided to go to bible college because of josh mcdowell's books the man is liar and bs artist wasted five years because of this man's bs thank you so much Derek, kip josh and Henry, 
Henry. I think uh, I think you mean Nathan. But it's okay. I mean, I can go with Henry for fifty-five dollars. If you send another five dollars, <laughs> <not okay. laughs> but send it to Nathan. It's okay. You know he didn't mean to. You know he didn't mean to. So, oh. anyways, uh, yeah, no, I you apologize. Know, go ahead. Sorry. I was going. I noticed one. There was a somebody. I think it's uh, X Music had uh, mentioned earlier that they knew someone who ghostwrited for or ghost wrote. I don't know what the what the how how the correct usage of the verb is who ghost wrote uh mcdowell's evidence in advance of verdict and i think it's worth mentioning here um the full story behind that book and this is actually this is told uh in uh the biography that i was i was pretty dependent on there was a biography written about josh mcdowell in 1982 called uh josh the excitement of the unexpected and uh in that book uh what actually happened was Josh was was a he was like a regional campus crusade for Christ speaker in Latin America and was traveling and visiting all these different universities and doing these talks and getting into debates with students and professors and started, you know, jotting down notes about, you know, the best way to respond to people and then decided the best thing to do with this is to tr is to crowdsource the research. So. He went to Campus Crusade for Christ, and Campus Crusade for Christ went to a whole bunch of different uh, uh, evangelical colleges and seminaries throughout the United States, and they did all the research hmm. and collected all the evidence uh, that ended up going into the first printing of evidence that demands a verdict. And you'll notice on the first edition from 1972 that it is not evidence that demands a verdict authored by Josh McDowell. It is evidence that demands a verdict with, uh, it's like, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly how it says, but it, it might even just say with, with an introduction by uh, Josh McDowell. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, I wanted to, th there's one other thing, Derek, sorry, on this. Please, no, please. Oh, on this on this bit about um about how our memories become our reality um derek you and i've talked about this and i'm sure josh probably um has some has some experience in this too growing up in the church we're kind of we're kind of conditioned and um we're we're uh programmed I, I remember hearing from an early age how important my own personal testimony was and when i was at uh, a discipleship school in new zealand we actually spent like we actually took time class time to sit down and work out the details of our testimony and people would listen to our testimony and give critical feedback about what they liked and what they didn't like and what we should how we should should handle our own personal story. I, I'm, I'm, re I'm hesitant to say how we should, what sorts of changes we should make because I don't remember it being couched in those sorts of terms. But it was very adapted, much, adapted to yeah. the situation. Yes, yes. But we worked hard on it, and I'm kind of like because I know Nathan, you you sort of came into the faith later as a as a teenager. I, I suspect that your experience is a little bit different, but I'm on, I'm interested to hear if you had any like like if you have any any um any thoughts about uh, or if you had any experiences while going through your Christian conversion about the importance of your testimony and what to do with it. Oh, de like definitely um I mean, I think in terms of things that would have got me over the line in terms of being a professing Christian as well, like there was there was a big expectation, for example, that people who were to be accepted into the church would it some not like give like a big a big speech or anything, but would at least at some point like come to the front during a service and it'd be like, oh, this is a new member of our church. Tell us what it's like. Because I remember when I started going, you know, there'd be say a couple of these people, like one of them was a nurse, and it was like, well, it's got to be difficult being a nurse in the world. World, right and it was like yeah you know people go out partying and they talk to each other about sex and stuff and i can't do that because i'm in the world but not of it things like that yeah and it like now it's kind of like funny because but you know at the time i'm like i think i'm learning uh, uh what the acceptable in-group 
behaviors and ways of like thinking about the world are right and um and definitely it what initially initially as i started going to like christianity explored sessions and things would have seemed kind of weird for me to say you know i was like well i think maybe there's like a god that stands behind what's going on in my life or something but i mean to connect it to like Jesus or say this really specific stuff, like he cares if you're drinking like bread and wine and stuff like that, that seems weird. And then just over time, those beliefs that like, it's like, oh, that's the stuff you just have to say, because when you're not saying that about God, then like, it's like, oof, you know, like the, you get the horrible feelings from the people that like, that's how I have processed um, why I adopted like a Christian theology over time. Cause I don't think I was ever just like, um, really convinced that this theology follows from like a bunch of like axioms about that i think are true about the world and then you get like christian theology i don't think it's anything like that at all um i mean and and someone who's a christian could obviously say well god revealed it to me and that's what that was it wasn't actually the social press and things but i think it's the social pressures and things and in i was just um browsing through um some of the things in james's book i mean there's a bunch of bullet pointed studies here that he was talking about with um where there's like numbers of people that were asked in these studies to like watch a news clip, for example, and then they'd like recall it later. And 36% had like false memories of what had happened. Um, another study to do with like um, a shooting incident and stuff and a load of people forming false memories. And I think the studies that he's citing, he says that the um, rich false memories are usually um, created by increasing the processing requirements of participants in these studies. And I think that I mean, if I if I think back, for example, to um, like my my conversion experiences and things, and where wh how I would have like retold that story to myself, I would have been like, oh, that was weird. I felt a bit guilty today in today's sermon, and then maybe two weeks later, I'm talking about how it was like the Holy Spirit impressing on because I'd been sort of taught by the community how to reframe and what co concepts to use to talk about the experience that I'd just had. If I like share, you know, that in prayer, I felt like a bit of guilt about. And it'd be like, oh, that's sin, right? It's guilt about your sin and the holiness of God and coming into the presence of the presence of the spirit. And it, it's like none of that was a part of the experience. It's just how you're being. T and then but then that retelling of the story like affects the way. And, and when I think all the crap that was going on in my life at the time, you know, like I, I had like my first proper job. I had a university degree on the side. I was like training. All that. I wasn't getting enough sleep, uh, all sorts of problems that are going on with my like capacity to really rationally assess and process what's going on in the situation and you yeah, couldn't sorry. sleep at night yeah yeah i couldn't say the questions kept me up at night and then i, I thought want, it's true it's no i want to share with you guys something cringy here all right this is me on youtube if you didn't think that i was a professing christian or you think i was fake listen to this 15 minutes and tell me there's not absolute sincerity here right just to give you guys a taste and let you guys realize, like, I'm calling myself out. <laughs> oh, damn. That's okay. dirt with the, with the beard. This is me Look in at front the of beard. a Baptist church. I was a Reformed Calvinist at the time, but I was speaking Humiliate to a chap. Uh, selfishness, Lord. Ca and Baptist church. Destroy my pride. Let this message touch people and move in a way that people apply in their life what Christ taught and commanded. I'm praying, right? Lord, like, you're, you're is that good. fake? You weren't ever one of us. <laughs> Bro, I was from the heart right here about to share the darkest shit I had ever done prior to my conversion, stealing from my parents, lying and all this, and how God had reached down and had changed a man like me. And I mean, I had people crying when I got done with this testimony. All you got to do is search it, okay? And I'm telling you, I was mistaken. I was applying it to things. Sure, there was some wonderful stuff, right? There's some good things that, that come from the teachings that you can find in Christianity, but I was applying them dogmatically to an experience that I attached to ancient papyra translated into English, not having a damn clue about its original anything. And I just believed it wasn't that it was true for why I believed in terms of evidence. It was because I experienced something amazing. And I, I can almost bank that's exactly what Josh McDowell did. He had an experience when he went to church, something happened. Next thing you know, he's given sermons when his testimony says he's out here in the Middle East and in Europe and in Scandinavia or Switzerland. I can't even get the countries right. He can't get them right. So, I, you know, you can't blame me if he can't get them right. 
<laughs> Actually, if if you do listen to them back to back to back to back to back like I did, he almost he gets them all. They're all the same countries. It's uh, United States, England, Germany, Switzerland, France, or sorry, France, Switzerland, and the Middle East. And the Middle East was added later. But uh, but he does a pretty good job of making sure that 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 order is fixed. And those those countries are there. It's a good thing you turn that off, Derek, because I think after two minutes, I might have uh, yeah, I might have converted back. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, hey, know, oh, go ahead, Josh. Hey, sorry, I was going to say, just if you share my screen for a second, I can make it worse. Oh, oh no. no! Hold on! <laughs> oh yes, I can make my own decisions. I can think for myself. I know what to do because Dad has trained me to do it. You're better than I am at this. Way better. You go give a man a fish. You got to give him a fish the next day, right? But what do you do? You get the pole and say, let me show you how to do this. Your job is to teach your son and your daughter how to fish, not give them. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Yeah. That's some life wisdom right there. I mean, it's like, I don't want to, it's, it's not like bad, bad stuff in terms of the content, but it, it is like, it's interesting knowing you, like you, the person now. And that's just like any, um, like almost like it could be like Steven Anderson or, you know, like. Thank you for making him the first one that came to your mind. I was just about to say, when you said his name, I was pissed. It could have been oh, like God. Hitler, anybody. I can it's never the, forget that guy. He's the pisseth against the wall guy. It's the yeah. ill-fitting suit, I think, that that uh, draws those memories. Did you get that at Mr. Big and Tall? I. Oh no, I'm just being silly. He said he has the finger, the preacher finger point, you know, he's getting into it. And he's like, see, I didn't have those skills at the time I gave that testimony. It was, uh, you know, you have some serious skills, by the way. I, it'd be very hard to compete with you. The stage presence, you know, the the walking around, the, um, there's like a, a kind of a, a aggression there, like a 100%. With you have. So Go Josh, ahead. was that at the was that the church that you were that you were pastoring? Because you pastored for a time, didn't you? Yeah, seven years. Wow. Mm. If you guys want to watch that in full, it's on our channel. If you type in I'm, Digital Hummer Hobby Sermon, I think is what I typed in. I'm watching. So, but I've there's a, a I mean there's a there's a rush there too. I think because I used to I used to preach. I did some. I was never uh, I was never a professionally employed minister, but I I worked in a church as a student while I was still in seminary. Um, and yeah, there's a there's a rush, and I still get it too when I'm when I'm like giving conference papers or 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 talking in public. Uh, you know, for some of us, the attention is it's it's uh, it's when I was. You know when i was in seminary sorry just <laughs> i i when i took sermon deliveries so we had to take term, sermon prep and then at next semester sermon delivery and i remember there was a small class maybe four of us and we each had to give our sermon to the rest of the class and this guy got up and he started his message and he he did this so if we turn here in the gospel of matthew one of the things that we see is he needed for like 20 minutes. He just, and so, and so that's, that's and so uh, Dr. Quick, uh, at the end, he got up and he said, all right, John, um, it was really good. But I, I think I ask for everyone, what are these? You know, in my college, I went to an evangelical Christian college and they had a public speaking class. I've got some recordings on my channel, my other channel that I don't even check anymore, Derek, the number four, God, 777. So if you're interested in ever finding me, you can see my my wild, crazy butt there. And what's the 777, by the way? Next, that... My favorite number was seven, and I just I had it three times. But uh, here's another. Let's see if, it, if you can hear it or not. Let's see if I come close to Dr. Josh. I don't think I can quite right compete there. with him. Can God, you guys hear that? Why was Paul mm -hmm. the apostle of Jesus Christ? Because he chose to go and follow Jesus? Look or did that Jesus beard. knock him down on the road to Damascus and said, you are mine? Okay, I'm talking about predestination. I'm giving a lecture on Ephesians 1, but they wanted it in a sermon format. That was but good, yeah. man. Yeah, I was talking about how there's a this whole like 
uh, parents adopted a child who's getting made fun of by the biological children and the kids are mocking her. She's crying. And finally, grandma whispers in her ear. She goes back and she starts laughing when they mock her. Like, what are you laughing about? See, mom and dad have to put up with you, but they chose me. And it was all about predestination and election and all that. It was all a, a sermon type thing. But anyway. Oh, that's, that's terrible. Dr. Josh is going to pull out one where he's <laughs> he's going to smoke me. I'm not even coming close I, to competing with you, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> I feel like I now have to show this. This is my, this is my, uh, my good news Bible. And the reason I have this, this was the award I got when I was in uh, Bible college for preaching class. I won the uh, I won the sermon award, and uh, yeah, it's it's inscribed there. You can see it. I think that's <laughs> what is that? December twelfth, nineteen ninety. Oh, don't eight? look at that. That's it looks like funny. eight. <laughs> is that <laughs> right? <laughs> 1994. I remember oh, okay. I was very disappointed that it was a. It was a it was a good news translation <laughs> of the Bible. <laughs> and the reason they gave out a good news translation for the award, I was told, was because they were fairly confident that it was a translation that no students actually owned. So <laughs> that <gosh>. you know <laughs> it's one that we could potentially use. So you gotta go, Doctor Josh. Go. So. Sorry, I just got a text. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, man, tell tell Megan we love her, and I hope everything's going well. I'll try and make another visit up there sometime after October, probably because awesome. I've got so much, so many trips, and I'll be seeing you yeah. at the conference. Better. That's right. So for anyone watching, three hundred fourteen of you, Oz is going to have a, a conference that is be ho being hosted. Uh, Doctor Josh is going to be there. Uh, Seth Andrews, uh, Anthony Magnum Bosco, T Jump, yep. wow. yeah, and I will be there recording. So, uh, hope I make it in time because I'm coming straight from Princeton University, and I'm going to try and make it there after interviewing awesome. uh, Bill Allison. So, yeah, nice. thanks, Josh. Wow. Thank you for joining. Thank us. you, guys. Yes, yeah, awesome it, documentary. It was great, Kip. Thank you. Your preaching Thanks. is better than guys. mine by far. Dude. I love you. And the, <laughs> your preaching was better than the documentary too. So, yeah. <laughs> Michael McLinden, uh, let me do this for our screen so we don't look funny. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope I said your name right. Thank you for the super chat. He says, part of the thing that built my cognitive dissonance was consuming better constructed fictional stories that held together better than Christianity. Mm. Hmm. Star Trek. Game of Thrones fan here, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Well put. Um, thank you. So definitely. What did we not touch on that this documentary goes into? I, well, I one thing I... to circle back on, just on, on the question that Dr. Kit brought up, though, I, I do think that there is there's there's an expectation as a Christian to have a conversion testimony, right? Like that's like about how Jesus sort of turned your life around. And I think it's just worth highlighting how that expectation from within Christianity, if you if you want to be any kind of um, public facing figure for the faith as well, or even not pu public facing is necessarily talking to non Christians, but even talking to other Christians, it's you're going to have to kind of have this like backstory about how God, in His providence, interacted in your life to kind of specially intervene, make you a Christian, and then have you doing whatever it is that you're doing now. I, th I think there is an expectation there. I mean, maybe some healthier denominations or whatever, like do what they can to take away that pressure and i think that that's probably affected the way that he's kind of coming to process his own story because he's like well you know i tell you what's better than working a nine-to-five job is being an apologist and i mean he's not thinking in those terms right but <laughs> in terms of the options that life's laying out for him and as he kind of comes to go down this avenue it's like well i better have a special story then i've got, like there's this expectation like why does god care about me why and then it's like well because you know he through his providence he handed me these documents and that and maybe he does really he's come to kind of believe that over time you know it wouldn't surprise me i think I think Josh McDowell is a product like he had a he had a traumatic upbringing. I think that's clear. The you know he he talks at length about having an abusive alcoholic father and being poor and you know and and his 
his frustration as a child definitely contribute to what happened to him to change his life. And I think, you know, we can we can probably all agree that it was a change for the better. Um, what is really instructive? Because I sort of fall into the same camp. Um, if you actually go and you can find it on YouTube, you can search out. It's worthwhile checking out um, Josh's son, Sean McDowell's testimony. Because he very much like me, I didn't, you know, I grew up in the church. I, I had a very, very stable family life. We were, you know, we were middle class, upper middle class. You know, I, there was nothing, there was no, um, there was no dark night of the soul for me growing up. And this always did bother me uh, mm. as a Christian. And when it came to the importance of your personal testimony. So when Sean actually tells his story it resonates with me but then one other thing something else that's interesting is in um in contextualizing his own story he also draws from his father's testimony and then also repeats a lot of the same fabric obvious fabrications outright lies that uh, that have now become part of the uh, I, what I would call the you know the Josh McDowell doctrine about his upbringing. So it's it's definitely it's definitely useful. It's interesting to go back and uh, and take a look at this. It is so interesting. You reminded me, and this isn't in testimonies, but yes, we were trained at the college to really practice that testimony. And he was teaching us the different versions of speech. And one of the ones I made was a pathos speech, which purely emotional. So he's like, I want you to come up with the most emotional thing you can. You have all rights to do whatever you want when you come back to class to do it. And then one was purely logic. So you couldn't use emotion. It had to be just information and to see the impact that different versions of speech had. And I went home. It was the easiest speech I had to make. I talked about hungry kids in Africa. I went on Google. I looked up African kids rib cage showing. I'm not even kidding. And I found in the arms of an angel song. I attached it to the simple thing. I went in and I hit play. I mean, it's not the right place to laugh, but in the arms <laughs> of the angels. and it's all going right. And I'm like, do you see this? I'm not even saying anything like intellectual or anything. I say, do you see this? You probably ate before you came here tonight. And like I did it and manipulated him by the end. I had this thing. He said, you need to have like a catchphrase at the end to catch people and make them interested in buying into what you're trying to do. And it was just like adopt the child program for like $10 a month. And you can get this little like letter from someone sent from Africa saying, this is your adoptive adopt a child type of program. And this is your child over in Africa or Asia or whatever. And people actually did it. And I just was trying to pass a class. People actually bought it. So it was like I purposely used manipulative it at a Christian college and it was successful and the people wanted to do it. So I definitely don't doubt that Josh McDowell seeing big bucks coming in and his testimony has found ways to utilize different things as time goes by, as he built his myth and he's catching more people in. And the testimony of Robbie Zacharias, we've heard it. Nobody says it better than me than Pine Creek. I'm sorry. Pine Creek just, he did one of the better versions of this conversation pointing out when he was a kid, he tells a story about how he was going to commit suicide because he couldn't compete with his family on the academic side of things. Later down the road, he has two fabricated PhDs. Why? Because he thought he was dumb or subconsciously wanted to appear smart. And you're one of those professors I, I won't name in the Zoom chat. That we talked about. Well, if you want to talk about that? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, Dana, Dana Rianlande, um, actually, she touched on this right in our um, in in the the scholarly interaction after the after the film. She she talked about um, about the the uh, persona that McDowell wanted to project, and I totally agree with this. I I think this comes through pretty clearly. Josh McDowell is not a scholar, but he really, really, really wants to be one. And he wants to be taken seriously by scholars. So what better way to fulfill 
that um i guess that that uh that wish that desire than just to insert yourself into scholarship right. um to to turn your to turn i mean it's i it's honestly it's ridiculous the way that he uh he talks about his own experience with manuscripts the he you know the the pictures that he took of all the all the new testament fragments came from a an event that he happened to be in attendance of at baylor university even to this day he presents that as i have all these manuscripts and scholars are coming to help me you know they're i'm not i'm i'm good at I'm good at this kind of stuff, but I'm not an expert. So, you know, they're coming to, to help me out. That's, it's not, it's not true. Um, he was in a, he happened to be there at Baylor university when they were doing this. There were like 40 people in the, in the lounge. Uh, I, I think it's the, uh, the antiquity department lounge there that they, they perform this, this, uh, um, mask, uh, dismounting. And actually, what's really interesting when you read the uh, the article in the Atlantic, Ariel Sabar talks to Jeff Fish, who's a uh, a professor at Baylor, and he says, you know, um, he noticed that the guy who was who was overseeing this event, Scott Carroll, uh, had the the Egyptian money mask there by the by the sink, and he also pulled out a bunch of manuscript fragments. And set them right there beside the sink before he had dismounted it. And as he was, you know, dismounting it and pulling things off, these fragments that he had already brought to the event ahead of time ended up getting, you know, thrown in. So the impression is made that they're there for this historic discovery of stuff. Which is why I said in the in the film I, I didn't go into details about it, but I said you know it's all it was all just a big ruse. It was a hoax. It was a it was a show. But McDowell still plays this up as yeah. as him being sort of the focus of attention. This is his mask. These are his manuscripts. He's intricately involved in the discovery process, and I think maybe the uh, the peak of ridiculousness in this whole scenario is at the point where he talks about encountering a manuscript fragment that has actual numbers yeah that yeah on the on on the the top or on the margins and i mean if you know if you know anything about about ancient languages or 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 uh early koine greek there weren't numbers okay yeah, right. cuz they they came they came from uh the, the hindu into the into the arabic uh yeah. and then were and then the, they weren't adopted in the west in the latin system <laughs> oh, because they thought it was satanic years. they thought it's it was not. satanic because of the relationship yet yeah, so. didn't he say in that specific point that this we have the first frat or first document page of one, the iliad or something volume one page one of the iliad by homer that that's is what the, the numbers are <laughs> Yeah, you like know, he, uh, oh my the, gosh! What one of the <laughs> things that didn't make it into my into my uh, into my my collection of clips in the documentary I made, but it's in the same video that's on Vimeo. He says uh, he shows pictures of a manuscript that has some red uh, red ink on it, and he says this is a <laughs> this is a red letter New Testament, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> which is my. which is patently absurd it's absolute <laughs> nonsense so he just like he kind of makes you can see it when you get to sort of know him and you get to know uh, you know his style and what he does and you watch enough of him you can see when he's kind of making this stuff up on the fly and maybe that's his great gift right yeah he's, he's a showman and he's a publicist and he's larger he's than life yeah 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 i've seen, I've seen the same thing with uh like other apologists and other things as well. So um, one of the bad apologetics episodes we did on the near-death experiences, there was this one case that Gary Habermas always talks about, which the original source for it was a documentary, right? So there's a documentary yeah. on near-death experiences and in it, a doctor reports an account that a patient had, that a patient told him of a near-death experience in the documentary. So that's like the primary source. Um, 
And it's something like the per the person reports being up, you, you know, like they say they were up and they were above some sort of machine. And th those are like the details. And then we watch like Gary Habermas over time retell this NDE story. And he's like, you know, when she's up there and she's thinking, where the hell am I? And she looks down and there's this machine and there's these riveted numbers in the front. And then, you know, they check the numbers and the, the numbers, are, and he adds in all these details that just weren't there over time. And I think that this is a common thing. I mean, like yeah. I, I would, I, I will fall prey to this sort of thing in my life as well. But I think we when we're it, in yeah. those, and yeah, we've got to acknowledge those environments where there's like expectations on us to like deliver a kind of like narrative, right? And, and then we've got to be aware of those sort of things going on. And the problem is that in those circles that there, there just isn't that, there can't be that because of the carrot and stick hell heaven in group out group stuff. Like, yeah. Well put. Yeah. Real quick. Um, Scott Duke super chatted us a while back and I haven't asked yet. Yes. Uh, Dr. Kip, what is your opinion about McDowell's harmonization of creation accounts in Genesis one and two? And I think, I think it's the same as the typical apologist would try to argue, but how do you take down that, that uh, harmonization? Of Genesis I would, uh, I would say go and check out my, uh, my video response to SJ Thomason that I did where I, I address this directly. And I think, if I can, I, I don't know offhand what, what McDowell, um, uh, what either one of the McDowell's do with uh, Genesis 1 and 2, but I'm guessing that it, it rides on, on the, the interpretation of uh, Genesis chapter 219, where, uh, the, uh, where God um, create, he has created the man, Adam, and then he decides there's, you know, he needs a suitable helper for him. And his immediate response is to create animals. And he brings the animals to, to the man uh, to see what he will name them. That's Genesis 2.19. Uh, the common evangelical response to that is to say that, well, since there's no formal version of the true perfect verb in Hebrew, you can translate this. Hey, look, he's back. Uh <laughs> Just talk, talking about Genesis two nineteen, Josh. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So the common evangelical response to this is that because there's no formal, uh, formal version of the pluperfect in biblical Hebrew, you can translate this phrase, you know, and God created the uh, all the animals out of the dust of the ground. You can translate that as a pluperfect. So what that means is you can translate it as God had already at a point some at some point in the past before Adam, because we're, we're harmonizing this with Genesis one, he had created all the animals uh, out of the dust of the ground. Um, Josh had pointed out to, uh, to SJ at one point that you can't, you can't really translate the verse like this because you know, it's simple. It's simple Hebrew narrative with the Bob consecutive. She actually went on the uh, on great the, video, uh, by the way. Oh, the Michael Brown, the line of uh, fire. Yeah, he, yeah. He went on. She went on the 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 line of fire with uh, with Doctor Michael Brown and asked him about this, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, no, that's no problem. You can you can translate it like that. There's no problem at all. So you know, it doesn't present a, a direct uh, contradiction with Genesis one. The real problem." with that explanation is that there are in fact ways in biblical hebrew to express the pluperfect if you want to and in my video i illustrate uh, two maybe three different ways where if the the writer of the genesis 2 story really wanted to indicate that this was something that had happened before the creation of adam he could have done so um and to add even more uh, more fuel to this little campfire that I'm building here, there is an example. There are actually two examples within the story, within the Genesis chapter 2 story, where there are pluperfect expressions that the author has gone and intentionally changed the verbal form in order to illustrate clearly. I'm talking about something that happened in the distant past. And what's happening in Genesis 2.19 is absolutely not that. So I'm guessing this is how the McDowells would, would provide uh, their, their spin on the Genesis, on, on uh, reconciling the two creation stories. 
And I'm going to continue to say it simply does not work. It doesn't work syntactically. It doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work in terms of how the how how the the two stories are formulated and what what are the the priorities and the goals in each story. They're just quite completely different stories. Now he um, might find an original copy of Genesis uh, sometimes in a mummy mask yeah. from the fifteenth. How how oh this goes way back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how you would date that, but either way, he'll find out. He'll find the original, and then he'll. You know, it. go ahead, Josh. I was just going to say, just quickly, like a good example, I think, of this sort of thing is that, like, if I said I did, if you ask me, "Hey, did you do your homework?" and I say I did, the <clears throat> if I just wrote I did and I didn't have any punctuation or anything, you could theoretically say well maybe he's asking a question like i did um mm -hmm. and so you know it, it's it, like it's possible with tonal inflection or something uh but english has a really good way of doing that if i wanted to ask it as a question i would reverse the word order right and i would say did i yeah which and it, so then you could write it you wouldn't have to have punctuation you wouldn't have to have tonal inflection but you could theoretically argue well, I mean, if we don't have any tonal inflection, if we know all we have is like a transcript without any punctuation, maybe he asked that as a question. The problem is that like that's not how this that's not how this works, right? If we have a context where it says, "Did you do your homework?" <clears throat> and then the next sentence says, I, "I did." And then after that he says, "Good, can you turn it in now?" Well, then, you know, tonal inflection, none of that stuff doesn't matter because the context clearly tells you which one it's supposed to be. Um, and, it, and you, you yeah, go ahead. And yeah. in, the, in the Genesis 2 story, you know, it's the, there's such a, there's such an obvious logic here, right? <laughs> it's so obvious what's going on. God did not make a suitable helper for Adam. Let's create the animals. Let's bring them to Adam. He names them. God's response. I still haven't found a suitable uh, helper for Adam. It's just, how can it's, you put? Yeah, you like I don't. It's it just when you when you oh hey buddy, Oliver, dude, what's up, man? Can you say hi? Hi. Hi. <laughs> hey. All right. Do you miss me? He can't hear you. Do you miss Derek? Uh, oh, he can't. Do you miss Derek? But I can't hear Miss Derek. Yeah, you can't hear Mr. Derek. That's true. Yeah. I would just say bye. Bye. Just say bye. bye. All right. That he's awesome. That dude. is a spectacular head of hair. Yeah, it is. That is. He's that's... still living in the Garden of Eden in that house, though. He hasn't <laughs> ate from any fruit, right, Josh? Not yet. I mean, he 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 has eaten a lot of fruit. There's no question. It's not the wrong one yet. He just doesn't know he's naked yet. That's that's all. That's all. Well, I just I haven't brought in somebody to tempt him with the thing that I've told him not to do, and then to leave him alone. Oh man. Um, what, is is he one of those ones that's uh, you know just destined as a, a clay for destruction, or is he? Unfortunately, uh, yeah, yeah, it's how I had to make him. But yeah, but it breaks my heart that I had to make him that way. Because you can't have free will and He's not awesome. have him be a vessel of destruction. So, I yeah. can I, I I'd like to shift gears here a little bit and sort of go back. I know Nathan had mentioned this earlier, but I really think something that that requires more attention and more discussion is is the is the actual like manuscripts themselves. And something that I I, I I'm trying to do several things within the documentary, and one of the things I'm I'm trying to do is is to is to talk with regards to the manuscripts to show how you know in the first place how difficult it is working with with uh, original ancient manuscripts in another place um, how careful we have to uh, we have to be when we're handling these things and how susceptible these things are also to politicization to propaganda. I recently wrote an uh, wrote an article for uh, uh, for um, an encyclopedia about the uh, history of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the way that I I constructed my own 
telling of the history of the Dead Sea Scrolls was around uh, the creation of the state of Israel, because there is a there is a perfect modern day example of a an important manuscript of important manuscript find that has been dramatically politicized uh, in the in the formation of the state of Israel in the uh, in the propagation of uh, of modern Zionism, and of course in, in in Christian Zionism, and it's a very similar thing that that McDowell is doing when he's when he's talking about ancient manuscripts. He's recontextualizing them and he's telling stories about them in a way that uh, that feeds into his own agenda, into his own into his own narrative. And I think it's neat too. One, just one other thing, the, uh, the Oxyrhynchus collection of, uh, of Egyptian papyri at the, at the university of Oxford, where the so-called first century mark, which turned out to be a third century, uh, manuscript fragment where that was, um, that was where that came from. Uh, people should know that that is, that is an, it, in an, it's an enormous collection of, uh, papyri. I believe, to date, and it's been a hundred years. They they discovered this a hundred years ago, and to date, only five percent, maybe ten percent, of the entire collection has even been looked at by scholars. Mm -hmm. So there's just, I mean, there's so 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 much out there still um, to learn and and to know about uh, what happened. And maybe I, I I doubt it, but maybe. Maybe there is a, a a copy of a first century, a first century copy of a of a gospel in the Oxford collection somewhere. I'd I'd laugh if we found one and then we come to find out Marcion was right all along or something. Oh, you know, then no it's kidding, like yeah. it's, it's Mark sixteen, first century Mark sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, first century Mark sixteen ends in verse right. eight. Oh yeah. snap! No, and there's some Christians. Something too, else yeah. I think that's kind of interesting too. I think it's fairly interesting that the earliest New Testament manuscripts we have, for some coincidence, all come from the Gospel of John, which was supposedly the uh, the latest of the uh, of the Gospels to have been written. I just think it's interesting. It is, and that's the earliest fragment. We have of the P52, and it's like, eh, this is supposed to be the latest. Uh, it's hard to know. Mitch uh, has a super chat. He says, ask Dr. Kip if he covered the chronology TikTok of Josh McDowell's conversion and the published date of his book. I think that might be instructive and shed some light on how his narrative came to develop. The, that does sound interesting. I'm not on TikTok, unfortunately. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should join mitch yeah yeah mitch needs to tell me more about this i don't know if you can email tiktok videos but if you can email it to me and i'll forward it over to kip or something like that it'd be fine yeah that's awesome so look into it because your documentary is awesome so if you haven't watched kip's documentary when we're done if you really want to watch something that I, it really was stimulating i enjoyed it and um i encourage everyone to go check it out keith uh Gardek, thank you for the super chat, my friend. Says enough of the jeezy peasy stuff. We need Dr. Price to engage a thelemite. Ninety three. What's that? What, do you guys know what that is? I'm not sure what a thelemite is. I think it's a character on Star Trek. Ah. I'm kidding. So, so oh, I don't know. <laughs> yes, I mean, I mean, you could have said anything. You wanna... <laughs> yeah, right? Literally, I believe you. Like they do Josh McDowell's story. So like you there got. You go. to, you gotta like, you gotta let me know. Oh, it was the manuscript that I was looking at at six thirty on that Friday night. Oh, <clears> I leaned oh, back in my chair. <laughs> Mitch says not to. That it's true. Yeah. He says Mitch vision yeah. TikTok meaning the chronology of events, not the app. <laughs> Hold on, let me go back up here. Pull you up real quick. I'm sorry. If he covered the chronology, chronology of the of the, his, his events of Josh McDowell's conversion. And the published date of his book, I think in the documentary you somewhat do that, but I don't know I if you do it in a sequential order. Like you could really, you know what I mean? 
maybe actually i'm gonna oh i actually i'll show this okay i've got if i can oh no i have too many share the things. screen and i'll, I'll pop it up plugged in so i've actually like i said i had um i had put together like a whole like this this just got out of hand this uh this research project of mine so i i have Thank a you whole for the super chat, guys bunch of uh i i put together like a like a comparison of of texts uh of mcdowell's in order to illustrate like the textual basically the textual criticism of of josh mcdowell's uh story but i also have i put together as best as i could uh, as best as i could muster a uh, a timeline based on um based on i think this is it based on what i read so i will uh okay. oh no that's not hey maybe just give me a just give me a minute to find this and pull well let me just while you do that keith i don't know i feel bad man you super chatted me i appreciate the, the large super chat i want to make sure that i at least make sure you feel like oh i i got what i was you know the attention i needed for that but i don't know what you mean by thelemite and if there's something that takes a while to explain email me you it know I'm like there's a there might be a cult called Thel the cult of thelema um started by alistair crowley you know that guy who uh, is in all yeah i don't know if it's got something to do with that like a level if that's like a level within the cult hierarchies or it has right. something to do with dumbledore calrissian are you making up stuff again? Because it's hard to <laughs> believe you. I don't know if I can believe you this time. Could be either. saying it. <laughs> Once we know he's making up stuff. See, now that you know Josh McDowell has done this, how can you listen to him now? Yeah. Are you gonna just skip everything we say and listen? Touche. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Let me know when it's up because I, I pulled. Uh, Apparently, 93 is a number of significance in Thelema. Um, do what you will. I don't know. I don't want to get into all that. I've been 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 there when I was like 17 or whatever. You know, like. So it's pretty much like kind of Aleister Crowley occult type of stuff. And they're asking Dr. Price because he's all over that stuff in some sense yeah. to uh, debate him. But, you know, Dr. Price doesn't do debates. He told me he he rather dialogue. He's not big on the whole debate thing, so you know. For some reason, Chrome is not allowing me to share my screen. You got so, Google Chrome? That's weird. That's I know I'm I'm on it, but I can my, you do a shared desktop and just go on there, or have you got like sensitive emails and things? Yeah, pornography. No, I have, <laughs> I I have my porn all <laughs> stored in the not porn folder, so we're all safe. There. Oh, okay. I, but, uh, I used to go on the computers at school and like create folders on all of them called not porn and like, you know. Like... It's actually it's actually ridiculous. I mean, Matt, Nathan, you talked about uh, you talked about uh, uh, going to the uh, to the main library at the University of Manchester to read. And I mean, I when I was a PhD student, I was there all the time, and it was always astonishing to me how many students were watching porn <laughs> in the in the library on their personal computers. Well, wow. so, anyways, I'm. Uh... But you uh, muted yourself, Kip. Oh, maybe you meant to. And Derek, Sorry. you've muted yourself. This doesn't yeah. seem to this this doesn't sorry. seem to be happening I'm here. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I can't I can't seem to share my screen for some reason. But I can. I mean, I'll, like as I'm looking through here, here's what I have for a timeline. Uh, Josh McDowell was born. Josh Jocelyn McDowell in Union City, Michigan, on 17th August, 1939. Uh, his sister Shirley in 1945, so when he was six years old, she joined the army and volunteered on the front lines. Between 1945 and 1952, he has talked a great deal about being a victim of sexual abuse. Um, he confessed this abuse to his mother in 1948. 
1951, his oldest brother, Wilmot, sued his own parents and was compensated with an outbuilding he proceeded to move to. They, you know, they owned a farm on the outskirts of town. He says that his brother ran away from home and his sister committed suicide, but he gave no, uh, no dates for that in 1952. So at this point, he's, so he's 21 years old. Uh, he, oh, sorry, no, 39. Okay, so he's 13 years old. He threatened to kill his, uh, his abuser um, when he was 13, and the abuse stopped at that point. That's something else I should probably note. When I was doing my research, I was rather rather alarmed to discover how many times McDowell confessed to or bragged about wanting to kill people. That sounds um, really weird, though. It really Why remember. Is. He actually, he actually says that in, in one of the earlier tellings of his story, he says that he tried to kill his father when he was a, when he was a child or like, like a, like a very young teenager. It, that part got pulled in subsequent retellings of his story, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit disturbing. Um, he graduated high school in 1957. His mother died on the 13th either the 13th of december or the 13th of december it changes in his uh in his retelling um of that same year 1957 he also enlisted in the national guard uh the air national guard that same year 1957 and uh was in basic training for anywhere from six to 52 weeks i couldn't figure that out and he <laughs> Either wow. he was really good or really, really bad at it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything about the military. So uh, something interesting here too to note that um, I, I had made a note of this at, at one point too. He says that while he was in the Air National Guard, he suffered a very severe head injury, um, well, and was uh, well. There you. Oh, is somebody new here? Oh, it's Jim. Hey, Jim. Good to see hey, you guys. So, and I actually, and this is Jim's, Jim's, you know, this is something I wondered about. I'm like, did, uh, what, what, what happened to him as a result of this head injury? What does this, how much does this play into, you know, what happened to him? So that was 1957. In 1958, he enrolled at Kellogg College. And uh, it's, it's interesting too, when he talks about, in his own retelling of his time at Kellogg College, he talks about being in like the school cafeteria or at the student union, encountering uh, this group of All Christian these students and two professors. But yeah, oh so no, he wanted Kellogg... to. Yeah, he wanted to disprove them. Sorry, yeah, that's it. He he's but a skeptic, is... but yeah, exactly. But this is, I think, this is interesting. Kellogg College was founded in 1956, and for the first so, and he was there in 1950. What did I say? 1958. And the, and the first half of 1959. Um, so while he was at Kellogg College, they, you know, there was maybe 30 students, 40 students there. Um, they held classes at like the local high school and the YMCA. Um, they finally got a, like a land endowment in 1959, the same year that uh, McDowell supposedly went on his European excursion, which happened in the summer of 1959. So, or sorry, uh, his it actually happened in 1960. So he he became a Christian in 1959, um, and then uh, in 1960 he went to Europe with uh, with Reverend Carl McIntyre and was like the group speaker in Europe. So he was actually in Europe, uh, I guess, like uh, like giving giving public talks about uh, Christianity and about Jesus. He was, he was essentially preaching and he spent time in uh, looking. He, he was also interested in being a lawyer. So he spent time talking to English barristers and lawyers and looking at libraries, law libraries. So that's 1959. He was, uh, or sorry, that was 1960, but he converted to Christianity on 19th of December, 1959. Uh, in 1960, he transferred to Wheaton College, which is in, uh, Josh, where is Wheaton College? Is that in, uh, I don't remember where that is. It's in, uh, Ohio, I think. 
but uh yeah so i mean that's that that's what i could piece together based on uh based on the 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 bits and pieces that i that i found i was muted the whole time sitting here trying to chat to you okay. right there yeah. um now as you say he drank the kool-aid from there on like it was like he's hooked and that's it um it was and, only a few months though right that's what the yeah so like we're looking at as as far as i can tell um started college in 1958 so september 1958 um by the following december 1959 he has converted so that's probably 15 16 months but he he yeah so he he probably it, yeah it, it was maybe it was probably a year at uh, at best and it's important to note too the uh the earliest retellings of mcdowell's story are that um it was a it was like a paper he was writing like a like a college paper um to refute the claims of Christianity. And it was his research into this college paper and his interactions. I think the interactions with, with college kids, Christian college kids who encouraged him to go to church. Um, that's probably really important. That That's probably more important than anything in his Christian conversion. Cause leading all everything leading up to this. And he talks about it too. He talks about being very angry and he talks about being really traumatized as a kid. So everything leading up to this, it's all trauma. He had a very, very difficult upbringing. He's a, I mean, he's already a damaged person. Uh, you know, I think, I think more than anything, that's, that's what, uh, that's what prompted conversion for him. I agree. I think most of us had that. I don't know. I like the panel here. I think everyone here, yes or no, at one point was a Christian, right? Even you, Dr. Majors. Oh, yeah. Okay. Honest, straight up, like there's nothing, there's no reason to make anything up here. When you were converted, or at some point, even if you were born into the religion, did you have a serious emotional moment at one point where you took it more serious? And it was usually during a sermon or an altar call or something like that that made you go, okay. Just one? I, uh, it's I several. Had, like, like every, I had it's had like every Sunday. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so everybody's had multiple, right? Well, no, I, I wouldn't say every Sunday, like Jim. I don't know that that because well, I, um, but, but, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, of course, I'm being hyperbolic, well, but it, right. It sorry. Yeah, yeah. Summer camp was yeah. big for me, right? I had a. I went through. A, I went through a religious epiphany every summer when I went to uh, when I went to Bible camp. But I mean. I of course I accepted Jesus at the age of four based on the uh, intellectual merits of. Uh, I I tell you what you get you get the right chord progression being repeated over and over again you know that, that sudden key change man everybody will drop to their knees just crying like a baby. Oh, so oh those man. Christmas carols, they're the ones the big, the big traditional hymns you know like uh, "Hark the Herald Angels Sing." Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Jeez, I got a super chat here. Indo asks, good job against Neff, Jim. Can anyone give me any unfulfilled Old Testament prophecies? Like the Nile River drying up? Is that an example? Isaiah 19. Well, Jesus five, returning. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that's not, not, that's not, that's a new, yeah, sorry. Old yeah, Testament yeah, prophecy. Yeah, yeah. Old Testament. Sorry, yeah. give me some, uh, Dr. Old Josh Testament. writes a lot of these uh, in this book right here, actually. Yeah. He goes uh, into that here. I mean, pretty much any any uh, prophecy that's interpreted as a uh, a a future Messiah coming and uh, bringing within peace and the reunification of Israel and the rebuilding of the temple. To, but uh, actually, let me rephrase that to the people who interpret it as Jesus being the Messiah. Um, that's an unfulfilled uh, prophecy. Right. Yeah, and I mean, I think a pretty clear one that everybody agrees on is the entire prophecy of ezekiel 26. Yep. now what, what chapter do you go into that in your book on seven i think daniel, daniel 9 24 through 27. yep 
that's in page 330 onward. Yeah, it's good there. Zechariah 14, I took a look at that actually today and said, yeah, that hasn't happened. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's. <laughs> I just, I think, I know I always say this, but I, I think the Ezekiel one is such a good one. It sounds terrible. But if, if. <laughs> yes, it if failed. We, Are you talking about the you, Holocaust? That one? <laughs> No, 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 no. Ezekiel, he's talking about the one where the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the destruction that is on the, the island. What is the name of the island? Oh, Tyre. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Tyre. Tyre. Yeah. Or Tyre. No, no, no. That's the mainland city. Yeah, right. But the, the thing <laughs> um, is, this, I, this. Go ahead, Kip. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example of a great fulfilled prophecy. Um, Isaiah 40. Sorry, I think. Oh, shoot. Is it 43 or 29 verse 3? A voice crying in oh, the yeah. wilderness. Make go and prepare the way yep. for the uh, the coming of uh, the Lord. Was very clearly fulfilled by the writers and the collectors of the Dead Sea Scrolls when they went out into the, uh, into the Judean desert um, in order to await the arrival of the last days. So all it takes is going out into the desert and cry. Well, it's in the it's in the prophecy, Derek. I know, There's, but I'm just... go into the wilderness yeah. to prepare the way of the Lord. And it says, "Make make straight the way," so that they couldn't turn. Stop! Stop! Stop being silly! You guys are clowns! Oh my god! Look, look, it's seriously hilarious. We have had... I'm not even going there. There are people who have very little demands for critical thinking when it comes to this stuff. Like, it just doesn't expect... They don't expect... That would be a real fulfillment if someone actually is, like, looking at that and go, yeah, yeah, you went out there and cried. And you gotta go... What oh, it's Jim Gunn. But that, uh, that's yeah. why... I think that's why I think that the Ezekiel 26 one is such a a good one for this sort of discussion because it's not it's not really even something but besides the fact that everybody in biblical scholarship agrees on the data points everybody uh liberal scholar or whatever and evangelical scholar alike um but Ezekiel himself talks about how it didn't happen I mean it's like like he says it. He says it's. I mean, it's just a really tough one to get away from. That's why it's so good because even the Bible mm -hmm. itself says Ezekiel got it wrong. We we hear you, Doctor Majors. We hear you. <laughs> oh, that was an accident, by the way. What's the um, Zechariah fourteen one? So, all right, I'll pull it up. Uh, someone asked me. I think Indo is the one that super chatted, and then I'm going to get this next super chat here. Zechariah. 14 and i want to ask if you guys would with me tell me if this is fulfilled i'm gonna read is it this again. the mount this is the mount of olive ones right yeah the coming yeah, day please. of the lord behold a day is coming for the lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst for i will gather all the nations against jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped half the city shall go out into exile but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And on the Mount of Olives shall he split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. You shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. And it goes on. But am I missing something? Did this already happen, guys? It, it, if I remember correctly, this can't be about Jesus because the Lord right. there, that the word being used is Yahweh, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Depends on who you ask, right? Like some, some people will try to argue <laughs> wow. that like there's some I mean, people who... No, but... <laughs> I'm just saying... <laughs> Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say there's an awful lot of conflation when it comes to the name of the name of Yahweh in right. in uh, in the minds of of evangelicals. It's pretty ridiculous. So sorry. I will, oh, Kip, it's actually pronounced Jesus. So <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's, they, they didn't have a J then, Doctor Joshua. It's actually Jesus. Oh man, Jesus. It's even more. <laughs> 
real quick, I Keith. Saying, I, yeah. I want to give it the super chats mm -hmm. uh, real quick. I want to let Keith Gardick know. Email me, Derek at MythVisionPodcast.com, down in the description. If you have a particular concept or something you want me to record with Dr. Price for your super chat, man, I will. And uh, I'll ask him about the synchronicities and stuff. Maybe that can be something. If you have more, you can email me more data and stuff. Thank you for the super chat. And then last of all, big super chat. Stop scamming, man. Thank you so much for the super chat. This question for Dr. Josh. Aside from Sargon of Akkad, were there any other rulers for whom a Moses-style infancy of being set adrift in a river and adopted are found? Like Romulus and Remus, but that's like different from the ancient Near East. Yeah, I mean, as far as the ancient Near East is concerned, I can't think of one. Um, and you know, Sargon, just so everybody knows what we're talking about, like Sargon from the 20, 25th, late 25th century, I think, early 24th, um, 25th. He, uh, you know, he, the legend of his birth uh it, you know his his parents are always mysterious or at least his father is mysterious um but he's set adrift in the river and he's um you know drawn up by aki the water drawer and so i mean you can see that the clear parallels uh between that and what you see in the moses story but this this type of exposure story um, I suspect if, I suspect if we, I mean, again, I don't, I don't know in other cultures, but, uh, there, there probably are more exposure stories that I just don't know about. The only one that I know of that comes even close to this is, uh, uh, uh Romulus and Remus. Uh, they were put into, uh, into baskets. I, I don't know. I don't know if they were put in individual or the same. I, I can't, I don't recall, but they were put in a basket and sent down a river to be, uh, to be saved. I, I don't remember that from the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always remember that bronze like statue of them like suckling on those like wolf titties like <laughs> oh <laughs> dude <yeah. laughs> the mythology is really actually cool there's there's a show you guys remember when um they took uh rome was up in the german uh there was a lot of german tribes and i don't know the name of the show there's a show where they actually capture one of them and they raise one of them uh, some Germanic tribe leader, well, he ends up turning on the Romans at the end and like kills like two or three legions with his own German tribe sometime in like 50 BCE, if I'm not mistaken, hmm. something like that. It was so bad that one of the emperors at the time made like a famous quote, give me back my legions. I can't remember. It's something virus. Like <laughs> yes. I love that show, but the wolf mythology it's interesting how it competed with the Romans. The, the German mythology and the Romans in that episode was really cool because in one of them, the wolf will swallow the moon. Is that, is that the Roman or is that the German? I can't remember, but in one of them, the wolf's undefeatable and the other one is like he could be defeated. And so they're like competing the wolf mythologies here between both cults. But anyway, we I just hmm. jumped off the freaking topic here. Uh, Indo did say... Uh, that one hasn't happened yet does. So I'm implying by the duh there, you weren't asking for unfulfilled prophecies, so to speak. You were saying failed prophecies because technically oh. Jews are still waiting for this to happen. And I thought unfulfilled in my head is like, what hasn't been fulfilled that is like well, in the old Testament. Well, well but actually the, there's a time limit set on it. The, the seven yeah. weeks of seven, for example, in Daniel nine, like there's, a, there is a time limit and there's no indication that there's an allowance for gaps in between the uh, three different divisions. I have to just like strongly disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> right. Reverend majors. Oh, uh, Jesus. Because I think, I think we all know that a day is like a thousand years. Oh, so, yeah, that, that's well, that's why they modeled the Sabbath yeah, yeah. after the six if, days. Of the if day. we're yeah, if we're going because it's, if not, we're it's, going not, it's to, not a literal week. May I present for your consideration, dear panel? If we're going to, if we're going to accept that uh, Isaiah uh, seven is it seven or is it nine uh, is a messianic prophecy. Um, then I think they're all messianic we're, prophecies. Touche. <laughs> Even when they're not. Then we are, I mean, we are waiting. The, the Messiah's name needs to be Emmanuel. Does it not? 
Oh, right, God is with is. us. Yeah, God is with us, right? Yeah. yeah. It's it a needs title. to be that. It is. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and that's definitely what it is. That was it never is. used by anyone ever. So, okay. Well, what's yeah. the Roman saying? Where, is it like uh, the name is the omen or whatever? Um, so, in the given the the Roman culture. Um... Well, well, I mean, the, it goes back to Isaiah 7 14. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, 7 14. 7 14. That's... I can't remember if it was 7 14 or 7 15, but 7 14. In looking at that, yeah, I, I gotta ask you, like the New Testament author, it, if you were to guess what they're trying to do and accurate because you could come up with different theories about what they what you think they're doing, they're obviously recontextualizing something that had its original context, totally nothing to do with what they're doing. But what do you think is going on in their head? Are they just ripping it and saying, okay? We know the word so, means God with us, so we're. I mean, what do you think? I think it's like so when you see SJ. I, I honestly think it's, it's a, that that Matthew already had a pre-existing idea of Jesus being born of a virgin. I, I'm I'm yeah. I'm not. You know, I don't know if I'm in the majority on this, but I wouldn't doubt if I'm not. But I I I think that Matthew already had this idea and then went to look for confirmation in it. Uh, in this, I would. I would agree with that. And Matthew's really interesting because when you actually sit down and just carefully read the text that he has, like there's a whole, like there's a whole series. It's like bang, 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 bang of so-called fulfilled prophecies. When you actually look down and carefully read the text, one of which isn't even like, like he misattributes a, a, a passage from Zechariah to Jeremiah, right? In right. the uh, in in his uh, in his fulfillment narrative of the uh, of the infancy, um, it's very interesting to to go through them all and see you know carefully read them in their original context and see what he's doing with them. Um, this is a very Matthew's a very very instructive example of what Jews were doing with the Old Testament. Right. at the time of Jesus right like it was it was like it it was this this uh this idea that these old texts and the the word that we translate as scripture comes from the Greek mm -hmm. graphe um literally means or or I think the most the most um non-invested translation of that word is old writings or ancient writings in a fairly non-specific way they're looking at all of it as like the bible code that's what it is it doesn't matter what it what it originally meant it doesn't matter who originally said it it doesn't matter the context in which it was uttered if but... we can shoehorn this in any way into what's happening to us now or what we think has occurred, this is a prophecy fulfillment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, and James Matthew Kugel tries really hard to to associate Jesus with the uh, the you know the, the the Israelites that were taken out of Egypt and Moses, and right. he, he's he draws these these motifs sp specifically geared towards Moses that you don't see anywhere else. You know, like the the uh, Hosea 11, one, the, uh, you know, out of Egypt, I called my son taken totally out of context, used uh, in, a, in a way that was not intended by its, its, its original author. Um, everything that has to do with Herod and the massacre of the innocent children. Uh, the, uh, I mean, it, nearly every but unique prophecy in Matthew is, it's is, important to note though. He's, he's not doing anything different than what everybody right. else in Judaism yeah. is doing. Oh, sure. You would know from the Dead sure, Sea right. Scrolls, obviously, and you guys are all aware of that. But Kent Hoven, what do you think about these skeptics saying all these things? Do you do you think they're onto something? Or I want to know what Kent Hoven has to say about Josh McDowell's uh, shirts. Yeah. Well, what about his shirts? His shirts. You see how he's always like he kind of reminds me of like every cult leader in a sense that you see today that's like popping at the top, like Lord Rael. I mean, that guy is not the one that you introduced me to, Kent, but the other one that I'm going to talk to the interview. 
Oh, we've got them on hand. Please. <laughs> well, I, 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 let me just uh, let me just inter inter interrupt you guys. Uh, <clears throat> my name's Kent Hovind, and uh, I, I taught uh, high school science fifteen years. And uh, <clears throat> you know, let's picture my wife here. <clears throat> so yeah, so I uh, <laughs> I think the uh, uh, the big thing to remember here is uh, that uh, no matter what it is that somebody like Josh McDowell says, that evolution uh, is a religion. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> you know uh, we we shouldn't be having uh, taxpayer money. Uh, you know, paying for this uh, to, to children in our schools. Uh, for example, I, I've got a child walking in right now, and uh, <clears throat> you know, let's picture my let's picture my child. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so so, so I, th I think the big thing to remember here, and uh, before I before I let you guys go, because I don't want to spend too much time with atheists, I don't want to go to hell. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 the one thing that I know is that, uh, I mean, the only time I really spend any time with uh, atheists is when I whack them off. Uh, so, you know, the big thing uh, to remember, uh, yeah, <laughs> the big thing to remember here is that evolution is dumb. And, uh, you know, we, we, we don't want to teach it in the schools, okay? Yeah, I'm here to help. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, man. Hmm. That is hilarious. Well, Kent, thank you for totally not answering my question or Dr. <laughs> Kipps. I really appreciate it. Uh, the shirts have very no in character. <laughs> <laughs> People should definitely oh. go check out uh, check out the uh, the that will add on the uh, the Atheist Network group broadcast from what was it? Was that about a week ago, John? Yeah, I think so. Uh, man, that guy that guy was crazy. <laughs> That's crazy in that uh <laughs> he was talking about the water and the otters. <clears throat> Nathan's on to something though with ridiculous shirts and cult leaders. That was yeah, Derek, no, I think. Uh, no, you're right though. I'm telling you, I could pull up a couple right now. They're, they swag out, bro. I I seriously have a weird like there's this weird connection when I look at these people and women and the way that they are with women. Lord Rael's sleeping with tons of girls. And I've been looking at the documentary recently. This guy's like, these are young girls, like lots of really pretty young girls just drawn right to him. And I'm like, what am I not wearing? Like, I don't understand. You know, you know what's weird is um, the, the thing that's, you guys remember the Kenneth Copeland, uh, like the ambush journalist uh, that, that caught him off guard. Uh, oh, yeah, asking yeah, him about, <laughs> about demons. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the thing yeah. that stands out to me about that clip, I don't know why, is that Fitbit. The <laughs> Fitbit that he wore, and it matched his suit. Like, it was the same color as his suit. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. Do that again, do that again, Nathan. <laughs> no, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. Uh, don't you ever. Like, oh, man. We wrestle not. <laughs> what about whenever he, uh, whenever he, 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 he blew away coronavirus? Oh. Oh. With the wind of God. The, uh, the <laughs> I can't think of that without the song. See, that the song yeah. that he did. That he did. I can't <laughs> think of that without the mask. The Jim Carrey yeah. uh, film, The Mask. Oh. You've seen that, right? He's so goofy. Jim Carrey but, can do so much but, with his what? face. But what I don't understand is he's getting into his car. Like, he could have easily just gotten his car and shut the door. And that'd been the end of it. But he insists on, like, leaning over the door. Like He said, you know I just can't help myself. <laughs> oh, righty then. It's like, it's, it's genuinely like, uh, you know, like, if someone created, like, a robot that was, like, kind of malfunctioning. But it, it was kind of, like, always judging what people thought. Like, he couldn't act any more creepy if he tries. You know, like, yeah. unnatural. Yeah. I loved his whole Ace Ventura pet detective shows and stuff. Le who is her? I mean, he was just it's so like, good. It's like somebody laced his, his laced his denture adhesive with LSD. <laughs> but the, the eyes, like he's absolutely wired. Somebody, somebody made made a bunch of a uh, bunch of memes with the um, Julia Roberts' brother plays the bad guy, right in the mask, and um, Eric that. Roberts. That's yeah. Eric Roberts plays the bad guy, and he's actually been in at least one uh, bad Christian movie. I wish I could remember which one, but uh, but he was in one. But but he huh. plays the bad guy, and when he puts the mask on, right? Um, you have to go back and and look at this, or or look up memes. Somebody posted like like 
screen caps of of Kenneth Copeland's facial expressions next to Eric Roberts with the big cartoon mask on his face, and it is it is oh yeah, I have seen that with with the the The, butt chin and stuff like that. Like he's blowing at one point too, right? Like (laughs) it's so crazy. The the creepy one with the creepy grin. You can't find like it's difficult to find preaching that isn't like now looking back, isn't ridiculous. The I still can't get over RC Sproul. The recent thing that Doug played about RC Sproul's preaching about you'll be so sanctified that your mother will be burning in hell and you will be happy. You will thank God that your mother's burning in hell. You're so sanctified that you're glad God's glory is being done. And he starts to laugh. Like you're not supposed to say that pastor. No, you're not, because that's going to run people <laughs> off. But anyway, they said it anyway, and it, they really believe that. Like, yeah. that's so – that's the stuff I – the reason why it really hits me is because I was a Calvinist. And mm-hmm. I used to, like, work hard to get my family saved because I wanted to make sure they were there with me, you know? So At one time, I used I to think going... that uh... – sorry, go ahead. No, I was, I was going to say on that note, I was going through a bunch of – in the documentary itself – I was going through sort of the timeline of uh, of manuscript uh, acquisitions in the uh, in the 21st century pretty quickly, but I I touched on at one point just before um, I played the clip of uh, the debate between Jim Wallace, or sorry Daniel Wallace and um, Ehrman, uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary under the direction of Paige and Dorothy Patterson, spent millions of dollars purchasing eight fragments, eight Dead Sea Scrolls, supposedly Dead Sea Scrolls fragments. They're almost certainly all forgeries. One of them uh, contains text from Leviticus chapter, I said Leviticus uh, Leviticus 21 in the in the film, which is actually not correct. It's, it's Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 20. Um, but what's really interesting is it's four lines, this fragment, and it's like the first line, the first two lines is a passage from Leviticus 20. The last two lines are from Leviticus 18. So they're like transposed Mm -hmm. and it's all like an anti-homosexuality invective. Um, the... When when Southwestern purchased these fragments back in uh, oh. 2010, the there was a report. Daniel Estrin wrote a really really great article in 2013, and he quoted the guy who was overseeing the exhibition that uh, Southwestern held, featuring these fragments. And he said, and this is a direct quote, that they paid an especially high price. For this Leviticus fragment, precisely because, in his words, it attests to a global truth for today. It's like for these people, it's it you know, they're 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 putting their money where their mouth is. Mm-hmm. This means so much to them. This idea that 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 homosexuality is so wicked and and i mean this is all besides the point that such a fragment um the this 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 fragment of supposed leviticus passages is i i will say not even almost certainly it's certainly a forgery and i make that determination on the the fact that such such a collection like a collection of anti-homosexuality proof texts would not have been a thing in the first century like nobody would have done this it just it, mm-hmm. it would not have happened not right. at all because it's not something that anybody was so so right. fixated on right and they're going to well, pay more people, money what are the odds it? that well, what are the odds that every single one of these came from william uh uh, no. uh william william candle yeah william yeah. candle yeah, so, so what are so, the odds that you know that all these all these manuscripts, you know, that the, the Providence once when investigated wound up passing through this guy, if not originating with this guy? I mean, that's a, and that's something I never got into at all. And this is a like this is a really big 
this is a really, really big part of this story. For those of you who don't know, um, and if I can, if I can uh, um, monologue for a little bit here. So um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered between 1947 and 1953, and then there was there was there was nothing. Um, and then suddenly. Uh, oh, yeah, and that's the other thing, too. Most of the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered by uh, Bedouin sheep herders from the Tahamira tribe. Um, and they were sold. They were brokered through uh, an antiquity dealer and a cobbler um, in Bethlehem named uh, Kando. And uh, and so he, he probably handled... I think the the figures are over ninety five percent of the entire collection went through this guy, this antiquities dealer in Bethlehem. Um, the Bedouin sold fragments to him, like or basically threw him to the Ecole Biblique, which is the French school of archaeology in East Jerusalem, and they're the ones who 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 basically conserved and published them. Um, so there, this happened all the way up through 1953. The the scholars run out of money and can no longer afford to buy fragments. So Kando still has a bunch of stuff that he's you know he's holding that he's hoping to get a better price for, and uh, and they don't have any money to buy it. So the story goes, he starts to sell these to people who are just passing through his shop from like Europe and from the United States. And they're buying bits and pieces of these fragments. He still has in his possession uh, the Temple Scroll, which is far and away the most impressive uh, early Jewish manuscript in existence. It's uh, it's over 30 feet long. Um, it, it's a massive, massive document. He actually had it rolled up and stored underneath the floorboards in his house. Um, and it was it was in such a state that that the manuscript actually rotted considerably before any scholar even saw it. But um, in 1967, the uh, the Six Days War breaks out. Six Day War, sorry, breaks out. Um, it ends with with the state of Israel annexing all sorts of uh, of new territory from Jordan and from uh, Egypt. Most importantly, they now control East Jerusalem. And so uh, Yigel Yaden, who is uh, an important figure in archaeology from the uh, period, happens to also be the deputy prime minister of Israel, uh, suddenly remembers right after the end of the war that, uh, that Kando, who's living in Bethlehem, which before the war was in Jordan and now after the war is controlled by Israel, he remembers that Kando actually has this, this temple scroll stored under his floorboard. So uh, he rolls up tanks basically to the guy's house and marches in and, you know, takes the temple scroll and nationalizes it for the state of Israel. Some of this, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. Some of this is beside the point, but Kando basically controlled all these, all these manuscripts or, or had seen all these manuscripts all the way through up until the 80s and the 90s. In 1993, uh, Martin Skoyan, a Norwegian manuscript collector, visits Israel, and he visits Kando's shop and actually asks him, point blank, he says, do you have Dead Sea Scrolls fragments for sale? And Kando Sr. responds, and says those days are gone my interpretation of that is that he's got nothing left to sell in 1993 <laughs> um but you didn't take the vault he, well so he <laughs> died um within months of that he died and his his eldest son edmund was being groomed to sort of take over the family business of antiquities and within uh i think by 1990 nine or 2000 Edmund had tragically passed away I don't know the details like a like a car accident or something sudden happened with his health and then uh Kando's youngest son William Kando ends up 
sort of overseeing the family business. And I think it's important to point out here that William Candle was never was never being groomed for this position. He was not expected to take over the the antiquities trade. So he doesn't really know like his his father had a like Cando had a had a good eye. Like he had a, a real knack for for the antiquities trade. I don't think William did. Um, but he ends up taking over the family business and it's after that that we start seeing the market the market became flooded with uh, fragments of Dead Sea Scrolls for between 2002 and 2014, a total of, uh, uh, I think I documented 79 or 80 scrolls fragments actually ends up changing hands is sold. And every single one of them is tied back to uh, William Candle. Supposedly they yeah. were held in a vault in Switzerland. To him or through him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, and, it's, and, it's and, and, and how many of those story. since since 2002 have been uh, found to be forgeries? Like, oh, uh, many. Like I mean, 90%? Every, so, uh, well, I mean, the, 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 uh, the Green family, the Museum of the Bible owns uh, 16 Dead Sea Scrolls fragments, at least 14 are definitely forgeries. Um, in the Scoyan collection, he has 32 fragments. I believe the number is 26. I think 26 of his fragments, I would say, are almost certainly forgeries. Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary has eight fragments. And um, they, so Paige Patterson, who, who sort of oversaw this, this, this purchase, has since been ousted and the and the seminary itself is not sure what to do with this now. They have they have actually officially disavowed the entire collection. Um, they don't have the money to run the scientific test to actually prove their authenticity or forgery. I'd be happy to do a script analysis for them for a much reduced price if anybody's listening, and uh, and could could cert could could definitely uh, provide them some clear answers. So. Um, you know, and then the Azusa Pacific University owns five fragments, and they have actually taken the person who sold them those fragments, Lee Biondi, to court and uh, are suing him for fraud because they are absolutely convinced that their entire collection is, is right. filled. Well, I think a lot fragments. of it also had to do with, with, with being embarrassed, like because you know, like the, the Museum oh. of the Bible, yep. it, it wasn't all 16 that got sent off it, that, that were never tested, it was just five, and all five were, were, were deemed to be forgeries. And so, I, I think all that after that, it was tested. just like, Yeah, we're not going to send all the rest of these. Have been tested. <laughs> Uh, all in, have been oh, um, well, I'm uh, in at Germany at that same institute at the initial. No, um, the art fraud art fraud insights has has run an independent test and has produced. Gotcha. Uh, on all sixteen, or, or just the ones besides the five. All sixteen fragments. This massive volume. The Museum what is it of called the Bible again? Oh, I want to get that. You can download it directly from the Museum of the Bible. Okay. Awesome. So, like, yeah, but no, I, I, I didn't know that. I, I was just aware of the, the tests that were done in, in Germany on the five. If, if anybody reads, I'm going to do a plug here. If anybody reads Norwegian, this is a fabulous <laughs> book. So this is, uh, this is written by my friend, my good friend and my colleague, Orstein Eusnes, all about the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls scandal. Um, I have, I have written a manuscript that I am, uh, looking at getting published here presently that's that that deals with a lot of the stuff that he does do we know how much money they spent on all of these manuscripts these fragments and not entirely um but we have good good uh good estimates so um i mean i've seen i've seen sales i've seen bills of sales that belong to the museum of the bible and individual fragments which are literally um you know five or six to ten square centimeters uh the museum of the bible purchased for you know on average about a quarter of a million dollars each dude we yeah. should all just go so go hunting um, and look for them and they're definitely not making their money back on this no definitely not um i will say one other thing here um <laughs> In in two thousand, 
I think it was 2014 or 2015, there was a group out of the United States. I don't remember offhand what they were called, but they actually, there was a group of businessmen who, who set up a corporation with the intention of going and purchasing everything that, that William Cando, the Cando family has still in their possession in the vault. And I know for a fact that the offers on the table for the rest of his collection were well over 150 million US dollars. I wonder how much money they have. <laughs> so the the there's I mean there's there's one fragment that we know of for sure. It's called the they call it the butterfly fragment because it will, it's shaped like a set of butterfly wings and it actually preserves um three columns from the book of Genesis somewhere in the, in, in the, the chapter, chapter 30 to 40 range. I don't know. I don't remember offhand, but um, in 2013, the asking price for this one fragment was one point one point eight million dollars And, and uh, there was an Israeli collector who was, who was going, who, who, who at the time thought that was too much money for it. Um, since then, <clears throat> or I, I I should say at you know around from from the time of about 2015 to 2017 when I and my colleagues started to make a lot of noise about forgeries the asking price from this fragment for this fragment had escalated all the way I heard I heard anywhere from 40 to 70 million no just for this way. one fragment <laughs> jeez I mean, I mean, but how do you put a price on something like that, though? I mean, well, it's really whatever a person's willing these to are, pay. These are museum. I, well, if they're authentic, these are these are museum quality items. Oh, sure, right? yeah. Well, like, if they're is... if they're authentic, yeah. But but yeah. but but I mean, as 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 you know, you know, people will buy this without it being authenticated. Oh my yep. gosh! Well, look, guys. Exactly. We're going on two and a half hours. I want to promote everything, plug everything, and go. Nathan has right. to head out. Doctor Josh wrote me. I don't want us to be down to like one, two guys and stuff like that. Um, plug your channel. Nathan, let's start with you, man. Tell us your channel. Let everyone know who you are, what your channel's about as we exit out of here. Yeah, uh, my channel is called Digital Gnosis. Uh, that's with G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. And basically, I mean, I just do a bunch of random stuff on there. Like I, ha I have some sort of open conversations of the format that we've kind of had today. Um, I use some more directed videos. This Sunday, actually, we're going to be reading... Um, we're going to be doing another Bad Apologetics episode where we're going to be the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. Um, there's a chapter by the McGrews in this on, um, like, they basically try and quantify and put some numbers on why you should believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Um, <laughs> they come up with some really, really big numbers in terms of... So um, awesome. Unintended, un unintended coincidences. Yeah, I, I, but also, I mean, there's a ton of coincidence. Sorry, there's a ton of assumptions <laughs> that they make as well, um, just to get the numbers to work. So, like, um, you know, like Matthew's the earliest uh, gospel, things like that, like the to do with the reliability, to do with the dating. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be getting into all that stuff. But we've got a ton of videos in the Bad Apologetic series. You know, looking at philosophical arguments that are in the Blackwell Companion and various other places where we do like deep dives on those. Um, and then interviews with scholars from time to time. I mean, I've got one with Dr. Kip on there. Um, I've got one with Dale Allison for those who are into the this kind of sphere. I've also got some like brain and neuroscience ones that what though Derek, Derek's uh, done some of those as well, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, if yeah, you're, you're interested in that kind of stuff. The philosophy stuff, like you're, I'm not nearly as educated on that stuff as you are. I highly recommend everyone watching me um, to subscribe to everyone that is on the panel, but obviously subscribe to Digital Gnosis specifically too. Um, he does a lot I do, but also does stuff I probably will never do with this channel in particular. He has a different avenue, but we we work as a team on the same efforts of just trying to educate people. And yeah, I mean, seriously, thank you, man. I appreciate you. Is there anything else? I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want everyone no, no, to know. No, no, that's, that, that's basically it. So yeah, if you're interested in that stuff, just head over, head over to my channel. And uh, this Sunday, that's something to look forward to. Awesome. Dr. Kip, 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 what am I talking about? Dr. Kip Davis. Sorry, I always get your last name jacked up when I actually try to think it's about it. It's getting better. Yeah, tell getting us about better, your man. channel. I'm trying, brother. 
All right, man. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a specialist in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I'm a specialist in, in early Judaism and in uh, manuscript culture. Um, but I like I like to delve into uh, counter apologetics. Um, I I I really really hate it when people lie and lie for for Jesus. It just it drives me crazy. Um, and so many of those lies are centered around the way that we read the biblical text or the way that we handle the uh the history and the uh, and the manuscript tradition and the textual criticism of the biblical text so i'm all about um countering that 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 kind of uh apologetic the so the josh mcdowell documentary which i really hope everybody checks out if you haven't done so already please watch it um it was kind of a fun side project for me because it was sort of this intersection between uh, manuscripts and between uh, apologetics um, but in the future I intend to do more stuff in particular I'm, I'm starting to, to plan a series of, of videos on the Dead Sea Scrolls and if I ever find the time maybe I'll, I'll, I'll write a book about, uh, about, about the Dead Sea Scrolls for, for skeptics um, but, uh, but yeah that's what I do Check it out. I would love to see them and showing the discrepancies and how they understood things versus the way, you know, they originally were meant or, you know, literary discrepancies, a textual variance that how they changed certain things to mean what they meant. And then you could pivot that and show how the church or the early Christians, you do all that good stuff with it, you know? Well, modern stuff too. I mean, I think something that, something that's really, really, it came out a little bit in the, uh, in the McDowell film, but I, I, it's, you know, it's a big thing. The Dead Sea Scrolls are something that, uh, that apologists talk about endlessly. And uh, lots of the information that they're, they're, they're peddling about them is, you know, only partially true to outright uh false so it's i mean it's it's really important taking it from you man and last the greatest is the last if you will and that is dr jim majors recently Whatever. recently just got his phd he is now doctor for those of you who have seen jim majors around Congratulations, man! Seriously, bro. Thank you, sir. I, I I bow to to Dr. Kip and Dr. Josh and even Nathan uh, and Derek. Uh, you are all greater beings than, than I. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I uh, yeah, uh, Derek's correct. I hold a PhD in Hebrew Bible. I specialize in Danielic literature, um, uh, but I enjoy all topics uh, regarding the Bible. Uh, I got my uh, Master of Theology in New Testament Studies. And I uh, was a Christian for most of my life, so I, I enjoy uh, engaging in the counter-apologetics as well. Uh, I would love it if you'd subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Jim Majors. Or you can follow me on Twitter. I'm pretty active on there. My handle is at the Jim Majors. And yes, check, check out Dr. Kip's expose on, uh, on McDowell. It is, it is quite entertaining. So real quick. And, before we let you and go, Jim, sorry, one more thing. I think I... Fun. Jim... Uh, and Dr. Josh, I want to I want to explore this at greater depth at some at some point. But both Jim and Dr. Josh have debated the immortal Cliff Nettle. Uh, and uh, I'm I think I, did I do it as well? Oh, did you? Please, I think so. I need to see this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. Uh, Cl Cliff and I, I can't remember. It was like a year and a half ago or something. I think it was Damn Cliff it. and Stuart. Yeah, we, we, we tag team debated them, yeah. uh, him and his son. Oh, no, dude, those guys are so nice, like though. <laughs> well, yeah. It, it, it felt was like, it was it was like fun. hurting a baby or something. Like, yeah. You know, like, yeah. I, it was... I can't. <laughs> but, 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 it, but it was like hurting an ugly baby. Like, you don't feel too bad about it. <laughs> are they actually... Is Cliff Nettle actually a nice guy? I, I think it, there's like a there's a kind of weird switch I think where once once he's demonized you and like stereotyped you I don't think he's got a problem with like being horrible but when but when things are on pleasant terms and they say these like ch childish things about why that you know that like 
but it's so like it like it's just so special you know that like, you think how special it is it's got to be true right and then it's just like you're like oh god like i mean wh- i'm sorry to crush your dreams kid but you know like it's like <laughs> well everybody i have nathan's channel in the description i have dr kipps and i just shared dr majors scrolling up here to make sure i got it here uh so you guys in the chat you can go subscribe to him i hope you do um i really want to do more with all of these guys and dr majors we're gonna have to go through daniel obviously and deal with this a little more thorough since that's your actual expertise we've had you know dr josh come on and we talk about this we talk about that but maybe we could do a series at some point exhaustively going through issues, discrepancies, anti-apologetic work on Daniel alone. Cause I feel like it's the elbow and you ever hit your funny bone and it's not so funny. That's <laughs> Daniel. We're going to hit Daniel. You know what I'm saying? I'm and the Christians aren't I don't think SJ there. can take it after, after Dr. Kipps done this now, Daniel's the, uh, Daniel's uh, SJ's speciality. So, Oh, oh yeah. Oh, and, and Psalm, Psalm 22 and Psalm 110 and, Pretty much everything else that she's actually not a a specialist in. Um, real quick here, I want to give a shout out. We love you, XJ. Yes, we sure do. Yeah, brute facts podcast. Go subscribe to my friend Eddie. He interviews more atheists than he does Christians. You gotta love a Christian like that. Come on, now he's a cool dude. He is seriously a cool dude. And uh, the EA show says, would you be open to scheduling a debate with me? I'm an atheist YouTuber reverted to Islam. Oh, man. This I don't guy. debate. I personally <laughs> don't. I have, I have discussions with people. Yeah, but, but... but Derek, right. The thing is, there's got to be a necessary thing. So there's it, it, all, all the all the like like all the triviality aside of, you know, real life and having a job. There's got to be a necessary thing, Derek. Yeah, debate that's... me, bro. Oh, Tangelo, if you don't mind, please stop, okay? <laughs> it, it comes from everyone. It's always the start with the necessary thing, work to this is the revelation that attached itself to the necessary thing, and my revelation is true. Well, the chiasm's in the Quran as well, right? You know, like, so oh. lit- you, if you think about, like, text where it kind of narrows into one point and then expat, I, there's no other explanation, right? And, and think about how skeptical people would have been of Muhammad's life, um, you know, the, the general levels of skepticism in the time. He's, people suffered, actually. I mean, either this guy is the prophet, right? Or he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. What's it going to be? Or he's a lord. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Sorry, I know you're yeah. trying to end it. I just... <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I get it. And that's one of the reasons I just love getting into scholarship and hearing critical scholars take jabs. Don't worry. I have a video that is coming out um i'm taking more interest in islam taking critical interest i'm not interested in apologist uh no matter what worldview you come from i'm more interested in getting critical scholars to look for holes look for problems and one we did on misogyny in islam and that one's going to be a bombshell so when you see it the way women are treated uh yeah so I'm not a fan of it. Let's put it that way. Just like I'm not a fan of the same worldview I came from. So if you think I'm just going to smile and be happy and be looking forward to like, I look at all of them in the same box of superstition. So what can you say? What what can I say? Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for doing this, (laughs) Eric. Of course, man. Thank you, dude. Uh, You did the documentary. I hope everyone goes and checks that out. And um, we'll see what else I have coming up on the schedule. For those who are Patreon members of Myth Vision, I am taking Patreon member questions for Dr. Richard Carrier and Dennis R. McDonald. I will be in California in like less than 10 days, spending seven days with these scholars. So if you are a Patreon member and you have a question, this is a plug for my Patreon. That's how I do what I do. Feel free to join, and you can ask questions for Del C. Allison when I go to see him in October. And I'm going to be seeing um, Dr. Um, James D. Tabor again in October as well. There's so much stuff coming up, guys. Uh, Just so much stuff. So looking forward to it. But, yeah, anyway, uh, love you guys. I'm out. There's no outro. I'm not playing any outro or nothing. I'm off. Till next time. 
We are Myth Vision. Myth Vision. All right, you ladies and gentlemen who've been waiting for this, I'm super excited about the show, you guys. Dr. Kip Davies, he's going to be joining us. Let's get a 30-second countdown, let you guys trickle in. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to kick the you know what out of Leviathan. <laughs> Sorry. Um, welcome to Myth Vision Podcast. We are Myth Vision. Ladies and gentlemen, you do not want to miss this show. Pull out your tape measure because we're going to do a serious, you know what, measuring contest today. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm totally tripping. <sighs> Dr. Kip, welcome to Myth Vision, man. Let's freaking knock this one out of the park. We got one hour, ladies and gentlemen. And then we're jumping to a premiere that Dr. Kip has created. You do not want to miss it. So you're going to want to subscribe to his YouTube channel. It's down in the description. It's in the comment section right now. I'm excited because the Apostle Paul is competing with other apostles. We saw that with Steve Mason. We saw with Elaine Pagels, Dr. Kip, where everyone is Satan or works for Satan. Everyone's a liar but us. Everyone is wrong but, but me. Paul's doing that. Every apostle's probably doing that. Apollos that Paul bumps into is doing that. Everyone's right and everyone's wrong. What's up with this guy, Jeremiah? You read Hebrew, tell us your credentials, how you know these things, and let's pop off. We've got 60 minutes, and then you guys are going to join us on Dr. Kip's YouTube channel. He's premiering a badass video you don't want to miss. So there you have it. Thank you. It's fun to be back. Um, and one of these times you're going to get my name right, I expect. Right? It's Six. Kip's Davis. 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 Okay. There you go. I apologize. Man. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the Tower fine. of Babel, bro. He's confused my tongue on purpose. It's weird. I don't understand. Yeah, you got you got left behind, didn't you? I did. You were you I were did. one of the ones that they decided just to leave in the Valley of Shinar. Um, so my yeah. credentials: I have a I have a PhD from the University of Manchester in religions and theology. I specialize in the Dead Sea Scrolls and early Judaism. And I spend pretty much all my time working with ancient Hebrew manuscripts like this one that you see up here. This is actually a fragment from uh, the oldest copy of the book of Jeremiah uh, in existence and one of the oldest manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is what's what uh, has been cataloged as 4Q70. So we're going to talk today about Jeremiah and uh, specifically one of uh, one of the most interesting parts of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, I was telling you this earlier, Derek, uh, most people are not aware of this, but Jeremiah is actually the largest book in the entire Hebrew Bible by word count. Um, Psalms looks bigger in large part because of the chapter divisions and because of its poetical structure. Jeremiah is the largest book by word count. And in spite of that, there's the, he's, he's the, the prophet of the new covenant. Um, and beyond that, the new Testament doesn't seem to pay much attention to Jeremiah. And I find most Christians tend not to pay a lot of attention to Jeremiah and maybe only know one or two passages from Jeremiah. Maybe the most famous Old Testament passage comes from the book of Jeremiah. And that's, um, that's what you hear. Did you go, did you go to a, a Christian high school? I only went to a Christian middle school for one year. Okay. So if you, I, I also did not go to a Christian high school. I went to public school, but I had a lot of friends who went to Christian high school. And it's the passage that you hear 
at every high school graduation, Christian high school graduation multiple times, or if you live in a place where I do, you know, this leaks into public school uh, graduations as well. That's Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. For I know the plans I have made concerning you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a hopeful future. This is a passage everybody knows, and it comes from a letter that Jeremiah wrote while he was in Jerusalem to the people who were living in captivity in Babylon. And when this passage is often talked about, um, it's talked about as a letter of hope and a, a letter of comfort. We're going to walk through it today and we're going to discover that it's, it's maybe a little different than that. You ready for this, Derek? I'm so ready. Before you actually pop in there, I want everybody, if you will, Right now, go check out Kip Davis' YouTube in 55 Davis. minutes. Davis. <laughs> Jesus. I don't know why I keep doing that, bro. I'm Davis. Dr. Kip Davis. Okay. Apology. You know, I used to say Septuagint. I'm not even kidding. I called it the Septuagint. I get a lot of comments to wow. this day when I said, yeah, the Septuagint. Um, I, I, it's a redneck in me, man. You can't blame the yeah. redneck. I mean, you got to give me a break. But – Go check okay. out his YouTube in 55, 54 minutes now. He's premiering a video you don't want to miss, the end of Genesis Apoc uh, Apologetics. And he's actually talking not only about the Christian apologist, but specifically inspiring philosophy, philosophy Michael Jones. And I'm going to have him on the show sometime, fingers crossed, in June to uh, to talk to my audience with me on Myth Vision. So you do want to check that out and go check out Myth Vision Patreon hundreds of videos, $3 a month to get your foot in the door. It's really simple. I've put so much time into this. That being said, take us in to Jeremiah and what's going on. Okay. And I encourage everybody in your in your audience to, um, to read along with us in your favorite English Bible translation. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get you, we're going to walk through the passage. We're going to read the passage. This is what I like to do uh, with students when, I, when I've taught classes. I like to read the text. Um, biblical scholars like to read the text. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and you're reading from what version? Um, NET, New English Translation. Okay. I'm going to read from uh, a, a fairly different version. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just pull up. Um, I, can, I can share my screen here just to show you um, what I'm working with here. Yeah. All right. So, oh yeah, I have to do this and this. Awesome. Okay. So this is this is what I'm going to be reading from. I, I I've got lots of lots of windows here. This is my this is my Bible nerd software. Um, it's for Mac. It's called Accordance. Uh, but I'm I'm going to be ignoring most of these and spending all my time reading the uh, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, which is commonly known as not the Septuagint. <laughs> and I, I don't say Septuagint like the Americans do either, because I was I was trained in Europe. We say Septuagint. So I'm going to be reading from the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint is the it, it, the Septuagint of Jeremiah is is really interesting because it's very different from the Masoretic text of Jeremiah. Um, it's also, do I need to pull up the screen share? Yeah. So okay. let's, uh, let, let's, uh, let's go to my, let's go back to, can you see my screen? Should be yep. black. I see okay. black. Yep. All right. So many consider, uh, the Septuagint, uh, maybe even the oldest version of Jeremiah, which has been substantially updated in the Hebrew. The Septuagint is actually 13% shorter than the Hebrew version of Jeremiah. And the Hebrew version is what appears in all of your English translations. So my translation is going to be quite different. Um, it's, it's different in many places, and it's, it's organized differently, too. Uh, for a long time, people thought that uh, the Septuagint was just a totally corrupt uh, version of Jeremiah. And one of the really exciting things uh, that was discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls was that there were copies of the book of Jeremiah and they weren't all just 
aligned to the Hebrew copy that we have um, in the Masoretic text that our English translations are based on. We also have fragments of Jeremiah that is written in Hebrew, but aligns with the Septuagint. This is one of these fragments here. This is 4Q Jeremiah D or 4Q 72. And scholars are relatively convinced that this is a version, a Hebrew version of Jeremiah that looks exactly like the Septuagint. And it's just one fragment, but there's something very interesting about this fragment. If you'll notice at the top, these, uh, these little uh, spikes of damage that mm -hmm. kind of stick straight up. Do you see that? Yeah. Do you know what causes that? Uh, termites. <laughs> no, actually, the pattern is caused because is caused by the way that the the scroll is stored. Scrolls okay. are rolled; they're tightly rolled, and then it, and and then stored oftentimes in jars. Um, at Qumran, they had them stored on shelves, and so this is a this is a manuscript that was rolled and stored tightly and just abandoned for. 2000 years and it creates over time as it deteriorates the 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 material in the roll gets eaten through from outside to the inside and we can use patterns of damage to reconstruct what the original scroll looked like it's it's kind of like putting together a big jigsaw puzzle on this particular one uh, we can see that these these bits of damage here uh, it suggests to us that this was tightly rolled at the very inside of the scroll or at the very end of the scroll. And what's really interesting is this is Jeremiah chapter 43, which actually occurs right close to the end of the Septuagint version. So what this says to us is this is Jeremiah chapter 43 that occurs at the end of a scroll. Hence, almost certainly a Hebrew uh, a Hebrew copy of what we have in Septuagint translation. Mm. Cool stuff. So we also know that there's lots of editorial activity in the book of Jeremiah. And I'm going to show you another one here. So this is the oldest copy of the book of Jeremiah. This is the same one that I have on my, on my monitor behind me. How old uh, is that? 4Q70. It, it dates to about 200 BC. Um, and this is a really, really interesting manuscript because you know, I've, I've reconstructed parts of it here. And what you see in, in the first two reconstruct, there's two reconstructed lines in white on the black and then a long break. And then the text picks up again, just below that. This is the end of Jeremiah chapter 729. And then it skips all the way to the beginning of Jeremiah chapter eight, verse four. So there's a whole big chunk of text that's missing. Some originally suggested that this was just a scribal error. I don't think so. Because when you read the text this way, it's very smooth, the way that it, it reads from chapter 729 to 8, verse 4. But then probably about 100 years later, and we know this based on, that, on the, the handwriting, someone else came along and filled in the missing text. We see this here. And he didn't have enough room to get it all in there. So he wrote in the, in the space he had available. And then down the left margin, he had to add wow. four more lines. Still didn't have enough room. So he had to finish upside down along the bottom of the manuscript. <laughs> so they, they didn't have qualms about uh, about working in the margins and about adding to their text. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So let's just jump right into this, Derek, shall wow. we? Wow, yes. We can stop. I'm bringing us back on the screen. Uh, All right. Are, are you want me to read something? Yes. So let's start. Why don't you read Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 1? Okay, this is the NET version. All right, in case you guys are KJV onlyist, you're already angry at me. Oh, well. The prophet Jeremiah <laughs> sent a letter to the exiles Nebuchadnezzar had carried off from Jerusalem to Babylon. It was addressed to the elders who were left among the exiles, to the priest, to the prophets, and to all, or to the other people who were exiled in Babylon. 
Okay. So the, already that's fairly different from the text that I have before me. And remember, so I'm, I'm reading from a Greek translation of a Hebrew original that probably predates the version that you're reading. And mine says, these are the words of the document that Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the elders of those in captivity and the priests and the false prophets, a letter for Babylon, for the captivity and for all the people. See anything different in there? Yeah, to the prophets. And mine says the prophets. It doesn't say the false prophets. No, and, but the and Greek... mine says Nebuchadnezzar. Yours didn't That's say Nebuchadnezzar. That's right. That's right. There's also one more important difference that I'm not surprised you didn't pick up. Your version says something to the effect of the remaining elders um, or the elders who were left. Yes. Does it? Yes. Okay. In mine, it just says to the elders of those in captivity. What's missing in my version is the Hebrew word yether. Um, and this is, this is going to be an important term, uh, an important idea for the, the people who are um, not just living in captivity, but years and years later, the people who have returned from captivity. This idea of remnant, which is drawn in large part from portions of the book of Jeremiah, including this passage becomes very, very important, okay? So, but that's missing in the Greek. Okay, so let's just continue to read. Can you read uh, verses two to three? Yes. He sent it after King Jeco Jeconiah, am I saying that right? Jeconiah, yeah. The, the queen mother, the palace officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had been exiled from Jerusalem. He sent it with Elasa, son of Shaf Shafan, and Shafan. Gam Gamaria, son of Hit Hil 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 Hilkiah. King Zedekiah of Judah had sent th these men to Babylon, to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the letter said. Sorry All for right. that butchering so, there. No, no, that's fine. Names are tough. Hebrew names are especially tough if you're not used to them. So don't, don't sweat it. There's already, there's more differences here. I'm not going to dwell on a lot of them. But uh, just a couple things to point out. Uh, well, first of all, um, the, the, your translation softened up a little bit too. Uh, what it actually says is the letter was sent after the, part, the departure of Jaconia, the king and the queen, the eunuchs, um, the free men. This is the Greek, which is a little different than the Hebrew. Uh, and a, a word that means prisoners, but probably in this context, I think, means like palace slaves or or bondsmen um, and the artisans from Jerusalem. And uh, again, uh, these were uh, the, the English specified that these were were people uh, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. Nebuchadnezzar, once again, is missing in the Greek version. Right. So we're going to start now um, with the letter itself. And I'm going to ask you to read verses four through seven. Absolutely. Real quick, everybody, I just posted his YouTube link. Please subscribe to him because when we're done with this live at 1230 Eastern Standard Time, which is very soon, we're going to a premiere he has on his channel that he created against inspiring philosophy and other apologists using the Bible, of course, to try and you know, do all that stuff. So we're going to go support him and I will be there. So I hope to see you there. Verse four, Jeremiah 29, the Lord of heaven, the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says to all those he sent into exile to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find your find wives for your sons and allow your daughters to get married so that they too can have sons and daughters. Grow in number. Do not dwindle away. Work to see that the city where I sent you as exiles enjoys peace and prosperity. Pray to the Lord for it, for as it proper, prospers, you will prosper. Good. Okay, so... One thing I want to say right at the get-go, I mentioned this, I think, in the last, in one of the last uh, um, talks that we had, but when I, when I teach and then when I read, 
uh, scripture, everywhere that I see the Lord in an English translation, in my head, I'm thinking Yahweh. And I make a point of saying Yahweh because this is who uh, is being is being spoken about and who is being addressed. It's important to recognize that the Lord in English is actually a rendering of the name that the Hebrews assign to their God. Um, and here again, so right away, just based on that, on this is what we would call the, uh, the the proscription and the salutation of the letter. Based on that, there's a theme at work here. We know right away what this letter is about. And based on what you read, what do you see there that you think Jeremiah wants to talk about, wants to highlight? Um, I would suspect he's talking about the exile um, and those who are going to be coming back to Jerusalem. So what's the first thing that he says? The Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel. Okay. Uh, okay. After the salutation, the first instruction uh, he gives. So he says, blame. so it says Yahweh Tzabaot, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. What's the instruction then? Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry, have sons, find wives for your sons, get married. Uh, so that they can have sons and daughters, grow in number, do not dwindle away, work work to see that the city where I sent you as exiles enjoys peace and prosperity. Pray nice. The Lord. Yeah. There you go. So if you were to sum up the, if there's a message in here, what do you think it is? I would say <laughs> go and enjoy life here. Uh, yeah. You know, go ha yeah. like reproduce, uh, establish, you know, uh, my covenant here. I don't, I, I honestly could say is there an expectation based on this that, that they're coming back? It seems like it. It sounds like he's saying, I'm bringing you back. Yeah. Uh, to the land. All those in, in this part? To Babylon from Jerusalem. Yeah. To Babylon from Jerusalem. Build house. So he's saying enjoy it in Babylon. Yeah. He's, he's saying okay. settle down. Really? It, this is what okay, Jeremiah is saying. It's going to be a while. He's saying, right. Okay. Settle down. Hold your horses, stay put. Um, and this is something that is quite often missed in the preaching of Jeremiah. He definitely is saying that the exile is going to come to an end, that there's going to be a return. But really his message is settle down. Take your time. It's not happening tomorrow. And we're going to get into that. Um so what else did I want to uh, did I want to point out here? Uh, in terms of differences with the with the Septuagint, it's it's pretty close. It's it's fairly close to the same. Um, the the next passage again, um, starting in in verses eight to nine, it says um, very much the same thing. But uh, if you just just read verse. Yeah, read verse 8 and 9 and tell already, me what it yeah, says in your version. I can see already. Okay. For the Lord of heaven's yeah. armies, the God of Israel, says, Do not let the prophets among you. It's funny how he's saying this too, by the way. Uh, do not let the prophets among you or those who claim to be are able to predict the future by divination deceive you. And do not pay any attention to the dreams that you are encouraging them to dream. They are prophesying lies to you and claiming my authority to do so. But I did not send them. I, the Lord, affirm it. <laughs> right. Exactly. So Jeremiah, after telling everyone, settle down, plant gardens, build houses, get married, give your children for marriage. You know, you're, you're in Babylon for the long haul. The very next concern of his are prophets. Prophets and diviners who are speaking in my name. And in my version, in the Greek, it says, uh, do not be persuaded by the false prophets among you. Throughout this letter, Jeremiah always makes sure to distinguish those people, um, uh, his rivals, essentially, who are in Babylon, as false prophets. They're not just other prophets. They're false prophets in his estimation so um but let's go on this is where it starts to get really interesting i think uh okay. why don't you read verses 10 to 14 okay i'll try and read these quick 
For the Lord says, only when the 70 years of Babylonian rule are over will I again take up consideration for you. Then I will fulfill my gracious promise to you and restore you to your homeland, Jerusalem, or wherever they're at, other than Babylon. Yeah. For I know what I have planned for you, says the Lord. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. That's funny how that gets ripped out. Uh, I have plans yeah. to give you a future filled with hope. When you call out to me and come to me in prayer, I will hear your prayers. When you seek me in prayer and worship, you will find me available to you. If you seek me with all your heart and soul, I will make myself available to you, says the Lord. Then I will reverse your plight and will regather you from all the nations and all the places where I've exiled you, says the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I exiled you. Okay, so here you have the famous passage, the promise of hope, and you definitely also have some some uh, promise and expectation that the exile is going to end. Jeremiah specifically says 70 years. And um, and he also says that he's going to bring them back. But there's a really, really key difference here in the Greek passage. I'm going to read what mine says. Okay. For so says Yahweh. And in the Greek, it always just says, so says uh, the Lord or Yahweh, not uh, Yahweh the God of the armies. Um, for so says Yahweh, only after the end of 70 years, you have been in Babylon. I will visit you and confirm my word to you to return your people to this place. I will consider for your reckonings of well-being and not evil to give to you. Pray to me and I will listen to you. Seek after me and you will find me so long as you pursue me with your whole heart and I will appear you and I will appear to you. And that's the end. So in the Hebrew, you've got this whole extra this whole extra couple of sentences here. Yeah. I will Do reverse you see that? Reply. I will regather you from all the nations, all the places where I exiled you, says the Lord. I will bring you back to the place which I exiled you. Yeah, all this added. Yeah. So why do you think that was added? By, well, I would suspect if this is obviously the Jews who are writing these things, uh, yeah. maybe maybe they're trying to hint at uh, God fulfilling his promises that he's going to bring us back, you know? Exactly, exactly. And so instead of saying, already, get comfortable, <laughs> here you already have him say, don't worry, it's, he's, he's bringing us back here soon. Exactly. The, sh the focus in this letter, it, by, by the time of the, of the, the rewriting in what's called the Masoretic text, by this time it's already shifting. There's already a, a, a shift taking place in the theme, in the emphasis of this text. And this is I'm gonna I'm not gonna get you to read this whole thing because this is this is where it gets really weird. Okay. So right. after that point in the Greek version, so mine says it says all that stuff about uh, after you've been there for 70 years, I'll confirm my word to you. And, and consider your your reckonings for good and not for evil. I will bring you back. Pray to me. Seek after me. Uh, and so long as you pursue me with your whole heart, you will find me and I will appear to you. Then it says, since you have said, Yahweh has appointed to us prophets here in Babylon. So says Yahweh concerning Ahiav and Zedekiah. Now, that's very different from yeah. what you have there. And the reason why it's different is because in the Masoretic text, there's a whole other chunk that has been added here uh, to break up this section. It says, because you have said, and I'll just read it, because you have said Yahweh has raised up prophets for us in Babylon, so says Yahweh concerning the king who sits on the throne of David and concerning all the people who dwell in this city, your kinsmen who did not go out with you into exile. So now he's speaking about the people in Jerusalem, but this is not, again, this is not in the Greek version. Right. Uh, okay. Your kinsmen who did not go out with you into exile. So says Yahweh Tzabaot. That's the God of the armies. Behold, okay. I am sending I'm sending on them sword, famine, and pestilence. I will make them like the vile figs 
that are so rotten they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with sword, famine, and pestilence, and I will make them a horror to all of the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, a terror, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Because they did not pay attention to my words, declares Yahweh, that I persistently sent to you by my servants, the prophets, but you would not listen, declares Yahweh. Hear the words of Yahweh, all you exiles whom I sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. So that is all added. And you can hear wow. in there what Jeremiah is speaking now. This is this is a prophecy that I'm, you know, Jeremiah did not utter. This is something that somebody wrote in after the fact and and pasted into this letter. And the focus of this prophecy here is on the people who are back in the, in Jerusalem. These people. Um, are the ones whom, whom Yahweh promises to pursue with sword and famine and pestilence and to make a horror of all the kingdoms of the earth. The reason for that, can you guess why? Maybe because at this time they're in captivity somewhere uh, in the future. I, I don't I know. I actually would. It, so I, I'm going to suggest something a little differently. I think you're okay. on the right track. Uh, really, um, particular in the in the early part of the Second Temple period, in the Persian period, and then in the Hellenistic period, in particular during the Persian period, it was very important to because these are people um, who came back. The people who came back, the Jews who came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, they returned, and there were still people, you know. Israelites living in the land. Right. The Samaritans, these, they call them. Yes. Before so they left, a, there was... Is this a Jewish polemic against the Samaritans already here? Yes. They're not wow. Samaritans yet. They're not okay. Samaritans okay. yet. In in the Hebrew Bible, they're, they're referred to as, as uh, Am Ha'aretz, the people of the land. Um, and... There's a there's a polemic at work already in the book of Jeremiah, the book of Ezekiel, the book of, uh, in particular, Ezra and Nehemiah is all very much about this. Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, their their opponents, the the ones that they are they are um, uh, fighting with uh, when they're when they're rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls of the of Jerusalem, are the residents who were left behind who are no longer recognized as Jews. And for this all is we why know, we don't even know if they were really planted there by Assyria. That's the polemic. But really, these could have right. been the original guys there. They, I, I mean, there's no reason to think that they weren't. There really isn't. Um, it, 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 the thousands of people who lived in the region didn't just go away. They, you know, the people, the, the the poor farmers who lived outside of Jerusalem in the environs of Jerusalem, they they stayed there. They picked up their lives again, and and to them, the only change was was really the fact that there was somebody new in charge in Jerusalem. So already you've got this polemic developing in this text, and it comes through particularly clear in the Masoretic version. Right. This, this Jew, Hebrew the Jewish, version. I like to say almost like the Jews were like, yeah, we're screw these guys. You know what I mean? Right. But this yeah. is not in the original context. This is not the point of Jeremiah's letter. Right. He says here in in verse uh, in verse 15, since you have said he's speaking to the people in Babylon and I'm just going to we're, we're, we're done with this, this interpolation. We're going to leave this alone. OK. This is what the Greek says. Since you have said, Yahweh has appointed to us prophets here in Babylon, and then it jumps all the way forward to verse 23, or 21. So says Yahweh concerning these two guys, Ahiav and Zedekiah. See, I am delivering them into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will execute them in your sight, and they will make them a curse for all of the captivity of Judah and Babylon, saying, May Yahweh do to you as he did to Zedekiah, and to Achiav, whom the king of Babylon roasted in fire. So Jeremiah, right there. Uh, yeah, well, it, yeah, it, it'll continue. But basically what's happened is, is your version 
has has right after it says because you have said Yahweh has raised up for us prophets in Babylon, has then added this whole big chunk against the people who are remaining in the land that really have nothing to do with what Jeremiah was talking about. And then it picks up again. You'll see in verse 21, it picks up again. So says Yahweh, Tzabaoth, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Koliah, and Zedekiah, the son of Masiah, who are prophesying a lie to you in my name. And then, it, and then it continues. And some of the some of the same additions we've seen, you'll notice the name Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned in the Hebrew. It's not in the Greek. Um, and, it, and it looks like uh, what Jeremiah is doing here, he's got some sort of, he's got some sort of existing relationship, it seems, with with the uh, with the officials in Babylon, because he talks about how these these false prophets, Achiav and Zedekiah, um, have been be, because of because of what they've been saying in Yahweh's name. The officials in Babylon have actually had them arrested and killed. So. And I think that raises a question. What is it that they could have been uh, saying that upset the Babylonian fish officials enough to have them executed? This this is – I got to stop for everyone who's not maybe completely clear on what's happening here. First off, we just did an episode with Steve Mason. He was talking about Paul. And how when you're trying to find out what's Paul's original letters doing, they seem to be half conversations. So all you know is what Paul's saying. And you can get hints of the conversation coming in from the churches he's talking to or even the opponents through the churches he's talking to that are arguing against Paul's doctrines. So in this Jeremiah context, if we assume he has competing prophets in Jer Jerusalem or Babylon, if you will. These uh, guys are in Babylon. Yeah, and they're competing with this guy. It's almost like, yeah. no, I want the attention uh, of the Babylonians. I, I, I want to be this the prophet of our people and whatnot. There's competition. So, with that being said, take us into what 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 does it tell us the reason? Uh, not directly, but we have a good idea what it is. So, and I think you can sort of intuit this too. Um, would right away you ask yourself, well. And this is important. What these two prophets were saying was serious enough to catch the attention of the Babylonians to have them executed. Would the Babylonians have cared um, about whether or not, like, let's see, you know, Jeremiah spends a lot of time uh, talking about uh, uh, about um, uh, Judah's, uh, he, he compares the idolatry to adultery. You know, they've abandoned Yahweh. Would the Babylonians have cared about that? It doesn't seem like that would be something worth killing people for. Not at all. They don't care. They do not care what, what, what the Israelites are doing religiously. Um, they do not care whether or not they have abandoned Yahweh. It's just the local, it's just the local deity. What do the Babylonians care about that? So it can't be that. Um, the it's it's probably something political. There's probably something within the message of Zedekiah and Achiab that the Babylonians find to be challenging, um, politically challenging, possibly dangerous. And we're gonna we're we're gonna <laughs> we'll we'll get to that. But already, I think I hope you can see here that this letter is not about, um, or not primarily about. I should say the focus of this letter is not a letter of encouragement. This is a letter for Jer in, in which Jeremiah is is um, taking it out on his rivals and challenging. Uh, alternative prophets. He calls them consistently throughout false prophets. Um, so just for the sake of time, we're going to kind of zip through the rest of this fairly quick, fairly quickly. Okay. So um, here now, one of the problems with the Greek translation 
the Septuagint of the Hebrew text is that it's pretty clumsy and it's messy in some places. And I think this is why for a long time, many people considered it a, a corrupt text. So this is actually one of the places where in the Greek, you could definitely see that somebody messed the text up. So we go back to the Hebrew and um, what, what it says, I'm, uh, this is my rendition of what the text probably originally said. Uh, so after he, he goes after Achiav and Zedekiah, um, he then says also to Shemaiah of Nahaliam, you shall say, I did not send you in my name. You have sent letters in your name to all the people who are in Jerusalem. So Jeremiah is saying that uh, there's this, this guy in Babylon named Shemiah who sent letters back to Jerusalem where Jeremiah is. Uh, so he, For he, anyone wondering, this is in Jeremiah chapter 29. We're down in verse 24, 25, 26. So right there is where we're, good. Where we're at. Yes. So you have sent letters in your name to all the people who are here in Jerusalem and to Zephaniah, the son of Masiah, the priest, saying, and this is what the letter said that, that was sent back to Jerusalem. Yahweh made you a priest instead of Jehoiada, the priest, to have charge over the house of Yahweh over every man who prophesies and all the madmen, that you should confine them in prison and dungeon. So then, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Anatoth, who prophesied to you? Has he not, for this reason, sent us in Babylon, saying, It is far off. Build houses for yourself and settle. Plant gardens and eat their produce. So this is... Oh. So, so let me, let me, let me, let me guess, let me guess for our audience. Cause we got like 20 minutes and everybody who's watching, yeah. not only please like this video, but you're going to want to go to Kip's channel. Okay. That's down in the description because he's premiering a video soon. I'm going to be over there in the chat, help him out, grow his channel, like his channel, subscribe to his channel. Anyway, here's my guess, Dr. Kip. All right. Okay. You got his name up there. I'm, I'm not going to butcher your last name. I'm just going to call you Dr. Kip. <laughs> Such an easy name. I know it's so easy and I'm such a redneck. I can't help it. Um, please, please forgive my shortcomings. Okay. So these other guys are politically saying we're coming back. We're going back. We're not settling down. We're not listening to the Babylonians. Our God is going to cause us to move. And I don't care what you say. We're going to get out of Babylon. And Jeremiah is going just like Josephus. Stop fighting these guys. Go with the flow. God said rest. He said chill the hell out. Quit trying to cause riots or cause problems and stir up the people because then we're going to get killed by these Babylonians. Am I on the right track? You, you've got it. Jeremiah so is a political thing. actor. <laughs> okay. He's a political mm. actor. And his theology is very much tied up with the politics of the day. Um, so much so it's it, in sometimes in some ways it's hard even to distinguish or to separate them. And this is nothing new for him. I'll finish up in, in the last little bit to, to, to show how this is a theme that kind of runs through, through his, his entire, his entire prophetic ministry. So the message of Jeremiah is this, it is far off, build houses for yourself and settle, plant gardens and eat their produce. Right? That's, right? that's the point that Jeremiah is trying to make. Settle down. Uh, so then Jeremiah goes on to say, and Zephaniah read this document. This is Jeremiah speaking now. Uh, he just quoted the letter that, that this guy sent back to Jerusalem and then says, and Zephaniah read this document in the hearing of Jeremiah. So Zephaniah tattled. He tattled on... Uh, on uh, the, the Babylonian false prophets and told Jeremiah what they were saying. <clears throat> uh, so he said to Jeremiah saying, send those in captivity saying, so Yahweh, uh, uh, oh no, sorry. So he, 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 he read this letter to Jeremiah, tip Jeremiah off. So then Jeremiah responds and says, the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, this, he's super where are we pretentious. At? Where, are we, always, where are we at? I'm sorry. sorry. Where are we? Um, where are we? Oh, this is in, in verses 29 to 32. I don't actually have the individual verses marked here. Okay, okay. So, uh, and Jeremiah is a, often a very pretentious guy speaking of himself in the third person like a douche. Um, so 
the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, send to those in captivity saying, so says Yahweh concerning Shemiah of Nahalayim. While Shemiah was prophes has prophesied unto you, I did not send him. He has convinced you trust wrongly. He has convinced you to trust wrongly. So then Yahweh declares, see, I'm going to visit Shemiah and his family, and he shall not have a person among you to see the good thing I will do for you. So this is uh, Jeremiah basically saying that Yahweh is so displeased with Shemiah that he's going to kill him and his, his entire family uh, so that in the very distant future, when uh, when this 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 predicted return actually takes place, he's not going to be there. So he and his family are going to die in Babylon. So, so a couple things real quick. My version at the very end in says, "I the Lord affirm it, for he counseled rebellion against the Lord." So here we have um, the winner. Uh, that is supported by the consensus of guys, if you will, in the priesthood or whoever is actually given the con condoning of this text of Jeremiah saying, look, we, we're on, we got your back, man. We know what would have happened if we tried to listen to these other guys. We'd have more family blood spilled. It, our ass would be grass, so to speak. Um, yeah. And here we make sure God's speaking through Jeremiah on this one. I always try to make this relevant when we're talking biblical studies to Paul in the New Testament because Paul, like, encompasses the entirety of most of the new testament and there is a dispute that happens i can't remember where dr price mentions this between peter and paul peter's wow. like i knew jesus and in this i think it's an early second temple uh or second second temple early second century writing where peter's like i knew the lord you say you had a vision but it could have been an angel or a ghost or like like we were taught by the lord ourselves trying to argue against this paul guy so the question becomes, what is really going on in the New Testament? And did they finally say, we need to save face and mend these guys and using the book of Acts and Second Peter to say, Peter's like, oh, Paul's a smart guy. He's a little confusing at times, but trust me, he agrees with what I'm saying and they make him on the same page. Uh, so it's like yeah. if there was a other following, a large following of these other prophets existing in Babylon, there might have been some... I guess you'd say co-opting both ideas and making them on the same page, but because Jeremiah is probably one out, this idea probably won out in Babylon. They said, hell no, we're not doing that. Are you kidding me? We're going to end up getting killed. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, no, I think, I think you're on the right track here. And really this is, I, I would say that the, the, the appreciation by the Jews of Jeremiah is probably something that only happened well after the fact, after uh, they returned, returned. I mean, that's something we can we can <laughs> talk about at length another time. But but uh, after the so-called remnant reestablished themselves in Jerusalem, um, after they rebuilt the temple, these writings of Jeremiah and and likely something closer to what I have been reading from. Uh, in in the Septuagint version, were were collected and they looked and they're like, oh look, there's a there's a lot of good stuff in here. This guy, this prophet Jeremiah, uh, was talking about a lot of things that that did actually happen to come to pass. Um, he's got a theology that we really like. Um, we can we can use this. So it's and kind of I into in in many respects it is there's definitely i would say there's a historical kernel within the book of jeremiah but it's absolutely been beefed up in various ways in particular with with a much more positive reflection on the exiles in babylon than what jeremiah originally had and i'm gonna with the last 10 minutes or so that we have here i'm gonna finish up with this so okay. just to give you uh, kind of a background of what's going on at this time. So here's just a very brief thumbnail sketch of what happened uh, during the exile. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Judah for a long time had been uh, a vassal of Egypt under the, the control of Egypt. In fact, the, the king, uh, Jehoiakim, his father, Josiah, the great reformer, 
um, actually was 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 killed in in a, a conflict with uh, Pharaoh Nico the um, second. Jehoiakim becomes the the king, and during his reign, um, the uh, the the political winds change, and Babylon becomes powerful. Nebuchadnezzar uh, sweeps down the Mediterranean coast, conquering all the way. Uh, he fights at Carchemish, which is in Egypt. And while he's fighting there, his father uh, passes away, and he has to rush back to Babylon to become the uh, the new king of Babylon. Um, and at this point in time, uh, Judah then passes into the hands of Babylon. Um, in 597... Uh, or, or I, sh leading up to le uh, uh, just pro probably around 600, leading up to 597, Jehoiakim starts to feel like he he's strong enough to rebel against Babylon, and probably uh, emboldened by the fact that Nebuchadnezzar is a young man, uh, just recently installed as king, thinks maybe he can find a weakness there and uh, exploit it, so he stops paying tribute. Nebuchadnezzar responds in 597 by sending his army to Jerusalem. He captures the city and he exiles all of its leading citizens, including the king. So King, uh, or sorry, um, uh, King Jehoiakim passes away right before Nebuchadnezzar. His poor son, Jeconia, ends up taking the throne just in time for Nebuchadnezzar to arrive and to exile him. And his family and all of his his servants to Babylon. So these are the people whom Jeremiah is speaking to in this letter. Okay. Okay. Um, Nebuchadnezzar installs a puppet ruler by the name of Zedekiah. No relation to the um, uh, the the Zedekiah who's mentioned in um, in this letter. Um, but anyways, he he installs a puppet ruler, Zedekiah. And Zedekiah also, after being in, in, on the throne in Jerusalem for a few years, decides that he is going to rebel against Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar responds in 586 uh, by saying enough is enough. He sends his army down to Jerusalem. They siege it. It's a terrible siege. Um, they breach the walls. They destroy the temple. They burn the city and exile more of uh, basically uh, a whole bunch more of the, uh, of the of the leading residents, leaving all the poor people just to fend for themselves on the land. So this is the backdrop against which the uh, the the prophecies of Jeremiah are set. Now I encourage your you and your your uh, audience to read through some really interesting stuff. In Jeremiah 26, 27, and 28, the three chapters preceding this letter in chapter 29. In mm -hmm. chapter 26, Jeremiah prophesies um, during the rule of Jehoiakim. Um, he speaks against the evil ways of the people of Jerusalem and promises that Yahweh will make his house, the temple, like Shiloh and make this city a curse among all the nations of the earth. Now, Shiloh was in ancient times the Levitical shrine um, that was abandoned, probably at some point around the establishment of the Jerusalem temple. It too was probably a competing place of worship with its own priesthood that was abandoned uh, at some point in the long distant past. And what Jeremiah is saying here is that just like what Yahweh did at Shiloh and abandoned it, he's going to do to the temple in Jerusalem. This is during the rule of Jehoiakim. And he says this in the temple courts and it gets him in big trouble. He gets arrested. Um, they threaten to kill him. Um, but he, he manages to survive that. Do Dr. Jer Kip, we only, yes. we literally only have five minutes till your video premieres. Yes. And I'm I got finishing a question. I was going to ask quick. you about Dr. Okay. Heiser just to get, just to but please finish up real quick. And I want everyone okay. to go to this video with me after this. So go ahead. All right. So in Jeremiah 27, he's Jeremiah prophesies again by making like a, like a yoke that you put on the, on the shoulders of a cow um, 
for, for tilling uh, the ground. So he makes a bunch of yokes and sends them to the kings of the region in Moab and Ammon, Tyre and Sidon with a message that uh, Yahweh is going to set them all under the authority of Nebuchadnezzar, the king. Uh, this prophecy is delivered sometime later. This is uh, this is during the reign of Zedekiah, Zedekiah, um, the puppet ruler of Babylon. So, um, uh, where was I here? Oh yes. So, and anyone who rebels will be visited by plagues and destruction. Um, and Zedekiah himself is instructed to submit to Babylon. And Jeremiah says the vessels, the temple vessels that he took, the first things that he took the first time he was here, they're not coming back because during this time, there's this growing political um, uh, anticipation that uh, Judah can, can throw off Babylon, that they can rebel successfully. And Jeremiah is going, no, 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 you can't do that. In Jeremiah 28 he confronts another prophet by the name of Hananiah in the temple court. And Hananiah's message is this, and this is where I think it's quite interesting. Hananiah says the exile will only last for two years. It's only going to last for two years. And Jeremiah <laughs> says, oh, I wish, I wish. I mean, I sure hope you're right, Hananiah, that the exile will last for two years. But as you know, um, there were prophets in the past who, who prophesied peace and prosperity and well-being, and it was only after they were dead that these things were shown to come to fruition. So this is his way of saying, you know, I think quite sarcastically, oh, sure, sure, Hanania. Yeah, two years, sure. I guess we'll see after you're dead. So, Do but this Dr. is... Kitt, we got three three minutes, bro. This is the backdrop of this letter that Jeremiah has sent to the exiles. So I'll finish there. Okay, so what I'd like to do is continue this at a further time because this is important. Jeremiah is like a very uh, interesting book people just neglect. So one thing, yeah. can you give us like a few sentence comment on your thoughts of Dr. Michael Heiser, who is like a heavy hitter for Christians? Uh, I, I've actually heard him say he doesn't agree with the documentary hypothesis and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff too. Um, can you give us your two cents thoughts on that? And then I want to plug the YouTube. Everyone who's watching, if you have the time, please come join me on Dr. Kip's channel. He's about to premiere a very well done video and go subscribe to his channel too. So Dr. Kip. So I think I actually, in one of the comments on my video, somebody mentioned um, the way that Heiser um, retranslates or reinterprets one of the passages in Exodus chapter six, which is quite important for showing the, uh, the truth of the documentary hypothesis, the different sources uh, reinterprets it in such a way that could possibly suggest that um, it's actually a unified text. I won't, I won't go into it, uh, but I will say that um you have to be very, very creative, um, I think, as an exegete in order to overcome the overwhelming amounts of evidence for the documentary hypothesis and for the humanness of the Bible, which is really what I would say if there's one thing I'm all about, it's it's that. It's the humanness of the Bible. Right. Um, and you, like I said, you have to be extremely creative to overcome these things. And Heiser is is a brilliant scholar um, he knows his stuff and he uses, he, he uses this to his advantage to come up with creative ways to, I would say, uh, counter more popular, more consensus scholarly theories about the construction of the very human Bible. So I don't know how well that addresses your question, but, um, it, it and I honestly, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I honestly, I, I haven't paid a ton of attention to Heiser either. Maybe I'll have to pay more. Yeah, maybe so, maybe we'll get some videos because he's kind of a leading expert on the end of apologists that he's not yeah. as fundamentalist as they are. But nonetheless, he's a leader in their in their thing, their groups, if you will. Please, Kip Davis YouTube channel right here. I'm putting the link right here. Um, and Converse Contender, thanks for that question. 
Um, yeah, and I think that Heiser would just have another opinion, though. You have to you have to assume that this book's really magical and actually, yeah, you know, it actually is the truth. Everyone else is wrong. You have to start with that kind of idea to really piece this stuff together, in my opinion. But um, I've listened to Heiser for a long time. I used to really follow the guy. But anyway, Dr. Kip Davis YouTube channel right here on the screen, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to this video right here, okay, and it's about That's to start. Good. Let's all go. Let's all go over there. The link is in the comments. Um, I'm interested in, in having this. And by the way, Converse, I actually interviewed Dr. Heiser on his book, Demons, on this channel. Uh, I don't even think he knew I wasn't a Christian when I interviewed him. It's quite an interesting interview. I didn't even care to let him know. I just thought he had an interesting take on the Opkalu and stuff like that about Genesis 6 and all that. Anyway, I love you guys. Let's go check out his stream right now. The link is right there in the comments. And uh, this is his YouTube channel. I'll see you guys there. Thank you, Dr. Kip. See you in just a minute. Thank you, Derek. All right. Hola, como estas? Is mi nombre? I'm just teasing. Uh, what is good, everybody? <laughs> Derek Lambert here, Myth Vision Podcast. We're going to do some damage today. Damage control. I think it's it's necessary while doing damage. Okay. We're going to do something with damn in it. Okay. That's what we're going to do. And so... <laughs> I'm just being silly. Look, I got to hang out with you guys from time to time. I had this little inclination. I said, look, I really think hanging out with Myth Vision from time to time, just to have a fun little hangout, and it's not all serious, is important. But we're going to take some jabs, of course. And I have Nathan joined us today. And if you guys aren't aware who, who Nathan is, you really should be. Nathan, what is the name of your channel? And tell them a little bit about you. Yeah, like I need I need to clip that and get that enthusiasm and put it at the start of every video that I do. Like <laughs> you're silly. Yeah. You know, if you if you're not subscribed, you need to subscribe. Like you you've got such a good energy. Um you have to. My my uh. channel is called Digital Gnosis. Um and basically hello, um new person that's just joined, James. <laughs> hello. Um what what goes on on my channel basically is it, I mean, it's, it's anybody's guess. I mean, it's my it's my channel. I did, I've got a bunch of interviews on there with philosophers, um, a couple of interviews with like mathematicians and stuff. So I, I interview people um, when they have in ideas I'm interested in, basically, um, and I try and get the best out of them. I have open conversations as well on there. We've done a series on bad apologetics. Um, I'm going to be going out and doing some street epistemology type videos as well and um, with people. And I'm also starting a series on the history of logic. So I've got the first episode on um, Aristotle that should be coming out soon. And then we're going to go all the way through to like modern logic and tasking stuff. Cause I thought like I, I um, my undergraduate degrees as a software engineer, study philosophy in my spare time um, and know a little bit of maths and stuff. And in all these different subject areas, people talk about logic very like, um, Se like separately. There's not, there's very little kind of like overlap in the concepts of ideas. So I thought I, in, in learning myself and solidifying my own understanding, come up with some slides and present them to people. So if you're interested in any of that, that's going on, on my channel. Digital Gnosis. Do, do me a favor, Nathan, if you would post that in the chat. I need oh, to yeah. make you a moderator too. That way you have that in the chat section because I just figured out that that's something you can do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kip Davies, <laughs> doctor this time. I totally did not oh. realize that you were a doctor last time. Please. Yeah. Kip Davis. Huh? Did you hear that? It's Kip Davis. Yeah, I said so, that. It's the, no, you said Davies. Did <laughs> I? A, when, look, yeah. look here now. So, I'm a redneck from the South. That was a total Davis. <laughs> I meant to say Davis. Okay. So I, um, was, I, meant I was to say talking about this with my son. And when your last <laughs> name is Davis, nothing drives you. Well, there's many things that drive me crazy. But, but one of the things that drive me nuts is when people mispronounce your name. I am so, so sorry. I that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. You got the first one, but I had to I had to call you on the second one. You're gonna so, give me a break. Now you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I won't get I'm not getting damnation or anything. Um tell us Nothing a little me. bit about you real quick because I didn't know till after we did our recording that you had like worked with Emmanuel Tove. I mean like serious, serious scholarship. And so not to pat you on the back or anything, but everybody just reach, just go over there and pat him oh, on the back. Cause thank you. seriously, seriously. And no, and no, I didn't, I I've never been to the uh, university of Manchester. That's 
I guess, in Indiana. My uh, oh no, my, I thought you were going to say mine. <laughs> no, no. Are you are you in Manchester? Yeah, yeah, near the John Ryland's library with all the documents. Oh, yeah. wow, awesome! So I graduated Sorry, from the you. university, yeah. the University of Manchester, the right one. Uh, with my PhD in religions and theology, I studied with um, George Brooke at the University of Manchester, as well as Philip Alexander, um, uh, doing uh, biblical studies, Second Temple Judaism predominantly, and Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, I've had a couple of postdoc appointments here in Canada, as well as in Norway, where I worked for three years at the University of Agder, which is right on the southern tip of Norway in a city, a lovely little city called Kristiansand. Um, and while there, I was working on a project called Biblical Texts Older Than the Bible, um, which resulted in the publication of this book, which is uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and Artifacts from the Skoyan Collection. Uh, Martin Skoyan is a private collector of manuscripts who lives in Oslo, and uh, he's got He's got some kind of collection. Like, it's an eclectic uh, collection of all sorts of things, not just Bible. But he's got, um, like, he's got ancient Near Eastern artifacts. He's got um, some uh, biblical manuscripts. He's got, like, uh, folios from the Vatican Library. He's got, uh, he's got one of the, the um, largest and most impressive collection of Buddhist manuscripts in private collections of Buddhist manuscripts. Um, and he's also got some some pretty neat modern day stuff, original letters and artwork by Beatrix Potter, as well as the draft copy of uh, The Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling. So he's a, he's a serious, serious collector. But anyways, um, we published all of his Dead Sea Scroll fragments and artifacts, what we thought were Dead Sea Scrolls fragments and artifacts at the time, um, turned out that uh, most of what he has in his collection is forgeries. Uh, and I was, in, I was involved in the, uh, in the um, uh, discovery of that unfortunate fact. Um, Simultaneously, while I was uh, working on the publication of Dead Sea Scrolls fragments at the Museum of the Bible, which also have now been uh, shown all to be forgeries. Um, so I've been involved in all, all that kind of stuff. And I just got an email uh, from some colleagues at Art Fraud Insights uh, this last week, and we're going to work together on uh, on an article for a scientific publication here in the next uh, number of months trying to uh, um, uh, do like a collaborative work on the science of the forgeries combined with the with the scribal stuff so yeah. real quick um what are you what's your credentials cool. what are your credentials real quick for everybody i have a phd in religions and theology from the university of manchester awesome thank you the, down the real I, one the real one in manchester uk <laughs> well look down yeah. in the description his youtube is there make sure you guys subscribe to his youtube channel go give him some love because you've edited a couple different videos that actually look really good they're well done you take a jab at the christian apologist and i commend you for that which is why mm -hmm. i really had to follow up and do some videos we're going to be doing more with you real quick james stevens valiant welcome to myth vision again my brother creating oh. christ author of creating christ and you've got the website creatingchrist.com. You do. You are a skeptic. You're like you're like me. You're like Nathan. You're like Kip. You're we're all skeptics here. So, to on, some degree. Well, on matters certainly on matters all matters religious. <laughs> I am uh, a thorough skeptic, and uh, of course, when it comes to ancient history, I think we all need to have. It. I'm glad you popped in. I didn't know you would, and I was glad you did. I right. I sent out a huh. Thanks for the invitation. Well, yeah. Anytime I can get you on, man. Look, you just have a, a way with words. And, dude, you should see all the DMs from the chicks after the show. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <I'm>, 
share the DMs from the checks. Oh, don't you to tell Holly about them. But uh, it's, I was going to say, it's amazing you know what a DM now. is. I'm just saying, you know. I, I find it kind of astonishing that you would say that. Hey, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, but seriously, I wanted to bring you guys on to hang out and talk about what I thought was an interesting discussion. And that is, uh, for those who don't know, there's Christian apologists out there who actually think the Bible doesn't borrow from anything else, right? Everyone else borrows from the Bible. This is known by Josephus. This is known from Jewish apologists and Christian early church fathers. Everyone borrowed from them uh, other than the time and I can't remember the church father who said, well, uh, the, the reason these stories look like the pagans uh, is because Satan knew a yeah, long time Carter, ago. The second century uh, said, no, no, no. If there's any parallels, it's because y'all stole it from us, even though we didn't yet exist. Yeah, Satan Which knew that. It's a kind of argument to make. Yeah. So yeah. I did a silly thumbnail. Did you guys see my thumbnail that I just I made? You guys probably didn't. I've not seen it yet. The one that YouTube wouldn't let you upload? Yeah, I finally let me do what I was trying to do. Oh, okay. Here, I'll share it with you guys real quick. Right. For you. And this is funny. Everyone else seen it. Everybody who's like tuning in. This is what it looks like. This is me. Um, I don't actually have a brain. Uh, ask, Darth, ask Darth Dawkins. He calls me dumb Derek now. So um, it's okay because little dingy Darth doesn't have much on me. It's all good. You know what I mean? Anyway, uh it's no, Derek, you've been. Uh, may I just say something about you now? You have been knocking it out of the park. Thank you, buddy. I mean, the interviews you've been doing and the interviews you're lining oh, up, yeah. you are becoming one of the important sources. I mean, really, one of the important sources on the internet when it comes to serious yeah. religious scholarship. And uh, it's, in, it's impressive. To, really. Yeah, well, I can tell you this. I learned how to clone myself. So I have three or four of me just doing the same job, which is why you see so much. Kip, we're getting a lot of static on your end, brother. On my end? Yep. Oh, that's better now. Oh, okay. Sorry. I was probably too far away from the mic. It might be. Just if it gets any worse, relaxed. we'll just try just the, the camera mic if we have to. But either way, um, sure. let's ask – let's ask – Kip, quick question, and and first I want to ask Nathan. Nathan, do you think the Bible uh, uses other source material to create its narrative? And I know you're not an expert in this, but it wasn't too long ago that you and me were drinking the Kool Aid. So, yeah, um, I I mean, interestingly, even before I became a Christian, I mean, in a, in a bad way, like I, I had bad hot takes, but like I was aware that. Um, that there were other ancient Near Eastern influences. Like I'd watched, for example, that Jordan Peterson's um, psychological interpretation of the biblical series, and he's not a very good Bible scholar, but he does talk about um, JEPD, like in there, for example, and he talks about these other ancient Near Eastern myths, like of um, Marduk fighting like Tiamat and the the kind of blood and the or is that. Is that right? Marduk fighting someone and then Tiamat, the chaos god, or something coming out of the the creation coming out of the blood. I can't quite remember. Yeah. And I, I was familiar yeah. with some of that stuff um, when I went into Christianity and was think uh, and I was familiar with like flood um, stories. I was familiar with the, like some of the co content in like um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Enuma Elish, and stuff like that. Um, the weird thing was, I think for me, that I adopted. A, like really literal realist Protestant interpretation because of like peer pressure in Bible studies over time. So I'd kind of say, oh, well this like, couldn't this be like the, these other flood myths or something? And the peer pressure would be like, um, oh, you could, that's a wrong way to think about it. So I'd be like, I need to stop saying like, I catch myself as I'm talking, but um, it, you know, I'd, I'd start to think, well, this is literal facts. This is like um, propositions, a bullet point list about the way the world is. And I need to kind of smooth over my belief system with what the Bible has to say rather than these kind of... And the other sources just stop being a problem. It was a really weird, like, cognitive bias psychology thing that happened. But um, because I was aware at a time that it... Um, but but anyway, the, the point is then late, later on as well now, oh, it, it's really clear that... Um, there's kind of like theological innovations going on throughout all the Old Testament, through the New Testament as well, obviously, and people kind mm -hmm. of writing against a background web of um, cultures and beliefs, like even in 
um, the second half of Isaiah around 53 or something, there's something about like Yahweh fighting uh, Rahab, like a sea monster. And it's like, oh, that's a bit different from the Genesis creation myth, isn't it? Like, um, to, to, uh, and, and Christians just sort of ignore that stuff for you're, the most part. I mean, yeah. You're getting Kip and James oh. Wills turning right now. <laughs> Look, Kip, I can see it. Go ahead, talk, brother. So I think, I, and one of the things that I, um, that I get a little bit frustrated with in terms of how uh, apologists will approach this idea of borrowing is that there's within the Bible, within ancient Near Eastern literature, there's all sorts of different layers and all sorts of different types of ways the authors will borrow from each other. Or um, I would say actually maybe the most predominant way is more implicitly it's conscious conscious thing it's not necessarily um what uh what inspiring philosophy said in his recent video he poisoned the well right from the get-go by calling it plagiarizing it's not that most most of the time it's not that most of the time we're dealing with uh oh common... your mic oh. really satan's uh -oh. trying to totally. stop you from spreading the truth here my friend totally uh, do do we need to unplug it and just go with the flow or let's see how you sound can you hear it hello it, it yeah. sounds a little bit like you're in a well though or something you know like yeah, um yeah, a bit muffled like, well, yeah, yeah perhaps. just yell at us and we'll hear you <laughs> i don't know what happened i actually i just that was me bumping my uh oh, you're good. The, you're the good. cable on my headphones i'm good now you're okay back. so, you so were point it's it's not uh, at least not usually real what we'd call plagiarism conscious plagiarism mm -hmm. at all it's common traditions right that tend to get circulated all over the place right and and this is and this is something that uh i, I mean I, I i guess i can i can appreciate why uh apologists and and why why fundamentalists and literalist Christians are threatened by this kind of thing, yeah. But uh, it it shouldn't be all that. Well, I guess on a on a surface level, it shouldn't seem like it's it's all that threatening. Maybe one of the reasons that it is is because of all the implications behind that. Like some of the borrowing that we see, or some of the the, the common traditions that we see um, through, throughout the uh, the Bible. Um, provide some it, it can provide some some really unpleasant um really odd interpretations or understandings of of ancient texts that that uh that just don't come through in uh in in the modern in our modern translations in our modern understanding of what the text is doing so you know it's there and uh, when you get into it, um, it, it, it really does open up a whole new way of looking at the text and exploring the text and understanding what's, what's going on. Um, I think we were, just before the show, we were talking about uh, the, the importance of grasping this idea that when you're uh, digging into the Bible as a, as a modern american european english speaker you're not just you're not just trying to penetrate an english translation of foreign languages or or texts that were written in foreign languages you're also um performing a much more difficult task of delving into and trying to to get behind an entire foreign culture an mm. ancient milieu that itself is is daunting and in many respects freaky i've told students this in um, my intro classes that oftentimes when you cut through the text to see traditions behind them they become really unsettling and kind of gross or or even weird um if i can use as an example um, something I was thinking about recently uh, over the weekend is uh, is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah from uh, Genesis chapter 19. 
we were all raised or if we you know for those of us who well, well i don't i don't know i know a little bit about derek's background james were you were you raised a christian or, yeah, I was or raised you, a traditional okay. Protestant in the united states yeah right okay so you'll you'll get this too um and nathan you came into it i came right? into it but it my d- like- i mean English primary schools sort of teach a milk toast Christianity type thing, but they don't really, right. you know, like there's this idea of Jesus, but so right. not not really bothering you, with the harmonies. Did you read the Bible? Did you read the Bible or anything? So, sung hymns, but uh, sung hymns and prayed, yeah. but no um, real Bible reading or anything. I mean, like you know of the flood story and stuff, but that's yeah. about it, really. Yeah. Right. Reading so, text is all important to us. It was, you know, yeah. good Bible protestantism you know almost a 16th century idea you gotta read the bible yourself man yeah that was that was how i was raised i was a king james onlyist speaking in tongues (laughs) non-denominational guy who went to a house church that was run by a woman (laughs) pastor that was my first church that's real and then i I, i'm not even joking with you my mom is pentecostal her side and they were snake handlers down in florida my dad was roman catholic so they came together wow. due to this miracle called alcohol at a party <laughs> and they made me. <laughs> wow. So, but so when you crack open your Bible, your English Bible, the Genesis chapter 19, and you read this story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, right away you form an idea of what's going on in this story. And you already have an idea of what it's about. When it comes to the destruction of Sodom and the judgment for for sin at Sodom. What's it about? What is the sin of Sodom? What just happened? Oh, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Dr. Josh. Josh yeah. Bowen is with us. He's doing a drive-by, I think, guys. I've, I'm dead serious. I think he's doing a drive-by right now. I know I've got uh, 15, 20 minutes, if that, unless okay. you want me to just come in and leave. No. Oh, psh- are you trying to say I'm a rude um, host? I'm just kidding. I don't think uh, I was trying to say that, Derek. Oh. It's like that, Kent. Is that how it is? Okay. <laughs> hey, Kip, I didn't mean to cut you off. We do have a no. super chat. I want to throw it out there and then finish your thought on that real quick. Hold on. Here we okay. are. Christopher Malloy, thank you for the super chat. I, oh, when people like throw money at the true church of Myth Vision, which is the true church, just so everybody knows. Um, I always look out and I try to find out their questions and answers and stuff. Out of left field, I know, but are there echoes of any pre-younger Dryas event civilizations in the Bible, or is that a reach? And that'll be a good question for Kip and Josh because Dr. Josh, because they're like, this is the field of research they go into. Pre what? Pre younger Dryas. Younger Dryas. Uh, which one is that? Is that the frozen event or a meteor? It's one of those, isn't it? We're talking old. Is, old. Um, my information, like the only place I've heard that phrase before was like a Joe Rogan podcast episode with a guy who thought that like, um, you know, like the Grand Canyon and stuff, when you when a, a drone goes up and looks at those, those um, patterns that are kind of carved out, that that must have been a global flood or something. That's where I know that from. And he says, oh, it's that's the Younger Dryas event. Like I, this big... Um, Either like a meteor glacial thawing or something like that is what I'm remembering, but I don't. I, I, that, yeah, I don't even know if it's like a mythical like thing that might not have even happened or what. I, <laughs> so that's a no. Uh, be, Christopher I, Malloy. I don't know what to do with that. Eleven thousand five hundred years ago. So from what I've heard too, and, and correct oh. me if I'm wrong here, um, this was something that uh, Randall Carlson mentions on Joe Rogan's podcast that he's a catastrophist. And that the flood narrative is actually traced back to a time where the ice age melting, the 400 foot sea rising of water and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think that's technically where the flood, you know, where the Mesopotamian flood is getting its narrative from. It's probably just something localized in that region, correct? Yeah, I I wouldn't think it's anything quite that flashy. I mean, you know, (laughs) the, the, the Tigris obviously you know, moves faster, but I mean, both the Tigers and the Euphrates, they're known to flood. It's, I mean, it's, um, yeah, I, I don't, I doubt it's anything yeah. so flashy is. How would we go about selecting the historical flood 
from with. I mean, there have been so many catastrophic floods uh, in prehistoric times <laughs> in the Near East. Uh, how how would we go about locating the flood? Uh, yeah, I don't... Geologists can tell us that, for example, the Black Sea was created by a rather spectacular flood. Even the Mediterranean, if we go back far enough, was created itself initially by a rather spectacular flood at the end of an ice age. Uh, so how do we yeah, I... zero in on the flood? I just don't think you can, and I, I really don't think that's the point either. Yeah. I mean, the the flood is is the, the whole the whole story of the flood is is uh, is an undoing, uh, at least the biblical story of the flood is an undoing of of God's creation, and that's it. so it's it's more so about just uh, uh, a a cosmic cataclysm than anything. I don't know the uh, the the Babylonian. Uh, or Acadian stuff near, nearly as well. So, well, what, you... cases, what appears suspicious to me is that they're moral fables. That is to say, it was the sinning of the people that caused God to be displeased and wipe out everyone except Noah and his family. Well, if there was a historical flood, and there were, as we've noted, many actual historical floods, it, it wasn't a punishment because of the pe people being bad, say, so what we have is maybe a historical event that has been transformed into a moral fable, and that moral fable itself is taken on generations of evolution and retelling. Welcome yeah. in, Gary. Uh, good to see you, my brother. Everybody, uh, you know, check out the description. I wish I added all the links there. Go to Digital Hammurabi. Make sure you guys subscribe and harass him because... <laughs> He's afraid to debate me even on my own channel, and he's a presuppositionalist secretly. So don't let that's, anyone. That's true, <laughs> dude. You should have seen Lawrence Krauss's response. I had to stop him just to get your question out. Literally, I was like, "Please let me just finish telling you this ridiculous question." <laughs> it's six pages long. Let me just finish. <laughs> hey, Derek, Please. I have a question. Yeah. Hey, Doctor Josh, did you did you ever debate Kent Hovind? Oh my God! I, I've heard your impression of him before, but I want to know if that debate. Happened. I have, I have not. Um, I doubt we'd have a lot to talk about, honestly, uh, because I, you know I don't know much about the size of whale penises, for one. So, um, but 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 seriously, I I think I would end up saying, yeah, I don't really have any kind of specialization in science. That's not to imply that you do, but I I don't, so I you know I don't know that I could talk about it. That's probably how it go. Did did he say to IP that Adam wrote Genesis, or was that the other young Earth creationist person? I don't know. Um, was it not, neither? It, would surprise me. <laughs> yeah, I I think it was in the um, modern day debate um, one on like um, whether the numbers and things are like symbolic or whether they're like literal years mm. or something. And it, I think I don't. I can't remember which one of them it was, but saying like, um, well, you know, when Adam wrote Genesis, he he, he didn't get it wrong. Like, <laughs> <laughs> do you guys do you guys want to see something sort of in that vein, but pretty badass? Yeah, this just came yesterday. Oh. The proof, dude. Yeah, man. Wow, it's oh, here. Man. Oh, it's it's awesome, and like, it just it looks really great. Uh, Did that cost extra to get that kind of cover? Uh, I don't know. You don't even <laughs> you know. That's Megan. You have to ask my boss. Your boss. Who that published boss. that? We did. Yeah, Digital Hammurabi oh, Press. Really? Yeah. Congratulations for you, man. Yeah. Thank you. So that's book four in two years. We should probably do something else for a while. <laughs> Dude, that's <laughs> awesome, now. That's cool. We're going to promote yep. that, obviously, when, when that gets out. We're going to be sharing that information. I'm going to be recording you at the end of this month. That's right. I'm coming to your house. And yep. we're going to debate in person. We're going to finally handle this. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fisticuffs. <laughs> Gary, you look like you got a question, awesome. brother. I No, I don't. Not right now. I just um, like hanging out. Look, Gary's Gary's my buddy from the West Coast. He joined us last time, Dr. Josh. You remember? He had mm -hmm. all those wonderful questions. Well, yep. he's got the same curiosity that we do. And 
I think like we've been talking on the phone, me and him have been making a lot of connections. I want to bring him on here more to share that, you know, show that there's a lot more outside of the community of having to be within this little cult group called Christianity, connecting the humans and having that kind of relationship is super important. Love, you just called Christianity a little cult. I love it. <laughs> it really is. I mean, look, and anyone who says it's not, hasn't really actually probed into the new Testament texts. I mean, they were doomsday cult. Like that's a fact. If you go and look at it now, of course it evolves. It takes on some spiritualizing to tone down the cognitive dissonance of the appearance of the son of man in the clouds and all, but nonetheless, it's still a doomsday cult, but every religion evolves in some way. So, but yeah, I'm glad to have Gary aboard and look, ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask one question to the panel and whoever wants to take a jab at this, it's it, this was interesting because Russell Gamirkin's book that I read and did an interview the other day. I want to ask you guys how much of Genesis one through eleven do you think borrows from the Mesopotamian mythology? Because according to uh, inspiring philosophy, no, there's not really any borrowing. It's just a it's just a a thing that's out there and maybe a cultural significance, but there's really no no borrowing from the narrative. I, I think I, I don't know if Dr. Kip should answer this because I don't think he disagrees with much of what IP says. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that premise right off the bat can be taken off the table. Um, no human human uh, development. Uh, you can't just uh, assume that someone is getting the correct revelation and that everyone else is out of the picture. Uh, it, it, from my own beginnings of assuming that, you know, there was a Christian God, I had to realize that to have a real anti come to Jesus moment where I said, no, 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 wait a minute here. Jewish monotheism evolved from an earlier polytheistic state, just as polytheism evolved from an earlier animistic psychological state uh, that, I, that it is very wrong for us to use a 20th or 21st century understanding even just of God and all the theological accretions that have occurred just in the last 500 years and to import it back 2,000 years, much less to take the ideas that they had 2,000 years ago and import it back further. It's obviously a kind of evolution of ideas that's going on. And it's not as though some uh, community, some ethnicity sprang from Mars. Uh, we all sort of have evolved from the same trunk of the same human tree. It's a question of how the most early ideas are interrelated, not a question of whether they're interrelated. The whole idea of some kind of original divine hypothesis is a mystical notion. Uh, religion evolved. Okay, what would you I, say, Doctor Kip, on some parallels? Like, would you can you can you list well, some that you know are like, guys, this is a red flag. Like, it's clearly from. So right. Away. And first of all, I, IP really hedges his bets there by, I mean, in, in his latest video, he acknowledges that there's, there's, there's common traditions circulating around, right? Um, but then we'll somehow uh, dilute that with respect to the biblical text as if it's, it's, um, it's a special version of it or it's I, I like the um the the order he says somewhere that the order of the birds uh in the uh the the genesis flood story is more realistic nautically speaking this is what a what a seafarer would do ergo you know this is this is probably the real one somehow <laughs> and the other ones decided to to make i don't know what fanciful fanciful renditions of this i don't know so but i i mean you see all sorts of you see all sorts of cross pollen i think maybe that's a better word cross pollination um um famous uh enuma enuma elish uh has a lot of affinity with with what's taking place in in genesis chapter one and um genesis chapter one the priestly creation story in many respects looks like it's 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 working very hard to be a demythologized version in to my eye 
And right. Then, uh, we really can't ignore history is going on here. If the Persian Empire comes along and, and develops an international empire, that's going to have an impact on all the subordinate cultures, including the Hebrew culture that is allowed under Nehemiah and Ezra then to return and build the to rebuild the temple. So the yeah. idea or com the coming of Alexander the Great, the conquest of, of Alexander, now you've got a bunch of Macedonian generals ruling the different countries of the Near East, Greek culture is going to come in and is going to have a profound impact. History itself is having an impact. There's wars, migrations, um, and those things are causing this cross-pollinization to necessarily occur. The God's yeah, calling. Not a question of whether they're interacting. It's a question of how they're interacting. Yeah, I think that's, in, in, my, in my experience here online, one of the things that I think is problematic is when we throw around words like plagiarized um, or even borrowed, I think, is yeah. it can be can be problematic or parallel um certainly plagiarized and megan made a whole video series about you know plagiarism and what that you know how how we use that what that means um you know certainly carries this idea of um like some, some immoral sort of action something that we would consider to be wrong and I, it's just i think that's just um anachronistic to think that way. So there's no question, as Dr. Kip was saying, I think that it's absolutely true that um, several parts of the primeval history there, Genesis 1 through 11, um, are, are sort of the Hebrew response, at least at different periods um, and in different ways, responding to things that they see, uh, you know, be they in you know, Babylonian text or, you know, maybe a, an aspect that you see over New Garret or, you know, I know Bruce Wells has written recently and I think he's putting something together now on, um, you know, the Garden of Eden and the parallels that it has uh, to, you know, the Babylonian, um, some Babylonian parallels. But I, I think that looking at the important thing to do is to not, to not come out too strong, if that's a way to say that, with that and say, oh, well, you know, the Israelites are stealing or the Israelites are, you know, plagiarizing. The example that I like to give is with the um, Enuma Elish, when the Near Assyrian Empire, uh, you know, took over uh, Babylonia at one point in the first millennium, one of the things that they did is they, they took a bunch of texts back with them. Um, and we have this sort of counter version of uh, the Enuma Elish, uh, but it features instead of Marduk as the, the, main, you know, the main deity of the story, it features Asher, you know, the Assyrian's god. Oh, yeah. And it's not that the Assyrians yeah. didn't, the Assyrians knew about, <laughs> you know, the, the, the Babylonian version of the story, they knew about it, obviously. Um, and they didn't, it wasn't this plagiarizing, they were doing something. Right there was there was power that was involved in taking a story that was about a deity who was, you know, coming to power or the rest of the deities are coming to authority and replacing that southern deity with your deity. There was something that that happened in that, and um, so I think recognizing that sort of thing and asking the question not so much which one came first because we know, but like you know, or which one's the real one. It's the, the real question I think is what is this text doing? As yeah. you know, again, as Dr. Kip pointed out, what is it that Genesis one, Genesis one is doing? What's the the priestly writer doing? Well, he's de demythologizing it. He's trying to say, um, yeah, y Yahweh did it, and he did it. Like they, these aren't even real monsters to be defeated, right? They're there in the yeah. background, but he's just that's just how good he is, you know. Real anyway. quick, we got a super chat from Philosophy in the Desert. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. To anyone, what percentage of the biblical narrative from Adam to Solomon is fictional, and with with what degree of certainty do you hold your conclusion? A so percent? from Adam, Adam to Solomon, that's a calculation from hell to try and what figure is, out. But yeah, there's so all kinds. What is? Of, yeah. Okay. What can is, what can is you fictional? Yeah. Go through like 
Name some names. Just give me some names of non-existent characters. You don't. You think on the most probable side don't exist biblical, all the way down to Solomon. From Adam. Adam didn't exist. Let's go ahead and get uh, that one out of the way. <laughs> sure. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, Cain, Abel. <laughs> yeah, I. It's. Uh, Are we saying that there's no historical basis for the person? <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to have to say I don't know. Even yeah, in yeah. The most mythologized characters, even in the most mythologized characters, uh, let's remove ourselves from the Jewish context. Was and there I a think computer? fictional. I think fictional's um, a problematic term here too. No, yeah. like, like we we have an idea of what a fictional uh, character is. But so, like, lots of lots of these figures are are grounded in or or based on perhaps uh, real people. You know, I've I've it's been uh, popular for some time to to think that uh, that a lot of the um, attributes and a lot of the story of uh, of Moses certainly in Egypt. I think is drawn from uh, Parallels with Sargon of Akkad, a real historical figure, right? So how far do we want to go with this? I mean, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of of um, echoes in the figures from from the Old Testament with with real people, whether they existed or not. And I think again, that, that's that's one of those that's one of those questions, and it's one of those points of exploration that uh, to my way of thinking it misses the point of, of what the Bible uh, is trying to communicate and and maybe how we should in the first place try to understand it before taking the second step and uh, and now, now what to do with it. Ladies and gentlemen, hit that like button. We're this far in I ask everyone to help the algorithm. Hit that like button. Drop a comment. Show us you love us. And real quick, uh, do you guys know what this is right here? So, D Dr. Josh, this That's... this I, it's in the background. It's in the background of Dr. Josh's office. But the reason why I say this is because this looks very much like a serpent type of creature. Like it's not. It's not like a regular, like a leopard or like a feline or something. This thing is like a serpent type creature. And Russell Gamirkin said that this mimics, because it, it comes from the same region that a lot of these myths that we're talking about come from. This might be similar to a creature that we're describing in Genesis. Do you guys think it's possible? I mean, it's now no longer have legs and, and whatnot. So now it's going to slither on its belly, the curse and whatnot. But this okay. is a is a creature from that region. What do you guys think? The rabbinic traditions actually have have the have the, the, the snake be limb be limb as part of his uh, his punishment. Hmm. Genesis Genesis Rabbah. Um, but you know, but I think it's, I think it's plausible. You're you're definitely echoing, and I think it's. Sorry. It, there's no 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 it's not it's not like you intentionally are doing it you're doing 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 it that's like literally what's happening bro it's great it's i wanted i wanted to ask nathan um because nathan like you and james kind of deal with this stuff a lot i think on your channel um because I, this is what i think of when i think of questions about the historicity of the person of jesus right i think about you know, when somebody asks me, oh, you know, Josh, what do you think about Jesus? Was he a, there you go. <laughs> like, do I think he was a historical person or not? Well, I mean, where my brain goes instantly is well, what does the consensus scholarship say? Because it's not my field. Um, and that's my answer, right? Because what is, <laughs> it's not my field. What do the consensus of scholars in this field say? But the bigger question that comes to my mind immediately is who cares? I mean, Sure, that's an interesting question, maybe strictly from a historical standpoint. But the reason that I think it gets so much traction is because there's something behind it that we're trying to say um, 
well, if we can, you know, drop the axe on Jesus even existing, well, then we don't have to worry about this whole Christianity thing. Well, I think it even um, differently than that. I think that in the late 19th century, this uh, critical scholarship generated a quest for the historical Jesus by people who thought that if they found the real Jesus, they would find the, quote, real deal, and that there'd be something significant to being able to identify the actual words of a historical Jesus, as opposed to what sounds like no real historical Jesus could have ever said, uh, which is what critical scholarship was beginning to identify. And I think at this point, yeah, I think there are people who have an active agenda to say, if we can knock, uh, we can call Jesus a whole myth. And I don't even get the logic there. I mean, the idea of a historical Jesus certainly doesn't demonstrate his divinity or anything mystical at all. Uh, but you're right, there is a certain contemporary motive that way, but I think it actually began as a desire by uh, Christians who were trying to retain both a kind of Christianity and uh, the insights of critical scholarship. Let's find the real Jesus and find the real wisdom, uh, the real deal, um, and uh, obviously a misbegotten quest in itself. Uh, but you're right, why should the question of the historical Jesus be significant. We have an overwhelmingly influential character. He is the mythologized figure in the Gospels and in Paul's letters. That guy had a huge impact, a nuclear impact on Western civilization and world history. And we, we know that. Uh, <laughs> and that's the guy that matters. Is that I think, character? I, I, I'd like to say one thing as someone who was mythicist and has now gone toward the historic side. I'm not certain. I'm not going to act like I know what the arguments are. I've been doing the show probably like seven or 800 videos with Dr. Price. I know what <laughs> mythicism teaches. Um, however, one thing I do want to teach both sides, the people who are maximalist and minimalist to the core of being a mythicist is to not be dogmatic. So when someone says, no, I think a historical Jesus makes plausible sense. They're not saying, oh, I found a fingerprint or here's his sandal. We know that's not what we're saying. And, and it almost sounds like the skeptic mythicist will say, well, then give me the sandal or I'm not accepting that there could have been a guy or I think there was a guy or most probably there was a guy. And so I love this conversation. I love this question because at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if he was mythologized or if he didn't exist, but it can use using methodology it can potentially get us closer to what really happened and taking this naturalistic approach that i've been doing recently and i'm not talking about biblically i'm talking about in the world around me like my epistemology is becoming scientific and i'm trying to take an approach to the world around me i'm thinking to myself okay did they wholly concoct this thing and it's a written narrative after the fact or is there potentially real people hallucinating post bereavement hallucinations what could answer naturally for why a cult would develop to begin with and someone rise from the dead elvis presley he's alive really i mean well, people really believe he's alive well, he's have, a real guy you know have I mean? actual sincere hallucinations and these there are a whole category of schizophrenics and psychotics who are detached from reality uh and uh so when you look read some of this apocalyptic literature you're right. Uh, it sounds like, whew, who's, you know, what drugs did they take? You know, what <laughs> mushroom did somebody accidentally consume uh, that they are seeing fiery chariots and various beasts and so forth? But then you can look at Daniel and say, no, 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 no. Someone is actually putting together a sort of symbolic allegory here. And so while there may be some crazy psychosis involved in the creation of it, there also appears to be some philosophical, historical, maybe even political combing over. Um, it's constructed in an intelligent way. I think you have to say the same about, say, the apocalypse of, uh, of John, Revelation. It sounds like, wow, crazy drug. What drugs has this guy taken? Uh, or at least elements of it are like that. But when you really look at it, someone has actually uh, systematically combed through this. And whether we understand what he's saying or not, there appears to be a message. Absolutely. We went to the New Testament, guys. We were supposed to stay in Genesis, but I'm going to I'm going to mention a, a couple cuz Nathan decided he just wasn't going to comment. I tried to draw him. Well, no, I, I, 
I just, I, just I, I, I mean, think I was thinking about your answers as well. I guess in, in response to the question, and um, I agree that there is there's some idea, and maybe that idea is even like a slightly Protestant one. It's like that if we can, if we sort of do our work right and get behind the history, then we'll figure out you know the real Jesus. I mean, I mean, maybe it's it's fairly obvious. Um, why it's so important just like really trivially like i can look out my window and see like church spies right maybe it's not so uh, the set exactly the same in america because things are, but certainly in europe like christianity is so um embedded in like the legal system the history the politics the architecture and everything and so i guess there's just i mean it we I don't think anyone like before they has kids goes like, um, well, let's just come up with like the perfect language to like use um, for all the uses that we have in our culture. Or it's just this like inherited web of like beliefs and meanings and stuff like that. And that in a large part has been like really informed by Christianity. So then, um, and then there's still like actual Christian stuff hanging around like me in primary school, you know, like singing my hymns and do it. So then as I become an adult and I go, well, what the hell's the world all about? I'm like, well, I want to find out about this Jesus guy or Christianity. And, um, and, and there's this thing of like, well, our, what do our best people do about that? Well, they do history. They try and like get behind, you know, like the, the sort of appearances in the text and sit to see what's really going on. And maybe there's this idea then that we can do that with Jesus. And then we'll get to, we'll figure out like how it is that we're in the position that we're in by figuring out the character behind these concepts that are so influential on us. I think, I think it's something like that. Um, but I, as to whether it's like always been like that, as well like there's I, i've been reading recently about all these weird stories of for example um when european thought had like moved ahead of english thought like bi english biblical scholars who are like 200 years behind like i think his name was pusey or something he goes over to germany um funded to study under a guy called icorn um and then he starts like learning all the all these things about like what we almost what we would just consider like trivially history uh, but then when when he comes back and starts like talk he's like oh yeah and Oh, I think um, I actually read one of the excerpts from his um, diary or something where he was saying about when Jesus cast the um, the demons out into the pigs and everyone in the classroom was like laughing at it. And he sa he says there was only one solemn face or something like this. And it's like really shocking to him. But I guess he goes back and talks about it in that sense and um, is basically kind of getting like prosecuted by those around him. He eventually ends up coming back to the classical orthodoxy. But you see at this time, like so many weird things it's not just like one clear cut picture. Like there's also the, um, there's this completely different idea of theology from like the German liberal people who are sort of like, they think they can get out of it by like assuming naturalism. And they're just going to assume that like everything that happens is, um, has like some underlying natural explanation, like a, like a, um, yeah, demon possession is like a seizure, but more primitive people didn't know about it. And they're interpreting everything that way. There's weird like Hegelians who are trying to interpret it through the world idea. But then when we come to assess like, why do we look at it the way that we do? It's not, there isn't like this one story to be told. It's like the process of all these things. And like probably people in the future will look back at what we're doing and think we're a bit weird. But I guess, I guess like the, the idea that I think it is, is just try and get it who the historical character is. And then figure out if there's any truth to it but that's like again there's philosophical assumptions of like realism and stuff like um a guy called don cupid talks about non-realist theology and like where you you take this whole different philosophy of language and all of a sudden like of course god exists it's just what the use of the term um in a, in a language based on like a Wittgensteinian. there's too much to it um uh I don't know. Like, I, I don't have all the answers. There's so much, like, it's, it's just so interesting. Yeah. Analysis is very, very <laughs> limited. Uh, I try to focus on the real world, and I guess that's the temptation. You know, that's the pull for history for me, is that it actually has the concrete reality. And that's the temptation, too, isn't it? We want to find the ultimate concrete reality, even when we can't sometimes find it, or we don't have the information behind it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think of, for example, the creation of Serapis in uh, Ptolemaic Egypt. And we're sort of given an account of it by Tacitus himself, which I find utterly fascinating. How we Egypt has its new pharaoh, who's Macedonian, speaks Greek. It comes from 
Greek culture, in effect, and he's converting o Osiris into something else. Osiris is now taking on different features of other deities uh, uh, in the Mediterranean. He brings over a priest from Eleusis, from the mysteries, uh, the Greek mysteries, uh, uh, presumably uh, worshiping Demeter, uh, Dionysus, someone uh, expert there, using the ideas of Apollo and uh, Asclepius and integrating them, fusing them with Osiris to create a, a whole new deity, a whole new deity. Mm. So this interaction, sort of that we started with, the question of interaction, it seems to me uh, a much more fruitful, fruitful uh, kind of investigation is to see how, for example, those moments in history are causing the interaction uh, to create the new sort of thing. Um, and frankly, Serapis himself uh, is a healing deity uh, based on Asclepius, who is strangely echoing of Jesus. We have a child of a god, an immortal woman, who goes around both healing and resurrecting, gets martyred, enjoys his own apotheosis, and is worshipped as both a healing and resurrection god um, himself. Now, is there a what is the direct connection, say, between Asclepius, Serapis, and Jesus? That's in my view, got to have some kind of specific historical causal interaction that can explain it. And once you've found that, that echo is almost impossible to dismiss as not being at least an echo. I wouldn't call it necessarily plagiarism or theft. Uh, that would depend on how we interpret the degree of uh, self-conscious fraud that the authors are engaged in, which I think is very rare in the history of religion. I think it's usually some kind of religious or pious fraud. Uh, but I do think there are concrete historical steps in which these things develop and are shared. And uh, when and if we can identify them, such as Ptolemy's creation of Serapis, uh, we can actually locate in history uh, with the event of the Macedonian conquest of Egypt. Um, uh, I think that's probably the most fruitful uh, way to pursue the subject. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, I was waiting. I, mean, I was like, I'm going to drag him as soon as this happens. Put him on the spot. I, I think in this discussion, um, to sort of bring it back to the original question and what I, what I felt that it was driving at, I, I think a good comparison would be to ask that question about Gilgamesh. Right? Did Gilgamesh exist? Well, yeah. I mean, we have pretty decent evidence. You can read Andrew George on that. Um, but we have, you know, reasonable evidence that there was a guy named Gilgamesh who was king in Uruk, right, in the third third millennium. Does that mean that, you know, and I've said this before, but does that mean that he ran through a tunnel and outran the sun? You know, did he did he use three hundred punting poles to get across the Sea of Death? You know. No, I mean, of course, that's not what that means. Right? That one does not entail the other. Um, but I think that, and <clears throat> the problem is that I think most people are willing to grant that. Like nobody, nobody gasped. I suspect when I said, "Yeah, Gilgamesh was a you know probably a real guy." You know, there was nobody in the side chat that went, "Oh my God!" Like I can't believe he said that. Because even if they didn't think he was real, and then I, you know, I said scholars tend to think that he he was. I go, oh, I'm, okay, um, we don't have a problem separating this guy existed and then this whole legend and this, these epics were written and built up around him. Um, but I think when we come to the biblical text, it becomes a lot more problematic for people. And I think about the Exodus, um, and I've, I've started writing the chapter of volume two uh, on the Exodus, and you know, it, it's not enough to just say, yeah, I mean, maybe read somebody like, I know you're going to be talking to Ronald Hendel, but I mean, you're thinking about the memory and the memory that drove perhaps, uh, you know, the, the development of the Exodus story. Is it okay that there may have been several Exodus-like events that took place over a couple hundred years? Is that okay? I mean, is that, does that bother anybody? It shouldn't, right? <laughs> I don't, I don't think we have to, you know, go to our graves 
fighting to say no moses was definitely a myth or you know that there's no sort of exodus at all like it, maybe i mean maybe you know maybe those are, things are true maybe there is no M moses at, at all in history and you know uh maybe there was no actual exodus event at, at all any type of kernel of truth but it doesn't matter if there was um it doesn't matter if there was i think it's the, the bigger point is so. Well, I'm going to do a little shameless plug here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me let me share this because a lot of people who watch hit that like button, too, while you're watching, guys. Um, a lot of people don't realize how much freaking work that I do. And this is a shameless plug on my, my Patreon, guys. I did Lawrence Cross. Right. I did like I broke down the video in like if you can't stand 50 minutes, you can get like two, three minute clips. Like, look, he says, like, theologians contribute nothing to knowledge. And, like, for the last 500 years, he says some pretty blunt stuff in this interview, right? Then it gets into Margaret and Margaret Barker. Sorry, Elaine Pagels. I'm actually working on Margaret Barker. And then I can hit load more. You guys will see more. But I have a ton more material. So if you're not a Patreon member, you're probably going to burn, okay? And that's, <laughs> you know? It's just a fact, and this is like no emotion. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not, you know, it's just. Uh, That's yeah. the fifth circle of Dante's. That's what's right. going to happen. Right. Yep. right. So, Kip, welcome back, man. I heard the rapture <laughs> failed, so you were sucked out of, yeah. out of this world, and then we definitely didn't get the notice because we are so heretical. It's like, you know. They didn't want me. No, we, we oh, didn't. I, didn't, I heard I God didn't call make the you. Cut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I'm an old guy. This 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 technology is is uh, is beyond me. I probably got you all beat here. You're all whippersnappers. Real 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 quick. I can't, dude. Sure I not. have to do this again. I'm so sorry. I'm really not because I don't care because I always plug. Um, I have to plug Dr. Josh's book here on Amazon. While you guys bear with me here, it is the Atheist Handbook. Correct, Dr. Josh. I think if you just search on Joshua Bowen, it'll come up. Joshua Bowen. It is. It's the atheist handbook to the Old Testament, but okay. Sorry, I'm over here. I got. I got to share this, man, because this is a Thank beautiful you. book. Oh, no problem, brother. Um, can, is it available as we speak right now? It's available for pre-order on Kindle. It's the only thing it'll let us do. Um, but it, its release date is May 28th. So. I, I think if you if you pre-order on the Kindle, it immediately downloads to your Kindle on the 28th when it's released. But the hardcover will be available on the 28th as well for purchase. Go and on Megan, Amazon. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm like scoring so many points saying what I'm saying right now because Megan is gonna be so happy with me plugging this. Um, Congratulations! If you <laughs> if you email her, uh, she'll send you like a quote for shipping and everything or whatever on getting a signed copy when it comes out. So Very I've scored all the points that I need to score. Are you going to be lucky <laughs> man tonight or <laughs> we're going to, we're going to, we're going to watch Dr. Who. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. You guys are awesome. But thank Seriously. you. Thank you for putting that up. Of course, man. Thank you for tuning in. I know you have to go here in a minute and um, I respect that somewhat. Um, <laughs> look, sure. Dragons in Genesis, my good friend. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for the super chat. Go subscribe to his channel. I've got a ton of videos of his with Dr. Price on my Patreon. So you guys, you know, there's a lot of good stuff. Do you know why the second thief at the crucifixion wasn't accepted by Jesus? Because he didn't hit that like button. <laughs> you understand? I don't think you understand. <laughs> Let them who have eyes see and ears hear the truth that cometh from dragons. So, um, can, anyways. Can I ask Dr. Josh a book question? Please. Sure. Your, um, when did your uh, Old Testament slavery book come out? It was 2020, uh, maybe January, February 2020, I think. Oh, okay. So it hasn't been that long. So, um, but, and you published something yourself, right? Mm -hmm. 
Have you gotten any uh, any uh, traction, like in the academic community, with that? Oh, Is anybody reviewing it, or uh, I mean, it's had reviews. I don't. I don't think it's been like. Uh, no, not academically reviewed. It's not really. No. There's nothing. We're trying really hard. Sounds weird. We're trying yeah, really yeah. hard not to. We're not trying to publish groundbreaking things. Uh, we're yeah. trying to just make good resources for non-specialists. So, like, our Sumerian grammar has tons of traction, and it's being used, oh, which is really cool. That's really good. Um, but it, it, I think it would be sort of pointless for somebody to review it because it would be reviewing consensus yeah. scholarship. That's what it would be right. doing. So, right. um, well, that happened, but it's true. No, it's that's true. Cool. Well, there's a whole way of evaluating textbooks, right? That's true. Exactly. Like it. Real, real quick, let me let me plug that too. There's there's the Sumerian book. Is this gonna? What are you guys gonna be doing while you're watching Doctor Who? Huh? I'm drinking huh? tea and coffee <laughs> at, at this point. I can tell you that much. I'll probably get some instant coffee now. <laughs> oh man, Nathan, what, these, these aren't euphemisms, uh, by the way. <laughs> anybody was wondering. <laughs> No. Hey, listen, I'm a guarantee and I have a room to sleep in when I come to visit you guys. That's what I'm trying to do. You know what I mean? So, Megan, just in case you watch this, um, thank you for allowing me to sleep in one of the rooms in the house. I appreciate it. Um, Kip, Kip, you got something you want to add, man, because the way I understood it, and I, I agree with the assessment that it may not be actual plagiarism. Like, I can't... Uh, hmm. Verse 30 of chapter 5 of Gilgamesh speaking in Enkidu, you know, verbatim, no. But it sounds like there's an adaptation for sure. Like, it's, you know, it sounds like he is using this narrative. You've got this. Oh, yeah. Did you want to go ahead and comment on he's that? He's drawing, so he's drawing from, really, I, I like to think cer certainly in terms of ideas, too, right? Like, there's a... Uh, there's a circulation of ideas that are connected to to um, the myths that are that are are common or or at least commonly known um, to the people in the ancient Near East. And we see this in the Hebrew Bible, where like in the Genesis chapter two creation story, um, ideas about uh, about what it means to eat from the tree of the knowledge. Of good and evil, um, what it means to be naked and then clothed, um, what it, what what these sorts of things mean. I'm getting a, God's oh, trying to find you because you're naked. He's no, wondering where you're at. She's taking the dog. God, that's that's my. That's dog. God for he's you, taking, man. He's <laughs> taking the dog. Um, so there's yes. So there's what it what it means to be to be naked or clothed or what it means um, to eat from the tree what what immortality is what what it means to know good and evil these are the sorts of things that um, are are part of a, a larger milieu that that I think is is really where the traction of this conversation belongs um so there's there's a there's a common knowledge there's um a a common understanding of of metaphor and symbolism that that's all latent in this text that we don't see on the surface of it because we don't have access to to or or at least if you're just reading the bible you don't have access to to the ways they're thinking about these sorts of things. And that's really the, the tremendous value of all the other ancient Near Eastern traditions and stories is that it provides this kind of a background, mm. which just completely, um, it, it, it illuminates what's going on in the biblical text. Real quick, you know, if, if you don't mind, Matthew Pop gave a super chat. I appreciate it. And he says, how popular is the dual theory hypothesis in scholarship? And you'd be the perfect guy for that question. Uh, not so much. I don't know that much about it, honestly. 
the dual theory. Mm -hmm. Matt, Matthew, since you gave me the super chat, I'll be trying to look for your uh, your chat. And, dude, we've got some guys in here that just really – I don't know if it's like you just have to say it because you just – I feel good. I said what I had to say. These scoffers will be forgotten. Like I think it's pretty difficult to listen to someone that disagrees so fundamentally with you and, like, just stay quiet if you've got the opportunity to, like – you know, yeah. like, it, it's like a resolve the tension, like – you know your deepest held it held beliefs right these people who just casually talk about it, it's like burn sort of thing like it feels good god's but gonna watch it from... huh does anybody really disagree with the fact that every single one of us is going to be forgotten <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing long be forgotten yeah Come i on. just now it's gonna happen Look, it's been happening this whole show, guys. We've had – I'm sure that people hope we die tonight or something. I, you know, it's its ridiculous. I, I, did you guys ever see that uh, dark, uh, Richard Dawkins uh, love mail video? It's not really not sure. love mail. It's like haters who've emailed him, Christians. That oh, yeah, I think him. I might have actually. Oh, yes. yes, yes. You know that you put oh, it that, that is the funniest thing. They're like – God, I will be watching from my tower in heaven as you cook in the broth of God's. And it's like, what the <laughs> hell is wrong with people, bro? Oh, I thought that way too. I mean, but seriously, it's it's crazy. That is crazy. Right. And uh, that's part of the answer here. We've got to separate out the question, the mental question of why we believe what we believe from this moral go to hell based on what you believe thing. There is innocent error, right? There is, if we can't, in other words, we can't tolerate differences of opinion. How do we ever get at the truth? And if we're gonna turn a difference of opinion into a moral question of condemnation, damnation, every time we, we discuss a certain subject, you cannot think straight about it. You cannot. Mm -hmm. um, how could you possibly? You have to be able to freely uh, question everything. I, I just want to know, how do they know? <laughs> how do you know I'm going to cook? How do you know you're going to go to somewhere in heaven? How do you know? Because you experience something and you feel some type of satisfaction psychologically? Well, on Sunday, their preacher told, read the passage about a uh, lake of unquenchable fire, and they explained the way some 16th century theologian understood that lake of conventional fire and, and that left an impression on their subconscious james and the switch turns right on to critical as soon as you bring up muhammad as soon as you bring up the vedic writings <laughs> right. oh well no so why would you believe in that uh, why do they believe in that why I mean, do they believe it come on like at what point do you finally listen to guys like us for like you can sit on here we'll go for two hours and p were like people will sit here for two hours just to say, and remember Jesus is Lord, and and, re and you're a scoffer, and you're mocking, and you're this and you're that. And it's like, you spent two hours in here. You really didn't come here to listen to anything we said. You really yeah. aren't listening. I know because I didn't listen. I know because I was the guy who was like, let me find the Christian that I, oh, William Lane Craig. He talks really good. He's super sophisticated. Did I tell you guys about the guy who threatened to kick my ass on Facebook that, um, uh, <sighs> He wrote me and he's talking about, I'm going to beat your ass when stop, I see Stop you. leaking my private uh, messages. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm dead serious. This guy was like, I ought to sh share the screen, but I'm not going to because I had words back with him too. So I'll look like a douchebag myself. Either way. <laughs> but I can engage in that kind of rhetoric, unlike him who's supposed to be a man of God. Uh, was you it know, Jeff Durbin? Huh? <laughs> was it Jeff Durbin? <laughs> <laughs> it was probably one of his goons. No, but he said uh, he said William Lane Craig. He something about him, and I said, "Well, tell your savior." I oh, said, it couldn't I. have been Jeff Durbin. It, it couldn't have been because I, I think, think they like each other. <laughs> nope, Calvinist versus Molinist. Um, Trude oh, yeah. Hell says some love from hell to weigh up the silly burn in hells. Thank you, Trude. I appreciate it. So he is a firsthand eyewitness of someone to tell you hell's not as bad. As you think it is right here, he he's right. he said well, it. So many of the interesting people, you know, it's been commonly observed, have got to be there, right? <laughs> ask ask Gary Habermas. I mean, didn't he do like a like a whole like a whole thing on uh, on on people who have oh the near death experiences of 
yeah. yeah. I, I mean, just, sure, surely. I don't. Surely I don't know if that was one of the original that, ones yeah. or one of the ones that he where he added all the details in later. <laughs> <laughs> But surely, of all these these thousands and thousands of people who have had near death experiences, they've they've run into some pretty interesting people, no? Absolutely. Stinky britches, thank you for the three dollars super chat. Love the name. No questions, just enjoying the conversation. I appreciate the love. Um, I recorded with Michael Shermer today, and he's wow. he's a, he's a sharp guy. I mean. I've been told by people, well, his debate skills aren't the greatest. And when he's interacting and stuff, I, he did fantastic. And we talked about why we believe. Like, why do we have epistemologies? Why do humans believe anything at all? And holy moly, that guy went into everything. The brain, the, the everything, everything uh, from agencies to uh, we, we went into why people believe in gods and aliens and you name it. And it was just really interesting to hear, like, you have all you need right here in this world around us to assume agency in so many things. That's why the Hindus are right and the Christians are wrong. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, but, you know, we, when we identify you know, the ancient Greeks, like, uh, you know, Thales, for example. We're getting static, Kip. I'm going to mute you. You just wave at me. Let me know when you want to talk. I'll just unmute you. It'll be easier because it's like. Sorry. Go ahead, guys. Go ahead. Oh, was that you, James? The development of what we call science is replacing a divine explanation with a natural explanation. And so it's the reducing of everything from being agency uh, where the birth of science actually begins. It's hard not to see that God, the concept of God or gods isn't a projection of human purpose and human agency onto the entire universe. We're self-conscious. I mean, I can give you tips on, I can teach you logic. Logic was discovered by some ancient Greeks, you know, guys like Aristotle, self-consciously discovered logic and said, hey, this is a fallacy. You don't you want to avoid that. I can give you advice. I can give you tips on how to think better and think more clearly uh, because you have some kind of agency, some kind of self-consciousness over your own you can make mistakes. You can correct your errors. Unfortunately, most of nature isn't like that. Most of nature is just, you know, like a like a waterfall or a planet going around a, the sun. Self-consciousness, which is what epistemology implies, my ability to give you logical advice, implies a kind of agency. That my advice would make a difference and you could make a choice. So um, do I believe in a kind of free will? Maybe a little kind of free will, yeah. But it's a limited human thing, and it has only to do with our self-consciousness and that kind of advice I can give you on how to use your brain, your mind, um, if we have any kind of agency at all. So, um, <laughs> real, real quick, uh, Kip, did you read this? Okay, can you comment on it? I'm going to unmute you, brother. Yeah, okay. So the, the idea is that there were... Well, I'll just read. Yeah, there were two origin stories from Israel and Judah. One had it starting with Moses and the other with Abraham. Later, they were merged together after the refugees moved down to Judea. And I think, I mean, I, there's there's a lot of there's a lot to like in that theory. I think the um, uh, in large part um, the 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 focus on on certain individuals such as um, uh, Joseph in uh in the northern kingdom as well as moses in the northern kingdom juxtaposed or contrasted with like the focus on on the the patriarch judah or on yes on uh, on abraham in the southern kingdom uh yeah there's there's uh elements or there's there's pieces uh within the 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 collected uh, stories and traditions of the origins of Israel that are that, that stem from from predominantly these these two these two groups these two camps. Um, I think I, I came back in here when when Josh Doctor Josh was talking about the uh, uh, whether there might have been an exodus or or some some historical kernels of 
an exodus or multiple exoduses, um, which is what I, I, I tend to agree with. I don't think it's at all implausible that there was, there was a, a group of slaves or migrations of slaves that came up from Egypt and settled in the Levant. And I think these stories tend to stem from largely the Northern Kingdom. And over the course of time, yeah, every all of this stuff ended up getting getting put together in large part just by virtue of how the what, uh, the two what is that noise? Were. I'm you, sorry. I is that you thumping your hand around? I think it's oh, the maybe. cable catching. Yeah. I think when you like make gestures when you're talking, the cable gets yanked a bit and it oh. makes like a like a tension noise on the mic. It's super sensitive. That's why I catch nice. the attention. And, and uh, But so ultimately, yeah, you think there might have yeah. been two origin oh, yeah. stories that merged. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, they two origin stories, which in large part have the same, they're versions of the same elements too, though, right? So, I mean the the grand narrative that belonged to Israel and the grand narrative that belonged to Judah would have had overlapping pieces but also their own their own independent their own their own uh, uh, distinct so do uh, those overlapping things. pieces come from a, a similar origin so in other words do we have an evolution from a single trunk division and then a coming back I, oh, you're assuming united monarchy, right? Like, is that what your assumption is that there was a united Me? monarchy? No, 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 James. Well, no, oh. I, I'm just, I'm just saying, we're if there are overlapping similarities that make the integration easy, did those similarities have a common origin? That is to say, do we have an evolution of a similar origin breaking up into different traditions and then coming back and being reintegrated? Uh, when, however in that some I would say in some respects, yes. Um, my understanding, my very simple understanding of, um, of the origins of Israel as a nation or as a people group uh, stems from these, these smaller tribal confederacies who would come together and cooperate in times of crisis or in times of need. So you've got these plans that are, yeah, sure. Um, and you can see this is one of the reasons why if you, if you sit down and you look through all the listings of the tribes of Israel, you'll see that there's, there's probably six or seven different ones, and they're all different. Like there's, there's the earliest one probably appears in Judges chapter 5, and there's only 10 tribes there. And, and some of them are tribes that, uh, that, you know, are never mentioned again in later versions of the, of the tribal listing. So it, it's commonplace. The, the, the common tactic was for a long time just to assume that these were earlier names for later tribes. I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced that's, that's true. I think there were probably these individual, like I said, these, these groups of, of people um, who lived in the same area, in the Levant there, in ancient Palestine, um, who were distinct, but then, yes, would come together in times of crisis. So there could be different, the, altogether different ethnicities of Canaanites, some maybe from Sumeria, some that had always been there, some from yeah, Egypt. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it's this collective, and I, I would say that you know these the stories that survive um, come and, and the ones that uh, that are are the same between the uh, those collected by by Israel and those collected by by Judah probably go back to this period where um, these these individual tribes. You know, had had uh, the they, they would mingle, they would communicate, they would uh, they would cooperate on a regular basis. But it's not; it's never just as simple as you know. There were two groups. 
that originally started as one and came apart. And, I mean, I mean, it's 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 very messy right. back then. Right. That's uh, I. <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> I'll just I'll just threw him on the spot. I was just I just was like, wake up! No, nah. you have the capacity to throw someone on the spot, Derek. It's like, hey, look, guys. So what did you say? What were you talking about? No, seriously, what were you talking about? Who me? No, I, I'm just teasing. Oh, Nathan. No, he was indicating that it could be a very complex story of different it, ethnicities coming. Yeah. It is. I mean, I think it's interesting, but. Dude, while you guys are going, it's amazing the chat has zero to do with the conversation. I've seen <laughs> the, the, my favorite one I saw in the chat was the guy who you shared earlier that said we were all going to burn. He said, my teaching is done here. I have planted the seed. Let those who understand grow in spirituality and understand Jesus. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> that happens a lot. That happens a lot. Um, I, you know, what do you do, man? What do you do? Um, but look, Nathan, how long ago was it when you were Christian? Well, I, I was actually thinking, like, I did I ever like comment like that? That's what I was actually thinking. I was like, what well, you know, did I ever like watch, you know, like an atheist, like a modern day debate or something? And I was like, and do that. I, I've put a stone in the shoe, or like, you know, it's gonna maybe you're just stony ground. I'm going now. Uh, it's just a weird. I mean, like, it's pretty. The chat's pretty weird, like anyway, because you can't. You don't have enough space to really like get at anything, right? But yeah. um, but re like really weird being a Christian and like engaging in these like debates and things online and just being like like thinking that I could like say some magic words from the Bible or something, and I was like planting a seed and it, it, yeah. I don't I'm know. Just grateful that the internet did not exist when I was a Christian. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I used to, what I used to do is I'd go in, I'd go into um, like atheist chat rooms, right? But it was debate rooms and I would carry myself in a way that didn't seem like I wasn't trying to be antagonistic on purpose. I was like, so, okay, this is what I believe in. Here's why. And I would be super kind and I'd be like, but I'm not sure. And I think you, you and me, Nathan, have a lot in common in that respect because I've seen how you were chatting with Doug while you were still a Christian. Uh, I watched your live on that, but there's some that like, for example, my mom, I'll have conversations with my mom and I don't care what you say. I don't care what you say. Jesus is the Lord. Okay. I'm going to be praying for you. That's literally, but she doesn't come at me like that. She's my mom. Right. But like, uh, you see people on here that are, it's like words have magic to them. And like, they're somehow going to say something that's going to make us like, you know what? He rose from the dead. <laughs> what was I thinking? I mean, dead people came, come to life and, this guy did, uh, you know, like, I don't know how that's going to work. You know what I mean? I just, I don't know. You know I, was, I was talking to a precept. Um, I had like a four hour conversation and I made the mistake of like, um, sort of assuming that I was talking to someone who was like interested in like having a conversation and it just <laughs> ended up going nowhere in the end. But um, they, at one point <laughs> they just, they just told me like what I was, what I believed. He was like, I know you know, and I was like, oh, but I don't. <laughs> and then wow. I was like, I know you know. Stop suppressing it. I know you know, and I'm like, what do I do with this? Like, I think I, I think I'm the best authority on what I do and don't know. But like, what can I do? <laughs> Look, you know, you know exactly what that's like. All you have to do is admit that you know it already. Wow. <laughs> well, they'll say I, there's like you ever get the one where there's like I've never met a real atheist. Everyone is right. really everyone right. knows. Everyone yeah. really knows, but you can't be really an atheist or even I, I guess you'd say an agnostic. It would drive me crazy when I first became an atheist and announced it to all friends and family. The, the what really drove me crazy was the oh well you're on your own path and don't worry you'll come back around and find Jesus. Mm. It's gonna happen. Don't worry. I know you're just too good a person. It'll cut. It'll happen. You guys. So I actually get this. This isn't a. This is not the first time this has happened. But I was helping someone who's struggling with addiction, and he's a Muslim. Uh, I help you no matter what you believe in, and there you go. Uh, for those who think that you can't be a good person or whatever it might be, but anyway, you got to have God in order to do that. We sat out in this garage many times, but prior to me doing videos live or recording or anything, and he's like, "Derek, 
you're a wonderful guy, man. Thank you for taking me into your house and trying to help me. I let him stay at my house for 30 days to get off heroin, fentanyl, really, from New York. And um, we sat here. He's a Muslim. He's raised Muslim. His parents are wonderful people. But um, he's like, you're such a good guy. And I told him where I stand. I'm like, yep, yeah, I'm an atheist. You know, by definition, man, I have no belief in any gods. Until I see something, I really honestly don't believe. So it will take the Thomas situation to convince me. He would need to appear to me, and somehow I would have to know in some other way. You'd have to reveal it. I don't have sufficient evidence. And he goes, don't worry. You're going to come full circle because <laughs> you know the truth. And I said, what if? And I just played this hypothetical totally nice because you can tell when people get triggered really easily by like getting epistemologically close to the basis of why they believe yeah. and showing them that you have nothing to stand on. Right. But you say to them, like, you're like, I said, uh, what if you guys are wrong? And I'm, I'm actually right. Like, if you knew for a second, if something could prove to you you were wrong and, and you went, whoa, like, how would you feel about that statement you just said to me, like, hoping I come full circle? Because a lot of people leave it, feel freedom. And there's a lot of trauma that can come from the religious baggage. And that just that God hovering over your head, watching your deeds. And are you really his child? Have you really lived up to his? Are you, you really have a spirit? You know, as a Calvinist, I wrestled with that thing toward the end. I'm like, dude, am I really chosen? And then there are other times I'm doing really good in church and I'm chosen. And then another time I'm like, dude, you just watched pornography. You, hmm. There's How could you do that? How could you be one of the elect and continue to do this? And then kids are starving in Africa right now. But God's really, really worried about me watching pornography in America hmm. here. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, you have what? To priorities sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, and it just really made me go, what the heck is going on? So I, I had these talks with him, and he loves me even to this day, but he believes that I'm going to come for a circle. And I'm like, to what? What am I going to believe? Because you're, you're Muslim, right? So, and I was a Christian. Are you saying I'm going to become a Christian? He goes, Christians are people of the book. And I'm like, is mm. that like an inside code to say, eh, you're close enough? You know, oh, you're close you know, enough. You, it just that reminds me of this bizarre thing that happened after 9-11 in the United States. It was this almost rush to defense, to defend Islam in itself, and this sort of religious solidarity between the faiths that was almost terrifying for me to, to behold. You, you have this, uh, well, wait, 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 they're Muslims, and so therefore they believe in God, and it's, therefore it's good. And just as Christians and Jews and Muslims, we're all sort of in this together. And if we really were to condemn sort of aspects of Islam as being violent, but if you were to quote uh, a hadith that said, kill, kill, kill the disbeliever where you find them, that would sort of be a betrayal of the entire club. And you're right. Isn't that interesting? All you have to do is be converted into some kind of belief in God. and Everything else is for God. That's the details. Don't worry about that. So long as you're on our club that has the God club, that's okay. And just about everything can be forgiven and will dissociate any bad, you know, uh, whether it's the Spanish Inquisition or uh, 21st century jihadists. Don't mm -hmm. worry. We'll dissociate any bad thing from that. Uh, Islam is a religion of peace, after all. And we're sort of all in this, you know, monotheistic solidarity. Uh, anyway, that's terrifying to me, frankly. Kip, your 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 mic's yeah. fuzzy, so I figure I'd put you up to oh, talk. Okay. It does that from time to time. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it's it's the devil. What can you do, right? <laughs> yeah. Did any of you guys um, have been, any of you ever heard the uh, or listened to the the classic debate between the uh, presuppositionalist Greg Bonson? And uh, um, is it George Stein, or does does this ring a bell? Is, is that anyone? is that the one where he caught the guy out, where he was like, um, "Oh, what kind of things are immaterial, or whatever?" Or is this a different one that I'm thinking of? I remember, I remember like it's talking it. about. He, I, I forgot what it was. Like he went to cross examinate, um, went to cross examination, and basically the other guy was saying everything is physical or something and then he got him to say yeah, like the laws name... of logic are... yeah yes that's the one can you name something immaterial the laws of logic and the house brought the house down with that comment but that's no good. i was <laughs> i it, oh 
I, and I think it demonstrates too. It doesn't uh, being a great debater uh, doesn't necessarily say anything about your your intellect as much as it does your your exceptional rhetorical skills, right? I mean, there's an art to it. Um, you go to church long enough, and you you come to recognize who's a really terrific preacher, and it's not necessarily the guys who know the most; it's the guys who are uh, the most convincing and the most provocative. Um, but that debate, so I, I think I was, I was still in, I was still in university, like as an undergrad when I, um, when I first heard that debate. And it's interesting to think back on your earlier self. Um, it was on a cassette tape that was that long ago. Oh, <laughs> but, wow. Uh, and it was, yeah. And it was making the rounds in the, uh, in the dorm that I was living in and uh, I think the label on the debate uh, on the tape was um, it, it was something like the best the best uh, existence for God debate ever or something like that right and I listened to it and remember quite clearly coming out of that experience going that's it it's done <laughs> the case closed but then um had i took the time um maybe a year ago two years ago to re-listen to it again after many many years and after after uh coming through this academic journey that i did from the time that i i started as an undergraduate um and it's it's pretty amazing how how you can see holes and and you can see problems in the argument that, that you just didn't even know how to look for i guess um yeah it's uh it's something What's thank you cryptician right. thank you for the super chat appreciate cryptician the grand blasphemous atheist thank you thank you appreciate it as a former attorney, I can tell you, Dr. Kip, you're exactly right. There's a huge difference between rhetorical skills and the soundness of one's argument. Uh, it's uh, I almost don't trust conversational conversion of any kind. If someone makes a point, whether it's about uh, physics or history, in a conversation that interests me and seems to persuade me, that's just an invitation to do my own further research and it's when I'm alone to myself, reading and thinking, that I actually come to conclusions and change my mind on things. And I inherently distrust anyone who has a conversation or debate conversion. I'm gonna do That's something. I'm gonna do something that you you don't see me ever do. And I'm going to play a clip of a unreleased video that's on Patreon for everybody to see. And it's from Lawrence Cross, Cross, and it's uh, God did it. That's what I'm going to play. It's uh, let's see, Richard, Richard uh, Dawkins, <clears throat> I think, makes a statement about this as well. But uh, I'm trying to find it here, so bear with me. If you guys want to carry on, Lawrence Cross, Richard Dawkins. Happy to see it's not just my last name that you're you're messing <laughs> up here. Wow. <laughs> Here we are. I don't feel so bad now. No, let me be the total heretic here, and uh, you you just stay the saint, okay? <laughs> Hold on, here we go. All right, it's just taking a second to load. While it's doing that, hit that like button, ladies and gentlemen. All right, sharing now. Stopping screen share, share. And I want it with the audio. All right, here we go. Yeah, don't miss that little checkbox. It always does this, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, let me know if Let's you guys see. can hear this. <laughs> Get the ad. <laughs> you guys hear that? Watching. If you're a business owner like me and you don't have weeks to spend messing, I think you might want to turn the volume up in the browser though. Um, see how it's yeah. <laughs> Details yet. This is, this is fascinating. I, I mean, I never thought I'd even be asking these questions. I was like, God did it, and that's enough for me. Um, right, that's, it's, that, and, you know, that's the argument for people who want to stop thinking. Basically, it's just 
if you want to, if it seems so puzzling, just say God did it, and then you stop thinking. And and I and the point is that that's too often been the history of many ideas is that people say, well, look, I can't possibly understand how that could happen. I have no idea how that can happen, so therefore God did it. You know, it's like the people who say, you know, I see something in the sky and I don't know what it is, so it must be aliens. I mean, it's, it, you know, it, it, there's lots of other possible explanations. And um, and in that case, aliens are the last least likely possibility. And I would argue in the case of God, generally God is the least likely possibility. And of course, that argument, as you know, is subject to the, is, is called the God of the gaps argument, which is right. to put God when we don't understand something. Because the, the problem with that is every time we understand something, the, the, the gap becomes smaller and smaller. And the, and, the, and, the and they shift God. God. They shift. And, yep. and I, I think my argument, in some sense, closes that gap more or less completely. I mean, it doesn't. There are these questions about was was there anything before? Did time exist before? Was is it infinite in the past? Infinite in the future? These are interesting, potentially interesting philosophical questions, and to some extent, sometimes physical questions. Right now, they're metaphysical. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and and you know, you can bury God in 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 that realm but but the point is if you're doing that that's fine but it, it you know it just makes god more relevant it literally as, as i i was not being facetious at the beginning of the program when i said that it's never discussed you don't need god to understand anything that we can see in our universe that doesn't make the existence of god impossible it just means it's it, redundant it's an idea that uh, it, unnecessary and so yeah, if you if it makes you feel good, fine. But you don't. But God doesn't add anything to our understanding of anything. Professor Krauss, I have a hard time because I don't know the science as you do. Uh, trying to figure out how when we talk about quantum mechanics and things popping in and out of existence, so we could see that that happens. Like, well, we know it happens. We can't see it happen directly. We can infer that it happens. But anyway. My, my question is this, is like when I look at material matter, right? I, I live in such an equilibrium. I'm, I'm just, ah, everything's good. Life's yeah. great. Like how come everything goes just, just the way I like it? Sun rises, the sunset, you know, my question well, is where does all this. like Bill O'Reilly, sun rises, sunsets, no one understands it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> anyway, start going. <laughs> Go on. oh. anyway, that's a sneak peek. You guys are lucky. Just... I Ooh. had to do that. Ah. Had to, yeah. What can I say? That was on fire, my brother. <laughs> yeah, that's a sneak peek. And there's like 30 more little small clips like that from the whole episode. So if you don't have 50 wow. minutes to listen to it, everything he says in it is like just, I mean, a 12 gauge, just blast yeah. everything but he how, says. How true. I mean, the bit you showed, how true what he says is, is I, every time I'm in a conversation with a, a theist, it basically boils down to you don't know everything. Okay, you're right. That means God. I don't know everything. There's a whole bunch of stuff I don't know. In fact, there's a, a whole bunch of stuff I don't even know that I don't know. So, well, you see, I have this convenient explanation for anything that I might not know. It's God. I, and it's all known. <laughs> but see, that's why I love doing the Bible, guys. I know that I'm like a weird atheist. Like, why are you so much about this mythology and these stories? Like, why do you care? Because when you know God doesn't know everything. How do you know that? The Christians say he's all knowing. When you read the Bible, Kip will tell you, uh, James will tell you, Nathan will tell you. Like when you actually read it, not listen to your pastor tell you. Like it excites me because it's like, holy moly, God does not realize the future. He doesn't even know things hit him out of nowhere. Oh my God, these creatures that I made. Ha, send the flood. <laughs> send the damn flood. I can't believe they did this. Like, how do you not know how like he forgets things or he promises things and then things don't happen? Or like there's a lot of weird anthropomorphisms. I like to just say God was very like man. And so later on, we want to slap on that. God is just trying to relate to us because he's so beyond us that mm. dude. He's walking in the garden like a man with Adam. He's walking next to him. Hey, what's up, bro? Creation yeah. into existence like a king, by his <laughs> verbal command. And God said. And so just like a king says, y'all are going to do it this way, God says, and it happens. And so the model is clearly, an, I mean, of Genesis, is clearly that of a king commanding existence into existence. Uh, Not all of Genesis. I would say the 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 Hesiod's Theogony, in which, you know, Father Sky on top of uh, uh, Mother Earth 
his fluids get into her cracks and out springs life. That's a sort of uh, organic sort of sexual uh, uh, biological model of creation, as opposed to, and God said, and God said, and then he was pleased with, you know, he saw, and then he was pleased. God there is the creator king. That's, that's, that's not all of Genesis, though. That's, that's Pete. That's the that's the priestly writer. There's actually and and Derek brought this out, and I think it's when it comes to the source theories and when it comes to um, representations of God in the Bible, this is something that gets uh, too often missed. And this is how dramatically different the God of the priestly writer is from the God of uh, the Yahweh or or the Elohim. Creator God, right? Yeah. Yeah, like he's, you know, he's he's speaking from the clouds. He never makes a physical manifestation. He, um, in in E, he will speak to people in dreams. In J, he's yeah, he's just like a he's he's like he's like a a, a man. So much so that that when people in J have encounters with Yahweh. They don't even recognize who they're talking to. Think of the story in, uh, well, yeah, the, the, Sodom, the Sodom and Gomorrah story, uh, which starts in, in Genesis 18, when, when um, uh, Abraham uh, receives three visitors. Right. One of those visitors is Yahweh. Mm-hmm. And, and this is, we, we get conditioned over, over being over sitting in after sitting in the church for for years or decades you get conditioned to thinking a certain way about the way that the bible portrays god so we we developed theologians a long time ago developed this word theophany to describe or christophany to describe instances uh within the hebrew bible where god takes on this human form or where where he appears like a man and nobody recognizes him and um what they failed re- what they fail to see and what i think is really really interesting is that no actually this was this is consistently how how yahweh is always depicted by the yahweh he's he's the one who's walking around and looks like you and i do um and behaves not altogether uh differently from 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 human beings but it's it's a dramatic change it's a dramatic difference from from other depictions of god by by later authors in the bible so and it's me so before, i want to before i, was gonna, I myself have to take off though derek pretty quick that's here. what i was just going right. to say we're going to close this live uh, okay so sorry. i, I, I was going to have to go as well so yeah <laughs> yeah either yeah. way well look we all got the phone call from god we're just trying to you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you made a really great point there, Doctor. You really did. Seriously, yeah. Kip's coming back. I love this. Um, I really can't wait to do more with you. You you have quite a bit of in- insight. And, of course, touching on this with scholars that I look up to, like Emmanuel Tobe, it's like, holy moly, uh, you really – that's the third time in the show, by the way. That's a, that's like a special thing that I say from time to time when I'm actually blessing my audience with a power <laughs> from my spiritual powers. Um, go subscribe to Nathan's channel. Like he's grown quite a bit actually, and not too long. Like you really like blew up a whole thousand subscribers out of nowhere, which is really cool. Um, I want to see you know more of yours grow, man. This community is a, a really cool community to talk about things and philosophy. I have uh, Bernardo Castro coming on in June, and I'm still wondering how I'm gonna do that discussion. And so like I'm not yeah. sure how I want to take that discussion, but I do think. He's a, he's a non-dualist and I, I still feel like I want to talk about belief with him like first and see if he's willing to go mm-hmm. there. I'm talking to you, Nathan Manley, because you've interviewed with him and he's super smart. He's a sophisticated guy. I just, uh, I wonder if epistemologically he has this presup driving the biases for why he has a non-dualist uh, philosophy. And you know what I mean? I'm wondering if there's something there. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I don't know if that's, the way he comes at it, but I think what I think would be really interesting is to see him in a discussion with someone like Graham Oppie. Um, so like Graham Oppie's approach to philosophy of religion 
is rather than arguing from uh, non-neutral premises, which interestingly, you know, go all the way back to Aristotle, right? You're going to say, if we don't agree to the premises, then there's no point. But um, philosophy of religion is yet to catch up to the idea that, you know, de deductive argument being truth preserving, premises contain the conclusion, right? So Oppie talks a lot about this idea of um, there's basically no point in I mean, you could you could show, say, that someone from a different worldview that they've got a contradiction and then they've got some work to do. It doesn't automatically mean they've just got to come over to your one. But if you're going to just give the, tell them what follows from things that are part of your worldview, like they're just going to reject a premise. What, are you going to give them another argument? Infinite. So what we've got to do is assess our theories, right? We, we like take a step back. We go, what does this theory do? How does it fit to the data? And what are its commitments and so forth? And, that, and then we, we assess them and see which one's best. And I think it would be interesting to see, because idealism generally wins out on simplicity. I mean, you've, like, you've, you've only got one thing, but it'd be interesting <laughs> to see... <laughs> But, but I mean, yeah, so does literally nothing, you know, you can say, my, well, my metaphysics are committed to nothing and uh, went on past many. But um, it'd be interesting to see how someone like Oppie would take that approach that has been really interesting to see in like philosophy of religion and, and apply it to someone like Kastrup, who's, um, and, and again, how Kastrup would respond to that kind of um, angle as opposed to just kind of like- um, Whatever your, your meta status as a metaphysical realist or materialist or whatever, he makes a good point the main way to get through to people is not to say, this is my opinion, but to throw a monkey wrench into their own coherence. Mm -hmm. Kip Davis, YouTube channel, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you go subscribe to his too. He's got 242 subscribers. Um, seriously, he has responded to Michael Jones. This is actually a really well done video. Um, well, many of your videos you take your time with and you are a legitimate scholar in the field so ask anyone who's actually wanting to hear someone who studied this stuff and like can read these ancient languages, understands how to pick them apart and has even been able to discover forgeries to find out things don't sound right. They don't add up. And that takes a lot of patience and time to do. So please help him get that number up. Let's uh, let's let's, you know, support Kip. Uh, his YouTube channel link is down in the description, but all you got to do is look up Kip Davis on YouTube and uh, you guys can do that also. Creating Christ. James Stevens Viant, he's been on Myth Vision for quite some time. Look, that's even a Myth Vision uh, intro that I made for him a long time ago. Sure. And a lot of these videos mm -hmm. come from Myth Vision as well. You guys go support our friends here and to learn more information, continue being skeptical. I, I really appreciate that. Everybody on the panel, thank you for joining me last minute. I literally just was like, let's go live. Let, let's, let's just do it. Why don't we go live? And uh, you guys decided you would come and actually spend time with me. I'll send you your checks when we're done with this live uh, for spending the time with me. I'm just kidding. Now we're getting static from you again, Kip. Satan's trying to interrupt us, man. I'm telling it's you. Because of the, it's because of the check. It's got to be. Yeah. It's got to be. Look, uh, if you haven't joined Myth Vision's Patreon, this is the last thing I'd have to say. It's $3 a month. It's less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks. And I have no exaggeration going on almost 300 videos that have not been published to YouTube. If you're interested in seeing stuff, and I purposely like, guys, I'm sitting on Lawrence Krauss. I have not published that. I'm sitting on a bombshell video with Russell Gamerican. I'm sitting on a video with Elaine Pagels. I'm about to go visit Dr. Joshua Bowen and do a series of videos from like 40 to 50 clips, hopefully like 10 minute clips in person, high quality. That's going to Patreon early. I'm um, going in June to uh, Dr. John J. Collins and Joel Baden in person up in Connecticut. Um, going in July to go see Elaine Pagels in person, and that'll be in Colorado. Go I'm going to California in September, and I'm going to see Richard Carrier and Dennis R. McDonald in person. All of these things will end up on Patreon early. So if you want access to that and help support what we're doing, you guys are the reason it's happening. Anyone have any final words? Keep up the awesome work, Derek. Yeah. You are a god. I, I believe in God. Derek Lambert. <laughs> Look, this is only for the insiders here. <laughs> the secret teachings uh, of Derek. Uh, I don't understand uh, it yet. I don't understand it yet. Um. I was going to say, Nathan, Nathan, um, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my friend. But I'm just kidding. Seriously, though, you're a god, too, because Nathan's been on. How long have you been doing lives today? 
Um, I I did. I was interviewed by a Christian coming from a completely different, like um, young Earth creationist, um, like believes that she does exorcisms and stuff like this. Um, but it was actually a really good. I I thought she actually did a really good job because almost everything I said, she must have disagreed with so much. Yet <laughs> she just asked questions. You know, like she didn't. Uh, you know, she she. I would have expected normally when I talk to someone where we differ that much for it to be, you know, for everything is going to be like, well, there's no, no evidence for uh, evolution or you think, you know, you trust in science, where's your fit? But she actually just stuck to the questions, was really nice, and I really enjoyed the interview. So, yeah, um, two, that was about two hours. Sorry to answer Dude, the question. I, I want to see more, I want to see more nine hour book reviews. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I mean, did well, I I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, but obviously Loke has seen the review because um there was a secret I I had to take it down in order so as inspiring philosophy is allowed to come on my channel um to talk to James still. But I put up a screenshot of Loke and Cameron in a, in the um, Berians group talking about how like I'd misrepresented them. And then Cameron goes, I've got a theory, um, not not by me, that Nathan faked his deconstruction, um, deconversion and being a Christian. He faked it all in order to be a more convincing counter-apologist. And then Loke's like, interesting theory. We have to um, keep in mind the forces against us. Um, there's a guy called Muslim Metaphysician. He was like, Muslim Metaphysician is also slandering me online. And I saw Nathan has been conspiring with him. I commented on his video like, Oh yeah, Loke's really frustrating. And then Loke's like, yeah, they're conspiring. That they're, like they're gonna combine their subscribers and take us out. Like, man, this stuff is like wild. <laughs> the wild world of YouTube, uh, like kingdom politics or whatever it is. Like, <laughs> they should go read Elaine Pagel's "The Origin of Satan," and they'll kind of. Uh, they, they're still gonna think what they're gonna think. I think they're yeah, just yeah, fully, fully in. Like they got too much vested interest in it. But look, I love you guys, and I appreciate yes. you all. Seriously, no, 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 I appreciate it, man. Thanks for saying that, too. I want to have you guys come back again, and let us know. Like, if you need to get a hold of me, you want to email me, Derek at MythVisionPodcast.com. Let me know if you have any ideas. I'm constantly reaching out to scholars, and i um, looking forward to it. There's so much more I can say, and I don't want this podcast to keep going. So I love you guys. Let's do this again, and don't forget, <laughs> we, we. Oh, oh. Myth, myth vision. vision. <laughs>